Chapter 15 of Predecessors of Cleopatra. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ryan Fahey, Fairfield, Connecticut. Predecessors of Cleopatra by Lee North. Chapter 15, Nofretari Minimit. With the exception of Cleopatra, one or two Ptolemy queens, Hatasu, and possibly Nitocris, the history of Egypt which has come down to us deals principally with the kings and not with the queens. The latter are mentioned incidentally or not at all, though holding a very different place from the female sovereigns of other eastern nations, and the student explorer who endeavors to vitalize these fragmentary and scattered outlines has not an easy task. In no case is the above more true than in that of the wife or wives of Ramses the Second, the Sesostris of the Greeks who waged tedious wars against the Hittites, with whom he made peace in the twenty-first year of his reign, and of whom Herodotus speaks. It is the king whose striking and heroic figure in childhood, youth, and manhood occupies the foreground of the canvas, dwarfing into comparative insignificance all who stand near him, and leaving the details as regards female relationships, but as accessories and background. Says an ardent Egyptologist, one of the handsomest of men, we come in time to recognize his face, with its haughty beauty, just as we do that of Henry the Eighth or Louis the Fourteenth. Curtis speaks thus on the general subject. Oriental masculine beauty is so mild and feminine that the men are like statues of men seen in the most mellowing and azure atmosphere. The forms of the face have a surprising grace and perfection. They are not statues and gods so seen, but the budding beauty of the Antinous, when he, too, had been in the soft climate, the ripening rounding lip, the arched brow, the heavy drooping lid, the crushed closed eye, like a bud bursting with voluptuous beauty, the low broad brow, these I remember at Aziut and remember forever. Much of this, perhaps, constituted the charm of the youthful Ramsay's face, but to it must be added something of the strength and intellect which were often lacking. From his mother, Queen Tua'a, Ramses II, of the 19th dynasty, received the heritage of royal ancestry. His father, Seti I, belonged to a new family, who, in view of descent, had no claim to the throne. So say most authorities, though some dispute it. As a child, his father made him co-ruler with himself. An inscription of Ramses II reads, I was a boy in his lap, referring to his father, and he spoke thus, I will have him crowned as king, for I desire to behold his grandeur while I am still alive. Officers then came forward to place the crown on his head, and said he said, Place the royal circlet on his brow. After this ceremony, however, he was still left in the house of the women and royal concubines, but was put in command of a band of Amazons, maidens who wore a harness of leather. So that soldier and conqueror, though he so early became, his associations from childhood up were constantly with women, and for the sex in general his subsequent conduct may lead us to infer he had a special weakness. Another inscription reads, When thou wast a boy with the youth locks of hair, no monument saw the light without thy command, no business was conducted without thy knowledge. He laid foundation stones even in childhood. Little wonder that no prouder monarch ever held sway and that we associate the idea of unwanted magnificence with him and his queens. Ramses the Great, if he was as much like his portraits as they are like each other, must have been one of the handsomest men, not only of his own day, but of all history, says the enthusiastic Miss Edwards. There is a bas-relief of him during his first campaign as a beautiful youth with a delicate Dante-esque face. Some years later we see him at Abydos in the temple of Seti I with a boyish beard. The likeness with which we become most familiar in the prime of life is thus described. The face is oval, the eyes are long, prominent and heavy-lidded, the nose slightly aquiline and characteristically depressed at the tip. The nostrils are open and sensitive, the underlip projects, the chin is short and square. It seems likely that it was true of Ramses II, as is said of the sailor, that he had a sweetheart in every port. No woman could boast that she alone reigned in his heart. Two, if not three, wives were made his legal consorts, and he had numerous concubines. The king's name was branded on female slaves that they could not escape undiscovered. 
Little or nothing is known of the queen's previous history. She may be said to have had no childhood or youth as regards our story. As the wife of Ramses II and the mother of his children, she first becomes known to us. Queen Nofretari seems to have been his earliest consort, probably his sister or the daughter of some Egyptian noble. One writer, Pollard, gives authority for considering her the princess who rescued Moses, the daughter of the king, whom he subsequently married. But as the king doubtless married in his youth, and she is the first queen of whom we find record, this seems unlikely. Says the same writer, speaking of the temple of Luxor, Ramses the Great, some 230 years afterwards, added another large court, which was surrounded by a double row of columns. Between these are gigantic statues of this monarch, more or less perfect. One on the left of the court is very beautiful, in most perfect condition, and represents him as a young man. The expression of the countenance is very pleasing. By his side, her head reaching to his knee, stands the diminutive but beautiful form of his beloved Nefertari. The queen's name, as usual, is variously spelled. Nofertari Minimut, Nefertari, Nofertuit Mary and Mut, and Nofruari, and means, as did that of Queen Nefertari Amis, good or beautiful companion. She shared her honors with a Khitan princess, whose brief story is told in a later chapter, and with another lady, Isis Nefer. Ramses II even lies under the suspicion of having married two of his own daughters, Honatani and Bint Antha the latter whom Vaidakar speaks of as queen under the title of Bint Anat, and of a small statue of her standing by the knee of a larger one of Ramses II, of whom he was known to be especially fond. It is this princess who has made the heroine of Eber's story of Uarda, but she is here provided with a more suitable lover, while Ramses himself is depicted as a more noble character than is perhaps quite warranted by the historical records. So true, however, are Professor Eber's stories to the ascertained facts in each case that, as a rule, they may serve as admirable historical studies, quite aside from any merit they may possess as artistic works of fiction. Jewish tradition mentions a certain Princess Moeris, which some writers have believed to be one of Ramses II's youngest children, the Princess Mary, as the one who rescued Moses in infancy, as above referred to. Pictures and inscriptions give the number of Ramses II's children as 60 sons and 59 daughters, and one enumeration even reaches to 171 children. Some of Ramses' daughters were Mary, Amun, Beken Mut, Noferari, Nebtani, and Isaim Keb, of whom Mary, Amun, and Nebtani, in addition to Hutani and Bint Antha, are marked as queens in the family list probably the wives of their brothers or near relatives. On the walls of the temple at Dair, Campion found an imperfect list of these sons and daughters. As a curiosity, one may cite the different dates assigned by historians as the beginning of the reign of Ramses II. Bruch, B.C. 1407, Mariette, 1405, Lepsius, 1388, Bunsen, 1352, and Poole, 1283. Since his son was of the blood royal, it was the policy of Seti I to unite him with himself, as has been shown, in the government of the kingdom, thus pacifying all adherents to the old regime, and Queen Tua'a, from whom Ramses II derived his blue blood, appears in the family group. The attachment between this father and son is an attractive feature of their joint reigns, and reminds one of the similar bond between Thothmes I and his daughter Hatasu. In peace and war, Seti and Ramses were ever side by side. Together they governed, together they took their pleasure and rode forth, each in his royal chariot, to fight and to conquer. At Abydos, Karnak, and other places are pictures of the prince. In one of them, adorned with the priestly panther skin, he is pouring libations on the altar in front of him, while his father holds a censer. According to these same representations and many inscriptions in the various temples adorned with his statues, the youthful Ramses performed prodigies of valor in the field. In the little temple of Betulwali are shown, on the right wall, the victories of Ramses II over the Libyans and Syrians, and on the left, over the Ethiopians. He was a black prince for whom the hand of fate did not lay out a brief career. The delight of his father's heart he lived to assume the full government and to pay royal honors in that beloved parent.
Like his ancestor Amenophis III, Ramses II seems to have had a passion for lions, not so much for the sport of hunting them as to train them for pets or instruments of warfare. Doubtless there was something that specially ministered to the pride of the haughty monarch in these favorites, known as the lion has ever been as the king of beasts, the monarch of the forest, etc. Whether the queen shared his partiality we are not told, but since they were his playthings and his companions, she must have accepted them in a measure, if with a trembling heart. His favorite lion lay at the door of the king's tent and went forth with him to the battlefield, probably at times even set loose to slay and destroy the enemy. The wall paintings show the king's lions in various places. There is something both attractive and repellent in this figure of the proud, handsome, vainglorious monarch, in the full vigor of his manhood, accompanied by this dangerous ally and slave. The tale of the lion and the mouse, Aesop's well-known fable, is said to be of Egyptian origin, and within the last 40 or 50 years, many romantic stories and many love tales of the Egyptians have come to light. A more modern character, Sir Henry Rawlinson, who wrote much on Egypt and also a great authority on Persian inscriptions, shared with this ancient king his taste for barbarous pets. He brought up a young lion who followed him around like a dog and lay at his feet when he wrote and studied. He also made such a pet of a leopard that it knew him after long separation and displayed pleasure at his presence when he visited the zoological garden in England, to which he had given it. The story goes that he put his hand into the cage when the keeper, who did not know him, exclaimed, Take your hand out of the cage, the animal is very savage and will bite you. I don't think he will bite me, said Sir Henry. Will you, Fahad? And the beast answered with a purr and would hardly let the hand be withdrawn. Queen Nefertari Minimit was the first, the chief, and the best beloved, there seems little question, of the wives of Ramses II, since it is her picture that appears with that of the king in various places, and she is termed beloved companion. Maspero gives a picture of her in her chariot, following the king, and says, still a young woman with delicate, regular features already faded and wrinkled under her powder. Like her husband, she wears a long robe, its folds, through the rapid motion, floating behind her. There is a large escort, and every one stands in a chariot driven by a groom. This queen was the mother of a number of children, who, in the temple of Abu Simbel, elsewhere called Ibsambul, are grouped with her. We may accord her some charm of beauty, since the monarch of that time selected his wife, not from a list of foreign princesses of suitable rank, but from among the children of his own nobles or relatives, with whose attractions he could become more readily acquainted. More than one writer speaks of the queen's figure being full of grace and her features refined and attractive in her pictures. There are two temples at Abu Simbel, translated Father of the Corn or Father of the Sickle, excavated in the solid rock. The larger has statues chiefly of the king, though there are smaller ones of his mother, wife, and some of his children. The smaller, of the queen also of equal size with her husband, and smaller ones of some of their sons and daughters. These are the most familiar effigies of Ramses II and Nofretari Minimit together, the male figure being full of spirit, the female of grace. Ramses, the strong in truth, the beloved of Amen, says the outer legend, made this divine abode for his wife, Nefertari, whom he loves. Within, the words are, his royal wife, who loves him, Nefertari, the beloved of Ma'ut, constructed for him this abode in the mountain of pure waters. Curtis says, in these faces of Ramses, seven feet long, is a godlike grandeur and beauty which the Greeks never reached. The mind cannot escape the feeling that they were conceived by colossal minds. Such only cherish the idea of repose so profound. Their beauty is steeped in a placid passion that seems passionless. In those earlier days, art was not content with the grace of nature, but coped with its proportions. Vain attempt, but glorious. Miss Edwards was present and took part in the discovery of some portions of this edifice and describes the occurrences and her sensations with her usual picturesqueness and enthusiasm. On the inner north wall there is a picture, presumably of Queen Nofretari, with a blue headdress and disc, in her right hand the ache or life sign, and in her left a jackal-headed scepter. Vases of a blue color stand on a table of offerings near. It is at this temple that we know Ramses best, 15 or 20 years later than the pictures of him before described. 
Here, to quote from the same author, he has outlived the rage of early youth and become implacable. Godlike serenity, superhuman pride, immutable will breathe from the stone. He has learned to believe his power irresistible and himself divine. The queen wears the plumes and disc of Hathor and has her daughters with her. She has much sweetness and grace, if not positive beauty. The colossi are difficult to see, but the southernmost may be best viewed in profile on a sand slope level with the beard. Even the great cast in the British Museum cannot be well seen. The temple at Abu Simbel has one hall and many large chambers. The colossi are placed two to the right and two to left of the door. They are 60 feet high without the platform and measure across the chest 25 feet 4 inches. The figures are seated, but if standing would be 83 feet high. Little dimples giving sweetness to the corners of the mouth and tiny depressions in the lobe of the ear are as large as saucers. The most southward statue is best preserved. The next statue is shattered to the waist, the head lying in the sand at its feet. The third is nearly perfect. The fourth has lost beard, uraeus, and arms, and has a hole in front. The heads are worked out, the bodies generalized. The figures are naked to the waist, and clothed below in the usual striped tunic. They wear the double crown, rich collars, no sandals or bracelets, and there are holes in the stone which may have held bronze or gold belts. The cartouches of the king are on his breast and arm, having been probably tattooed upon his person. The statues are executed in a light vein of rock and were, it is likely, not painted, like those of Siva's temple in Elephantine in India. Above the door is a 20-foot statue of Ra, and on either side a portrait of the king in bas-relief. The smaller temple has six statues, three on each side of the door, over 30 feet high, the king and queen Nofretari. The king is crowned with the Pashent and Uraeus and wears a fantastic helmet, adorned with plumes and horns. He has some of his sons, she, her daughters, with her, ten feet in height, reaching to the knees of their parents. The names of the royal consorts appear on every pillar and on every wall, with the statement that affection unites them. The queen is seen on the facade as the mother of six children and adorned with the attributes of a goddess. The king is attended by captives of different nations. The temple seems to have been left unfinished. The larger temple is within 25 yards of the brink of the river, the smaller within as many feet. They are of different shades of yellow. In some of the pictures, the figures wear pectoral ornaments and a rich necklace, with alternate vermilion and black drops, and a golden yellow belt, studded with red and black stones. The throne is on a blue platform, painted in stripes, red, blue, and white. The platform is decorated with gold-colored stars and tan crosses, picked out with red. Amon Re, the god whom they worship, is here represented with a blue-black complexion, a corselet of gold chain, armor, and a headdress of towering plumes. On the altar is a blue lotus with a red stalk, and a vessel with a spout like a coffee pot. There are as many varieties of this god in Egypt as of the Madonna in Italy and Spain. An earthquake in the time of Ramses II may have accounted for the partial overthrow of the statues on the outside of the temple. The cast of Estella in the Louvre states that Ramses II made artesian wells in the desert. In one of the pictures of the queen, she advances with two sistra, the sacred instrument introduced in the fourth dynasty, time of Murditefs. This consists of a frame, somewhat oval in shape, with bars across, strung with rings, which slipped up and down. We can fancy the music produced to be rather Chinese in character and not such as would appeal to Western ears as charming. The priestess of the god was the divine wife or the divine handmaid, a position of great honor, even for the queen. The handle of the sistrum in the oldest times was always cow-eared and ornamented with the head of Hathor, the Egyptian Venus. One of the goddesses to whom the queen is paying honor is Ta-Urt, who has the face of a woman on the body of a hippopotamus. She wears a wig and a robe of state with five capes, described as a cross between that of a lord chancellor and a coachman. Behind the goddess stands the gods Thoth and Nut. Thebes was no doubt the chief residence of Queen Nofretari, Tunis that of the Khitan princess, the king's enormous domestic establishments probably being in different places. There is a story, who can tell whether it be founded on fact, that the king and queen, by the treacherous dealing of one of the king's relatives, were shut up in a certain city which was then set on fire, 
the intriguer doubtless intending to usurp the throne, and that at the queen's suggestion, some of the king's sons formed their bodies into a bridge by which he might escape, some of them suffering death in consequence. The Great Thebes is said to have been as large as London. On the eastern bank, the Arabian side of the Nile, stand Karnak and Luxor. On the western or Libyan bank, Gurna, the Ramzaim, and Medinet Habu. The Ramzaim, a palace and temple combined, faces about halfway between Karnak and Luxor. Medinet Habu is further to the south than any building on the east side of the river. Behind the western group is the great Theban metropolis, along the Libyan range. Further back in radiating valleys are the tombs of the kings. Between Karnak and Luxor is a little less than two miles, from Medinet Habu to Gorna, something under four. The prostrate statue of Ramses II, near Memphis, so long covered with Nile mud, repeats the lineaments of the Abu Simbel statue. This colossus kept vigil at the gate of the temple and is serene and dignified, even in its overthrow. It is of Sinite and probably stood in front of the temple of Ptah, mentioned both by Herodotus and Diodorus. Says a poetic writer, I fancy the repose of that court in a Theban sunset, the windless stillness of the air and cloudlessness of the sky. The king enters, thoughtfully pacing by the calm-browed statue that seems the sentinel of heaven. In the presence of the majestic columns, humanly carved, their hands sedately folded upon their breasts, his weary soul is bathed with peace, as a weary body with living water. This statue is one of the most pleasing of the many likenesses of Ramses II, and a cast of it has been taken. Mariette said, The head modeled with a grandeur of style which one never tires of admiring is an authentic portrait of the celebrated conqueror of the 19th dynasty. The prenomen of Ramses II was Ra Usur Mat Setep En Ra, son strong in truth, approved of the sun, son of the sun, beloved of Ammon. The foot is 11 feet by 4 feet 10 inches, and on the peristyle is inscribed, I am Ozymandias, king of kings. If any would know how great I am and where I lie, let him excel me in any of my works. The passion for building, characteristic of many Egyptian kings, was specially strong in the father and son, Seti I and Ramses II, and the latter completed many structures begun by the former. To Seti I are credited the Grand Temple of Osiris at Abydos, the Temple and Palace of Karnak at Thebes, and his tomb, which is said to excel those of the other Theban kings in its sculpture, colored decorations, and alabaster sarcophagi. But his hypostyle hall at Karnak exceeds them all. To Ramses II are credited many architectural works along the Nile, from the Delta to the capital of Ethiopia, the list comprises the splendid rock temples at Abu Simbel in Nubia, just described, the Ramesium or Memnonium, called by Diodorus the tomb of Ozymandias, on the walls of which are sculptured the story of Ramses' reign, large portions of the temple palaces of Karnak and Luxor, before which last stands the column whose mate is now in the Place de la Concorde in Paris, a small temple at Abydos, and various works in the Fayum, at Memphis, and at Tunis, of which last he was especially fond. In nothing, apparently, did he take more delight than in erecting gigantic statues of himself. To accomplish these great architectural designs required an immense army of workmen, and no monarch was more ruthless in his expenditure of human life. Some have believed that to this period belongs in large part the slavery of the Hebrews, whose cries reached the very ears of heaven, and it is said that he deported whole tribes to accomplish his purposes. History repeats itself, as in the earlier reigns, during the structure of the pyramids, and Queen Nefertari Minimit, like Queen Merdetefs, must have witnessed much suffering and viewed it perhaps with a like indifference. Proud of her husband's deeds and accomplishments, what mattered the cost of such monuments? Of little more value than an insect's life was that of the innumerable slaves that bowed, trembled, and toiled at the great monarch's command. We can believe that the sound of the taskmaster's whip woke no echo of pity in that haughty breast. Devotion to the gods, exaltation in her husband, more or less passionate devotion to her children, these left no room for the consideration of the life and sorrows of a slave. By the Nile, the sacred river, I can see the captive hordes, bend beneath the lash and quiver, 
at the long papyrus cords, while in granite wrapped and solemn, rising over roof and column, Amenhotep dreams o'er Ramses, Lord of Lords. So the curtain drops over the queen in the zenith of her powers, and we hear the tinkle of her sistrum faintly, faintly down the centuries. Priestess, queen, wife, mother, statue, shadow. Thus she stands smiling stonily, yet sweetly, on succeeding ages. Rich in this world's goods, beloved of heaven, yet did she, too, exclaim with Solomon, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Who can tell? End of chapter 15. Chapter 16 of Predecessors of Cleopatra. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ryan Fahey, Fairfield, Connecticut. Predecessors of Cleopatra by Lee North. Chapter 16, Ur Ma'a Nofru Ra. The many-wived Ramses II, if so he was, did not adopt Bluebeard's plan of dispatching one before he espoused another but merely set up separate establishments for each, and so preserved the peace. The king could do no wrong in those days, his divine right never being questioned, and it may be doubted whether the first wife was surprised at, or even objected to, the arrangement. It was an early form of Mormonism and accepted without protest. While Queen Nofritari Minimut was, there is little question, first and chief wife, and probably had been so for many years, and also the mother of a number of children, the Khitan princess, and perhaps others, shared the honor of being legal consort. We know little about the marriage ceremonials of the Egyptians, compared to our very full knowledge of their funeral rites, but a late writer thus describes a wedding which may in part resemble that used by the kings. At the temple, the people remained outside the walls, while the bride and groom, the pharaoh and dignitaries, entered the Hall of Columns. There Hebron, the bride, burned incense before the veiled statue of Amon. Priestesses performed a sacred dance, and Tutmosis, the groom, read the following act from a papyrus. I, Tutmosis, commander of the guard of his holiness, Ramses the Thirteenth, take thee, Hebron, daughter of Antifa, the monarch of Thebes, to wife as wife. I give thee now the sum of ten talents, because thou hast consented to marry me. For thy robes I designate to thee three talents yearly, and for household expenses one talent a month. Of the children which we may have, the eldest son will be heir to the property, which I possess now, and which I may acquire hereafter. If I should not live with thee, but divorce myself and take another wife, I shall be obliged to pay thee forty talents, which sum I secure with my property. Our son, on receiving his estate, is to pay thee fifteen talents yearly. Children of another wife are to have no right to the property of our firstborn son. The chief judge appeared now and read an act in which the bride promised to give good food and raiment to her husband, to care for his house, family, servants, slaves, and cattle, and to entrust to that husband the management of the property which she had received, or would receive, from her father. After the facts were read, Herhor gave Tutmosis a goblet of wine. The bridegroom drank half, the bride moistened her lips with it, and then both burned incense before the purple curtain. Leaving the temple of Amon, the young couple and their splendid retinue passed through the avenue of sphinxes to the pharaoh's palace. Crowds of people and warriors greeted them with shouts, scattering flowers on their pathway. The experience of this same Khitan or Chitan princess, who adopted the name of Ur Ma'a Nofru Ra, or, as given in other places, Nofer Ura Urmda and Ra Ma'a Nofre, Sun, Truth, Beautiful Exceedingly, reminds one of that of Maria Luisa of Austria, who became the wife of Napoleon I of France. The father of each had to bow the neck to the conqueror. The daughter became, in a sense, the hostage. She paid the penalty of defeat. There could not but have been a sense of bitterness at such a fate, in which love could have had no share. How far did ambition, the feeling of being the wife of the greatest monarch of the then-known world, satisfy the empty heart? Among Ramses II's numerous children, his favorites are known to have been his son, Kamos, and his daughter, Bint Antha, 
both perhaps the children of Nofratari Minimut. The one writer gives Isamofer, probably not a legal consort, as the mother of Kamas. We do not know the names of the children of the Khitan princess, or even if she had any. A picture of a number of his sons and daughters, with names attached, the sons with fans, the daughters with Sistra, is between Elephantine and Abu Simbel. Among the pictures of his children are those of the Ramesium at Thebes, where Kamas, his favorite son, is represented in a battle. There are two processions of his children, and in one, two princesses. The eldest son of the pharaoh was called Prince of Kush, as the eldest son of the King of England is now called Prince of Wales. Sutem Hemt was the royal wife, Sutem Mut the royal mother, as such in the prime of life we see Queen Nofretari Minimut. Queen Urm Ma'a Nofru Ra appears only in her beautiful youth as the bride. She herself, says one inscription, knew not the impression her beauty made on the heart of the king. In a novel founded on this part of Egyptian history, a queen is thus described. Her eyes were the color of her hair, a rich sunny brown, like Syriac women of Damascus. On her head, the double diadem of Thebes and Memphis, the inner crown a graceful conical bonnet of white silk, terminating in a knob like a pomegranate bud. Outside a rich band of gold and lined with red silk, red the special color of lower, as white was of Upper Egypt. This was open at the top and worn over the other. Then a necklace of precious stones with a clasp of a vulture, his neck encircled by an asp, emblem of the goddess Ma'ot. She wore a white vestment of gauzy Persian silk, enriched with gold and blue needlework below the waist, and secured by a girdle blazing with diamonds. A long royal robe from the Damascus looms descended to her feet. Some such outline perhaps conveys an idea of the new queen. Not an exact portrait, but a mere suggestion, helpful in filling in our mosaic. Beautiful we may believe her to have been, and much the junior of the man she must needs accept for a husband. She was never allowed to forget the cost at which her honors were bought. However, on many walls of temples and perhaps palaces also, the painted record stared her in the face. Yet did the conqueror regard his adversary, Kitazar or Kitasar, king or prince of the Kitans, by some believed to be the Hittites of the scriptures or, according to others, the Aramaeans, as no mean foe and the compact of peace between them, which was engraved on a silver tablet, was honorable to both. King Kitazar seems to have inspired Ramses II with more respect than some of his adversaries, on whom he looked down with the utmost contempt. It is said that he refused an offer of marriage for one of his daughters from a Mesopotamian prince or king, stating that he would not give his daughter to a nobody. The vanquished Kitazar offered his daughter to the victor, who accepted this marriage as a means of cementing the alliance between them. Ramses had married Nofretari Minimut, who is spoken of as the great princess of every grace in her heart, the beloved palm, mistress of both lands, beloved of the king and united with the ruler, before the death of his father, Seti I, Urma'a Nofru Ra, years after. The queen's establishments were far apart, probably they seldom or never met, but doubtless Queen Nofretari Minimut held proudly to her position as first consort. Both queens must have had some acquaintance with the king's singular and dangerous pet, the lion, who fought with him in his battle against the Kita one of which is named in the picture in which he accompanied the king, Smaru Kef Tuf, the terror in pieces. According to most authorities, the marriage of Ramses II and Ur Ma'a Nofru Ra took place in the fifth year of the king's sole reign. Near the temple of Abu Simbel, there is a passage in the rocks where there is a picture of Ramses II sitting under a canopy between two gods while before him appears the Khitan princess, followed by her father, Kitazar, in the dress of his country. The princess's name is enclosed with that of Ramses II in a royal cartouche, which shows her to have been his legal consort. The stella celebrating this event was probably put up in the 34th year of his reign, a number of years after the marriage. Perhaps the most ancient international treaty in the world, which differs little from those of modern times, is this concordat established between Ramses II and Kitazar, which was intended to put an end to the wars between the Egyptians and Asiatics. 
On the side wall of the Temple of Amon at Karnak, it is given in an inscription. It is dated 21st TB, in 21st year of Ramses II Miamun, in the town of Tanis, and was engraved on a silver tablet and brought by ambassadors of peace. After speaking of the fact that there had been peace between their ancestors at one time, it goes on to say, Kitazar, prince of the Kita, unites with Ramses Miamun, the mighty king of Egypt, to cause to exist between them good peace and good alliance, from this time on forever. He shall be allied with me, he shall be at peace with me, and I, I shall be allied with him, and I, I shall be at peace with him forever. Many pictures of the battles which preceded this agreement of peace are also to be seen on the temple walls. Ramses II's reign was also something of an Elizabethan age in Egyptian literature. A number of old works on papyrus have been found, left by a galaxy of Theban writers. History, divinity, practical philosophy, poetry, and tales are among them. A list of temple scribes is given, naming Bek and Ta, Kyugebu, Hor Ana, Mer M. Aput, Amen M. Api, Pan, and Pentar. The victorious campaign of Ramses II against the Ethiopians is described by Herodotus, who perhaps derived his authority from some of these sources. Pentar, sometimes spoken of as the jovial poet, was easily laureate of this reign. In high, joyful, but martial strains, he celebrated, in heroic verse, the achievements of his master. He glorifies his every deed and makes him a demigod rather than a man. Again and again, Ramses II had Pentar's poem, the so-called Iliad of the Egyptians, inscribed on the temple walls. To the east of the southern door, near the Great Hall of Columns at Karnak, the poem is to be found. At Abydos, Luxor, Karnak, the Ramesium, on the interface of the pylon at the Ramesium, and at the Memnonium, or Tomb of Ozymandias and Abu Simbel, the same familiar scene of Ramses fighting alone is pictured or described. The king is shown in a chariot with prancing horses, and again on a throne with the inscription, Victory for Thebes. Four of these copies of the poem are perfect, at Abydos, Luxor, and Abu Simbel. A fifth, without illustration, is on the wall of the Temple of Karnak, in a fragment at the Temple of Deir in Nubia. Where art thou, O father Amon, prays the king? Does a father forsake his son? Not one of my generals, not one of my captains is with me. I hasten to thine aid, O Ramses, my son, beloved of Amon, answers the god, and singly and alone enables him to perform prodigies of valor. My soldiers have abandoned me, my horsemen have fled, cries the king. I am more to thee than hundreds of thousands, comes the response, and again, the youthful king, with his bold hand, has not his equal. His arms are powerful, his heart is firm, his courage is like that of the god of war. Again the king speaks, the diadem of the royal snake adorns my head. It spits fire and glowing flame in the face of my enemies. They cried out to one another, take care, do not fall, for the powerful snake of royalty has placed itself on his horse. The great temple of Abu Simbel is said by some to have been made in honor of his first victory over the Khitans years before his marriage with the princess. The freshness of the statues there, says Curtis, is startling. It is sublime. All these laudations gratified the king's pride, for the little queen there must have been in it all something of a trial. But it was not a time distinguished for consideration of the feelings of others. For her, the old life was probably closed. There was not likely to have been much intercourse, merely for her pleasure, between her and her family. For purposes of war, and perhaps for hunting, they went far afield, but we can well believe that few trips to a distance, solely for the pleasure of the ladies, were undertaken. Innumerable are the pictures and statues of Ramses II. Alone with Queen Nofretari Minimut and his sons and daughters, and in one or two places with his wife, the Khitan princess. At Gibel Silsile, on a tablet, is a picture of the king, Queen Nofretari Minimut, Queen Tu'a'a, or T, the king's mother, and the princess Bint Antha, all appear in a bas-relief. Again, the king appears before the gods Ptah and Nefertum. A stella in the third year of the reign of Ramses II gives the route to the gold mines which Ramses had worked. 
in the rock temple of Gerf Husen, the king appears as a founder and god to be worshipped. In the half-rock temple of Sebuwa is a large statue of him. At the temple of Dair, there is another picture of him. On the stela of a certain general Amenti near Abu Simbel appears Prince Seti, named, of course, for the father of Ramses II, the king's mother, and the princess Bint Antha. There are, or were, enormous statues of the king at Karnak, Tanis, and elsewhere. To the British Museum and other places in Europe, some of these statues have been removed, and among those in this country may be named one in the Museum of the University of Pennsylvania. In the Museum of Giza is a red granite figure of Ramses II, life-size as a youth at 18 or 20, crowned with an elaborate Osirian helmet, issuing from a diadem encircled by Uraei, this known as the Atef crown. The Hebrews, some believe to have been the slaves who built for Ramses II the treasure cities of Python and Ramses, the Pa tomb and Pa Ramses of the inscriptions, and bricks made with stubble or no straw, have been found, confirming, it is thought, the Bible record. The Egyptian kings, bent on leaving behind them such mammoth structures, all worked with a reckless expenditure of the lives of their slaves and captives. Some of the pictures on tombs give representations of conquered peoples, such as the brown and coal-black people of the Sudan, their princess in a chariot drawn by oxen and shaded by an umbrella, her attendants with feathers in their hair and a kind of hood like that worn by some wild tribes in the present day. Ramses II instituted several festivals, among which may be mentioned that of the Nile and that of Seknet and the goddess Bast at Bubastis where joyous and licentious festivals, like those of Hathor at Dendera, were held. At the former festival, the king was seated on a throne, borne by twelve nobles, adorned with feathers, the throne having the back and feet of a lion. The king wore a war helmet and carried a staff. Behind were the court officials, warding off the sun's rays, with the long-handled flabellium, while the lower order of priests, the kerheb, carried and swung censers of incense. Trains of captives followed, and the king was hailed as Ramses Mayamun, who loves the Nile, the father of the gods, his creator. As the Nile rose, lights were lighted like beacon fires at different points, till the whole country was a blaze of joyful illumination. To the inhabitants, the rising of the Nile meant in great degree life, health, and happiness. A hymn sung to celebrate this desired event is vouched for by Glavatsky, who has evidently made a close study of his subject as authentic. Be greeted, O Nile, sacred river, which appearest on this country. Thou comest in peace to give life to Egypt. O hidden deity, who scatterest darkness, who moistenest the fields to bring food to dumb animals. O thou precious one, descending from heaven to give drink to the earth. O friend of bread, thou who gladdenest our cottages. Thou art the master of fishes, when thou art in our fields, no bird dares touch the harvest. Thou art the creator of grain and the parent of barley. Thou givest rest to the hands of millions of the unfortunate, and for ages thou securest the sanctuary. In some such words as these rose to the blue heavens the praise and acclaim of the grateful people. In the month Paofi, the second half of July, the waters are rising as much as two hands a day, so that the waves in a continuous murmur may be heard splashing over soil dry in the morning, while the color changes from greenish-white to a ruddy tint. Then growing darker, as in the month Hator, including part of August, it has reached half its height, and where men previously walked, they now travel in boats from the middle of September to the middle of October, the month Cheoak, the waters at their height began to fall, while trees blossomed a second time, and fruits were gathered in the gardens. For the next month, Toby, the waters would continue to fall, disclosing more and more of the rich and fructified earth. While the winter season, the most delightful in Egypt, was beginning, the heat rarely going beyond 70 Fahrenheit. As the month Mekhir advanced, more and more land appeared, and flowers of varied hue sprang up amid the emerald green of the fresh grass. By Feanoth, part of December and January, the whole land was abloom. No wonder the heavens rang with the acclaim of the people who witnessed this daily miracle. 
Ubastus was the goddess Aphrodite of foreigners, represented with the head of a lion or cat. The cat was sacred to this goddess and said to have honorable burial here. Indeed, a regular cat cemetery filled with the remains of mummified felines has been found. The feast was held at what corresponds to our Christmas time, and Herodotus thus describes it. When the Egyptians travel to Bubastus, they do it in this manner. Men and women sail together, and in each boat there are many persons of both sexes, some of the women making noise with rattles and some blow pipes during the whole journey, while the other men and women sing and clap their hands. If they pass a town on the way, they lay to, and some of the women land and shout and mock at the women of the place, while others dance and make a disturbance. They do this in every town that lies on the Nile, and when they arrive at Bubastus, they begin the festival with great sacrifices, and on this occasion, more wine is consumed than during the whole of the rest of the year. All the people of both sexes, except children, make a pilgrimage thither, 700,000 persons in all, as the Egyptians assert. In these festivals, both queens probably, separately or together, took a share. Amon Re was the patron deity of Ramses II, but he also paid homage to Sutek in honor probably to his Khitan wife, as this was chiefly confined to Tanis, where we may believe Ur Ma'a Nofru Ra resided. The god is represented with the headdress of a Khitan prince. Whatever traveling she may have done, whatever her experiences, Tanis was home to this queen, while the city grew in magnificence and she watched the erection of a grand temple to the god of her fathers, some proof at least that she held a high place in Ramses' affection and regard. The name Thebes is of Greek origin, as are many of the Egyptian places, our knowledge of the country being in so large a part derived from the Greeks. Tanis also was so named by the Greeks. This formerly great city, of which now only mounds, ruins, etc. remain, was variously known as Tanis, Zoan, or San, the last of Arab designation. It is believed by some authorities to be the Zoan of the Bible, where the miracles were performed. Its history is now told by broken statues, mounds, tombs, and hieroglyphics. Scarcely one stone remains upon another. It is in the delta of the Nile and is called in some of the inscriptions the Place of the Leg, the Winged Disc of the North, and the Cradle of Lower Egypt. It was an old city when Ramses II occupied and embellished it. He never hesitated to pull down and use the materials with which his predecessors had builded, nor to smooth out their cartouches and replace them with his own. Why should he, the greatest monarch the world had ever known, as he doubtless thought himself, shrink from taking his full rights or even obliterating the name and fame of some more insignificant ancestor? And devoted as he seemed to have been to his father's memory, he even did the like occasionally with his father's signature. The monumental history of Tanis, it is said, begins with the twelfth dynasty, a fine broken statue of Amenemhat I having been found. Then follow memorials of later times. Superb statues of the Hyksos period have also been discovered. Of the work of Ramses II, it is quoted that, he found the place given over to the abomination of desolation. He left it one of the most magnificent of Egyptian cities. For this purpose, he laid all Egypt under contribution, red granite and black from Syene and the valley of Hamamat, sandstone and limestone from Silsilus and Tura. His great temples to the gods were but as the parchment on which he inscribed the story of his own victories. It was the spirit of the Pharisee which said, I am not as other men are. Wars and fires at different times have done much to obliterate Tanis and its records, as well as to destroy all traces of it. Mr. Petrie, who, like many archaeologists, spares neither strength nor effort to bring to light the history of the past, with the true lover's fervency in his favorite pursuit, which is to be a gain not to himself but to the world, and Miss Edwards, who to a close study of the old ruins and remains adds a charming power of picturesque description have both told much of Tanis. We condense their accounts of the city at this past era. The Nile was alive with vessels, the banks bordered with towns and villas, the land beyond occupied by villages. The great temple, which looked like a fortress, was half a mile from the shore and approached by a fine road, in part bordered by sphinxes and the city entered by a massive gateway. 
Gigantic statues of the king alternated with sphinxes, the last statue being 14 times the size of a man. There was a grand avenue bordered by columns, 36 feet in height. Pylons, statues, obelisks, a very forest of them, the tribute of the previous centuries, many of them, to the present king. Through these passed many processions, the king, his son, and officials, his warriors, and his captives. He, with the double crown on his head, and glittering with jewels, the leopard skin over his shoulders, to be received by the priests, with divine honors, amid the plaudits and adulation of the people, all to the sound of the harp and flute, cymbals and sistrum. The queen doubtless looking from some gorgeously decorated point of vantage when she did not personally share in the pageant. This was the home of the young queen, these the magnificent sights to which her eyes were accustomed. Parts of private letters on parchment and on pottery have been found, telling familiarly of the feasts and festivals, the expenses and the daily incidents of the life of this period. And the love stories and other fragments of fiction which have come down to us also give their share of local color. The last 46 years of Ramses II's long reign, which is said to have lasted 67, were peaceful, and says one author, it became his passion and his pride to found new cities, to raise dikes, to dig canals, to build fortresses, to multiply statues, obelisks, and inscriptions, and to erect the most costly temples in which man ever worshipped. His eldest sons appear to have died before him, or been passed over in the succession, for it was his thirteenth son, Merumpetah, who shared his authority and eventually succeeded him. He is believed to have been the pharaoh of the Exodus, as Ramses II of the oppression of the Israelites. In strange contrast to the life of Ramses II was the disposition of his body after death. There is a story told of the mummy of one of the pharaohs that in order to obtain entrance into Cairo with his prize, Brook Bay was obliged to pay octroi duty on dead fish, as the officials refused to admit it free of duty and the register contained no directions as to mummies. Doubtless Ramses II received magnificent burial, but in later reigns many royal tombs were rifled and his among them. The empty tomb now remains, but only filled with rubbish, the body of the king, with those of many others, being removed. Inscriptions record that this occurred more than once. In the sixteenth year of the reign of Pinotem I, it was placed in the tomb of Amenophis I, so that even in death sometimes uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. It is said that in 1880, his mummy was offered for sale to an American gentleman who, doubting its genuineness, refused to purchase. In 1881, the wonderful discovery of the shaft containing so many royal mummies was made, and their removal to the Museum of Giza is thus described. Already it was known far and wide that these kings and queens of ancient times were being conveyed to Cairo, and for more than 50 miles below Thebes, the villages turned out in mass, not merely to stare at the piled decks as the steamer went by, but to show respect to the illustrious dead. Women running along the banks and shrieking the death wail, men ranged in solemn silence and firing their guns in the air, greeted the pharaohs as they passed. And so after change of burial place and even of coffin, one of the most celebrated of human monarchs lies in a museum for the inspection of every careless passerby a strong commentary on human greatness and human pride. The mummy was unrolled by Maspero, June 1886, and was found to be five feet six inches in length. The head was small and long. The hair, apparently white at the time of death, was made yellow with drugs. The forehead, low and narrow. The eyebrows, arched and bushy. The eyes, small and close to the thin hooked nose. The temples were hollow the cheekbones prominent, and the ears wearing rings were round. The expression he calls intelligent, but slightly sensual, proud, obstinate, and majestic, even in death. And what of Queen urma a Norfura? As the bride alone, young and fair, she comes before us, and we find no record of her further history or of her death. Was it in her power, as in that of the fair Queen Esther of Scripture, to do aught for the people of her native land, or to influence in any way for good the haughty sovereign to whom she was allied, perhaps, and perhaps only. End of chapter 16.
Chapter 17 of Predecessors of Cleopatra. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ryan Fahey, Fairfield, Connecticut. Predecessors of Cleopatra by Lee North. Chapter 17, Tausert. As Queen Urma Nofru Ra may be considered the bride of life, so we may call Queen Tausert the bride of the tomb, since it is from her tomb alone that we learn anything of her history, and even there the information is most meager. Her name is mentioned as Ta Ursur, Tauser, Tausert, or Ta Ausiri, and it makes her somewhat distinctive among the various Neferts and Ts. She is called the Great Queen and the Lady of the Land, the Princess of Upper and Lower Egypt. She is noteworthy chiefly as being of the blood royal and thus conferring dignity upon her husband, Sipta, or Sipta, her name taking precedence of his on the monuments, as did that of Queen T, wife of Seti I. Also, she was the last queen of the great 19th dynasty, of which Seti I and Ramses II were such renowned monarchs, and of whose queens T, Nofretari Minimut, and Urma Nofru Ra, we have already given outline sketches. To this dynasty, called Diospolites, Lepsius gives the date beginning 1443 BC, and Wilkinson 1340 BC, and one division makes it the Middle Empire. The earliest Egyptian monarchs of whom we have any record built for themselves tombs which seem destined to last till eternity, the pyramids, which someone has finally described as stony tents where innumerable centuries have encamped, which time in vain seeks to drive from the field, and which seem more like druidical remains than specimens of architecture. Says Lady Duff Gordon in her charming letters, There is such a curious sight of a crowd of men carrying huge blocks of stone up out of a boat. One sees exactly how the stones were carried in ancient times. They sway their bodies all together like one great lithe animal, with many legs, and hum a low chant to keep time. It is quite unlike carrying heavy weights in Europe. Later kings spent their energies differently. They built palaces and temples and chose to be buried in caverns in the natural rocks through which they honeycombed innumerable passages, hewed out great halls, or constructed pits in which their mortal remains could be hidden from the light of day. Ramses II lived to a ripe old age, his wives perhaps dying before him, as many of his children certainly did. Of their lives we know little, of their death nothing. The sacred books say of one pharaoh, perhaps of Ramses II, that in heaven he will, at his pleasure, take wives from their husbands, so idolatrous was the worship accorded to these haughty and often tyrannical kings. Seti I had, as we have seen, in early years united his son, Ramses, with himself in the government of his kingdom. And Ramses II adopted the same plan, making his thirteenth son, Merimpeta, co-ruler with himself in the government of the kingdom. The elder sons, of whom Camus is known to have been an especial favorite of his father, as was Bint Antha among the daughters, died before him, or there was some other reason which prevented their following in natural succession. The consensus of opinion seems to be that Ramses II was the oppressor of the Hebrews and Merempata the monarch from whom they escaped. The Israelites are believed to have toiled on the temples, palaces, and other architectural works at Tanis, and on the treasure city of Paten or Pithom. They are mentioned in a triumphal inscription found by Petrie near the temple of Medinet Abu, opposite Thebes. It was engraved on an old slab, originally polished, inscribed, and put in place in a temple by Amenhotep III, which Merempata, with the ruthlessness of many of the kings, took and also inscribed on the back, or rougher side, to glorify himself. Part of it reads, The Hittites are quieted. Taken is Ascalon. The Israelites are... Transcribers note, a line or more seems to be missing here from the original. Shuns, who had invaded Egypt. Petrie also found, among the ruins of a funeral temple at Thebes, a bust of this king in gray granite, which has a firm and rather dogged expression, not untinged with melancholy. The wife of Merim Ptah is given as Ast Nefert, or Isis Nefert, but of her personal history we know nothing. 
the mummy of a certain Queen Anhipu, said to belong to the 19th dynasty, was found, but no details of her life. Amen Messis, mighty bull, beloved of Ma'at, is, by some authorities, said to have usurped the throne after Merim Ptah. His mother is given as Ta'ak Ta'akhat, divine mother, royal mother, great lady, and his wife as royal spouse, the great one, lady of the two lands. He built a tomb in the Valley of the Kings, and he, with his mother and wife, are buried there. It has three corridors and two chambers, and in one his mother and in another his wife are making offerings to the gods. Another list commonly given is as follows. Ramses II, then Merim Ptah, Seti II, his grandson, and Siptah, his great-grandson, perhaps by marriage. Reproductions of the pictures of Seti II and Siptah are given in Petrie's articles, in Miss Edwards' Pharaohs, Fellas, and Explorers, as well doubtless as in other places, and she claims for each of them the distinctive features of the Ramesside family, long heads, long noses, long bodies, and long legs. Photographs have been taken of Siptah and others from the bas-reliefs in the Valley of the Tombs of the Kings at Thebes. Ebers, in his Romance of Joshua, mentions Siptah as the nephew of Merim Ptah and is intriguing to supplant him. Queen Towser's husband is elsewhere spoken of as Merim Ptah Siptah, the son of an usurper, giving color to the idea that it was she and not he who was the descendant of Ramses II. Among ordinary people, the tomb was often prepared for husband and wife together, and occasionally the mummy of the first who died was kept in the house till the death of the second, a constant suggestion that they might soon be reunited, and in pictures they are often betrayed with the arm of one around the neck or waist of the other, showing that affectionate relations were usual. Death and the future life appear to have occupied so large a share in the thoughts of the ancients that their daily life was a sort of apian way, lined with tombs, and we know much more of their funerals than of their marriages and other festivities. The Egyptians were among the earliest, if not the earliest nation, to regard literature, to write books, the inscribed papyrus roll being their printed page, to be handed down to posterity, and to preserve and value them. The Book of the Dead, of which sections belonging to different periods have been found, was a sort of Bible, for which the Egyptians entertained the most profound respect, and whose maxims they seem to have used both as a guide in life and in their preparation of the dead for the tomb. The papyrus containing the tale of the two brothers, in which the younger was unjustly accused of wrongdoing towards his elder brother's wife, bears some resemblance to the Bible story of Joseph's experiences, and belongs to the period of Seti II. Diodorus speaks of a sacred library which he said was inscribed Dispensary of the Mind and belonged to the period of Ramses III. Some ruins believed to have been this building have been found. There was a great hall and several smaller rooms supported by columns. On the jam of one of the smaller rooms, says Kendrick, was sculptured Thoth, the inventor of letters, and the goddess Saf his companion, with the title of Lady of Letters and President of the Hall of Books accompanied, the former with an emblem of the sense of sight, the latter with that of hearing. Treaties with foreign nations were often inscribed, like that of Ramses II and the father of Queen Urma Nofrura, on tablets of silver or other metal, while accounts, letters, and more trivial matters were written on pottery, fragments of which have come down to our own day. In these times, or even earlier, the Greeks made their way into Egypt, and through them, as well as from the monuments, we have derived much of our knowledge of the Egyptians. A late writer on Egypt, Isaac Meyer, draws a parallel between Christianity and the old Egyptian religion, and advances a theory, more ingenious than reliable, that Christ may have been in Egypt later than in his infancy. The Book of the Dead, said to be the great storehouse of Egyptian theology, shows refined and ethical ideas. Horus, the sun god, the victorious of the resurrection from the dead to eternal life, is found chief among the deities there represented, wearing the Osirian crown, and with an endless serpent, symbolic of eternity. Chapters of this book were found in isolated places, and at different times, a collection of preceptus and maxims on the conduct of life. 
Many had fragments of the revered volume buried beside them or engraved on scarabii as ornaments and decorations. In later times than those which we are now considering, the mummy of a young girl was found, with part of Homer in her coffin, having in life probably been devoted to his poetry. Some archaeologists and students see traces of original monotheism in the religion of the Egyptians, one central idea of deity perhaps under many forms, but the idea is not supported by general testimony. Deities, says one writer, were merged into one another. Qualities of one were attributed to another till the pantheon resembled the shifting pictures of the kaleidoscope. Some of the Egyptian precepts and maxims are not without their value in modern times, such as, If thou humblest thyself in obeying a superior, thy conduct is wholly good before God. Knowing who ought to obey and who ought to command, lift not thy heart against the latter. And again, If thou desirest thy conduct to be good and preserved from evil, keep thyself from attacks of bad temper. It is wrong to fly in a passion with one's neighbor to the point of not knowing how to manage one's words. Sipta is sometimes spoken of as an anti-king, regarded as an usurper rather than a rightful heir, and his name is occasionally omitted from the list of kings. His Horus name is said to mean Horus rising in Kabit. He added nothing important to the temples, and, though depicted in relief in Silsila and other places, it is probably only commemorative of small repairs. Buried in his wife's tomb, he was removed, in the troublous times of the 20th dynasty, to the tomb of Amenhetep II. The original tomb has three or four corridors and several chambers. A picture of the queen, offering gifts to the gods, was plastered over by Sekhnebta, who usurped the tomb. The remains of the funeral temple of the king and queen were excavated by Professor Petrie in 1896. Her temple was between those of Meren Ptah and Thothmes IV, and his north of the temple of Amenhotep II. Another suggestion as regards Sipta is that he may have ruled over one part of Egypt, the rightful king over another. But whatever the ambiguity of his earlier history, it is known that he was buried with his wife in the Valley of the Tombs of the Kings, Queen Towsert taking her place with her husband, and not among the tombs of the queens where so many of the royal ladies were laid. There were probably revolutions and counter-revolutions, till the reins of government were once more finally in the hands of Ramses III. Whether from the ambition of an usurper to be laid with the true line of kings, or from a deep affection, Sipta and Towsert shared their tomb, the queen probably having died first, and the king subsequently, no doubt by special order being laid beside her. The tomb was elaborately painted and inscribed, but much is faded by time and the light and air admitted by explorers. Champollion believed, we are told, that he had discovered a cartouche of Seti Neket, engraved above that of Seti II, and the latter above that of Towsert and Sipta, but there is no visible trace of this superposition which would assign to Sipta a date anterior to Seti II. One writer says of Towsert that who the queen was is unknown. She may have been a queen dowager with special rights as daughter of a pharaoh and may have been the widow of Seti I and mother of the prince of Kush. If so, Sipta was her husband's brother and child's uncle. She is also spoken of as hereditary daughter, exalted. Belzone made a close investigation of these tombs, discovering various points of interest which had escaped the notice of earlier explorers. The tombs were cut in the face of the limestone rock, with passages, steps, and doorways, and a pit at the end, probably to discourage intruders. He broke through a wall which gave a hollow sound when struck, and discovered several more pillared halls and passages. The body, which, by embalming, was converted into a mummy, was, especially in the case of royalty and other distinguished people, most carefully preserved. First placed in a casket of cedar or other wood elaborately painted with figures of the gods, this again in an outer casket of wood, more roughly decorated, and finally in a stone sarcophagus. Reference has been made before to a sort of court or trial which was held at the entrance to the grave to decide if the deceased was worthy to enter the presence of Osiris. 
In a modern Arab funeral, a number of men walk first, chanting a ritual. The bier, with a high peak in front, like the prow of a Nile boat, is carried by friends and comes next. And upon the bier, a tin horn is placed if the corpse is a man, a shawl and jewelry and other ornaments if a woman, and a red shawl indicates youth. A more minute description of this is given by Pollard in The Land of the Monuments. The funerals take place within a few hours of death. Different from the old Egyptian custom, the body in its winding sheet is covered with shawls, and the procession is closed by the chief mourners, followed by friends, sometimes walking hand in hand. Details as regards the tomb of Tausert and Sipta are to be found in the guidebooks, but the passing traveler will probably glance hastily at pictures and inscriptions and hurry on. Only the student has leisure or inclination for minute or accurate investigation. The tomb represents the royal couple absorbed in religious exercises, offering to the various gods and goddesses their prayers, praises, and gifts. The queen stands before Harmachus, god of the morning, and Anubis, the god of the dead, and Nefer Tum Hor, and again before Ptah, the opener, and Ma, goddess of truth. All representations of this last goddess are said to be refined, calm, and peaceful in expression, and worthy of the character of the goddess of truth. Then the king stands before Isis, the mother, and Horns, the son, and in other pictures the royal consorts are together before some god, perhaps carrying or crowned with flowers. And again the queen before Harmachus, Hathor, the Egyptian Venus, and Nephthys, lady of the house. The sarcophagus of Tausert bears her likeness, between Isis and Nephthys, a conventional idea of what a goddess was or should be, setting the pattern. The tomb has also other pictures of some of the lesser gods, armed with knives, keeping guard over a chapel to ward off evil ones, Hathor standing in the doorway. Again the king and the high priest, sacrificing to Osiris and the winged goddess Ma in the doorway of a chapel, signifying that only truth may enter. Here is what is called the act of opening the mouth of the royal likeness in the hall of gold. The high priest appears with his staff and panther skin, the Kareb and lower priests who take part in the ceremony, and the people as those who come to the tomb offering incense. Various rooms are carved and ornamented with pictures of numerous gods, Thoth with the moon upon his head, Ma with outspread wings, serpents, boats, and other symbols. Mrs. Stevenson, who has made an especial study of Egyptian symbols, says that most of the Egyptian goddesses may be said, broadly speaking, to represent either luminous space or the activity of the god with whom they are associated, and their common attributes make it easy for the Egyptians to reduce them to one type. Sekhet, the striker, Neith, who shoots, Hathor, meaning the home of Horus, the mother of Horus, one of those designations is the mighty striker, son of Hathor, and who, at Dendera, where she was especially worshipped as the Holy One, is expressly called Sekhet Neith, while all are called Eye of Ra. There are, she continues, exceptions, such as Ma'ut, who represents abstract truth and justice, Safek, etc., and in certain localities where the goddess stood alone, like Neith at Sais, she included all the attributes of divinity, but her place in the local triad is as indicated above. But to return to the tomb, one hall with seats seems to suggest that another sarcophagus rested there. So we spell out, read, and speculate over these monuments of long ago. This king and queen were doubtless buried with great honors. Which was it, love or ambition, that ruled their lives and stamped with its signet even their tomb? Could it be said of them that they were lovely in their lives and in death they were not divided? Evidently, they did not wish to accept the common lot of man to pass away and be forgotten. End of chapter 17. Chapter 18 of Predecessors of Cleopatra. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Predecessors of Cleopatra by Lee North Succeeding Queens From the time of Ramses II to that of the Ptolemy period, 
no queen seems to make a marked impression on the passing centuries. We have here and there a name, here and there an anecdote, but no figure with salient points stands out about which cluster vitalizing incidents or upon whom we may drape a robe of woven romance. Nor were there many even among the kings who have the bold outlines of some of their predecessors. Seknet or Sedenecht was first of the 20th dynasty, is believed to have reigned seven years and united with himself and was succeeded by his son Ramses III. He seems to have made no special mark upon his time, was neither a great ruler nor a great builder, and we know little of him. There is a picture of him and Ramses III kneeling on either side of the sun's disc, and he appropriated and enlarged the tomb of Queen Tausert for himself, covering the figures and name of the queen with stucco. Ramses III was a builder of temples, a rich, magnificent, and splendor-loving monarch, a warrior and conqueror. His Hobra's names were Mighty Bull, Great One of Kings, and Mighty Bull, Beloved of Mayat, Establisher of the Lands. But even at a period whose moral point of view was so different from the Christian, it is claimed that this was a court distinguished for its licitiousness. His queen's name is given as Ast or Is, also as Hamelkazotha, which seems to suggest that she was a foreigner, possibly a Ketan or a Syrian princess. Her father is spoken of as Habwansazonath. Often the space beside the king's name is left vacant, as if she could not or would not appear in his company. From her tomb, also her name is obliterated, while that of her husband and son remain. The walls of the temples and palaces built by Ramses III are adorned with the story of his life. There are naval engagements, the ships with embroidered sails, and the king is seen as a conqueror of the Libyans and others, carried in state above the heads of the people, surrounded by priests and followed by warriors and captives, while in other processions the queen also appears following. The great Harris Papyrus II of the 32nd year of his reign, found near the temple of Medinet Abu or Habu, gives much information concerning him and a long list of gifts which he presented to the temples. Among the other pictures on the walls, we see Ramses III enjoying himself in the midst of, some say his daughters, but more probably the members or slaves of his harem. Others, again, believe them to be intended for goddesses or mythological characters, sylph-like figures attended upon the king. To quote from a previous article upon the subject, one plays draughts with him, another holds a lotus blossom to his nose, a favorite attention in Egypt. Others offer him wine and refreshments. The queen, as a chief figure, nowhere appears. The costumes approach that of the Garden of Eden, a necklace and light sandals. We are reminded of the description of a Japanese family. The summer costume of a middle-class Japanese consists of a queue, a breech cloth, and a pair of sandals. That of his son and heir, the same, minus the queue, the cloth, and the sandals, while that of his spouse is a little and only a little more elaborate. It is impossible, naively and gravely, remarks one critic, rather than from the standpoint of the 20th century than the 20th dynasty, that respectable families should so have conducted themselves. Therefore, the garments must have evaporated in the course of years, but it was so near the Garden of Eden, the climate was so warm, and the little creatures seemed so at ease in their airy nothings that it is almost appears as if beauty unadorned was adorned the most. Some of the pictures are too obscene for reproduction. It is of interest to note how very ancient are certain games, such as chess, draughts, or checkers and others which still hold a place among our modern amusements. Other pictures discovered years ago in the Mastabas or grave chambers of still earlier date, 5200 BC, give also the game of chess, the invention of which has been attributed both to India and China. Extensive insurrection and disturbances, it is evident, had prevailed in the kingdom and that Ramses III had brought order out of the chaos. He described himself as the darling of Amun, the victory bringing Horus. After his conquests, he turned his attention to building, commerce, digging of reservoirs, and planting of trees, 
Nevertheless, a general decline of Egypt is said to have begun in his reign. But if the king had restored order in the land, not so well had he kept his own household in check. Records remain of a conspiracy which arose in his harem, headed by the lady T. Tai or Te, said to be the mother of a certain pentar or pentaert whom she wished to put upon the throne. She probably hated the royal wife, the great lady, the lady of two lands, asked. In exactly what way the Lady T was related to the king is not specified. In both the museums of Paris and Turin, there is some account of this cause celebre. The steward, Paul Bacamon, was her chief coadjutor, also a certain Pen Huibon, or Hui, a cattle inspector who indulged in black art, made amulets and images of wax for ladies, and had books containing directions how to strike people blind and to make figures in effigy to bring trouble upon anyone who was hated. Melting wax figures and sticking pins in them to harm an enemy we think of as belonging to the age of Queen Elizabeth, and lo, it was known and practiced in Egypt thousands of years before. On the other hand, may it not have been also possible that Queen Isor Ast had some share in the plot or at least sympathized with it, thus giving another reason for the non-appearance of her name beside the kings. One of the ladies concerned wrote to her brother, commanding the army in Ethiopia, and ordered or entreated him to fight against the king. But whether he did, as was desired or not, the revolt was unsuccessful. It was crushed with some severity, and it is said 40 men and six women were compelled to commit suicide and a mummy thought to be that of Pentaur, and showing signs of death by poison, has been found. Ramses III reigned 37 years, and there is a list of his sons, several of whom succeeded him. He was buried in the tombs of the kings, doubtless with all the honors of state, but his body was not allowed to rest in peace. It was included in the general upheaval caused by robbers before described. His mummy was found in the large coffin of Nefertari Ames, and on being unrolled fell to dust. His features were said to be softer, finer, and more intelligent than some of his predecessors. His figure less straight and vigorous, and his shoulders narrower. His red granite sarcophagus is in the Louvre and the lid in the Fitzwilliam Museum at Cambridge. His tomb is sometimes called the Harpers, from the figure of two harpers in a scene on one side. Also, Bruce's tomb, from the name of the modern discoverer. Among the treasures found in this tomb were two golden baskets. His period is given as 1200 BC. Ramses III was succeeded by his sons or connections of the same name, who followed him, as one writer has said, with ominous rapidity, from number one to number 13. They seem to have been a faineant race, and the proud name of Ramses degenerated from reign to reign. Here and there in the tombs of the kings or in other spots, we find their last resting places. Among them, perhaps, Ramses IV was one of the most conspicuous, and his queen, given as Isis asked, was buried in the tombs of the queens. The tombs of Ramses IV and VI are decorated with astronomical designs. The sun appears in his chariot as Horus Ra, and that of Ramses IV has pictures of the resurrection. The seventh son is given as Ramesu Meritam, son of Queen Mufno Ferrari. A papyrus of the time of Ramses IX gives an account of the violation of the royal tombs by robbers, which was then discovered, and this abbot papyrus contains a list of the tombs inspected. Hence the mummies were removed at different periods from place to place for greater safety. A woman called Little Cat confessed that she had been in the tomb of Queen Ast, wife of Ramses III, and purloined various articles. The line of priest kings, of whom Herhor was the first, chose a common place of sepulture, and thither were at last carried many of the earlier royal remains. The discovery of these in the cave at Deir el-Bahari made a worldwide sensation and has already been referred to. There were three kings of the Thothmes name, two Ramses and Seti I, as well as the later kings of the priestly line, Pinotem and Pinozem first and second. Here too, we learn the little we know of some of the queens. There was Queen Ansara of the 17th dynasty, Queen Ames Nofetari, Hadamuhu, and Sitha of the 18th, and Queens Notamat, 
Hathor Hauta Ni, Mako Ra, and Isim Keb, and a queen, Hestem Seket, as well as Princess Nesse Khonsu, and a number of princesses and priestesses called Singers of Amen. Some of the coffins of this period show on a yellow ground, a picture of the dead piercing a serpent with a lance. Among the tombs of the queens are a few of the 18th, but more of the 19th and 20th dynasties. Here was placed the wife of Ramses III, with name no longer legible. Here Queen T or Titi, wife of the earlier King Amenophis III, with her blue eyes and fair skin, pictured as making offerings to the gods. Here Bint Antha, favorite daughter of Ramses II. One tomb has the name obliterated and Tuatent Apt written upon it in red ink. Here is Isis Ast, wife of Ramses IV, Queen Citra of the 20th dynasty, and many others. There is an interesting story of a queen by some authorities said to be the wife of Ramses XIII, by others of Ramses XII, and by some queen of Ramses II or III, claiming that Ramses XII was never in Mesopotamia, while Mariette believes it to have been merely a legend invented by the priest to do honor to the god Chonsu or Khonsu. This king, whatever his place in the royal line was, like his great predecessor, Amenophis III, fond of hunting. He also went abroad to collect tribute from subjugated peoples and in Mesopotamia, among those who came to pay, was a certain chief or prince who brought with him a beautiful daughter with whom the Egyptian king at once fell in love and bore her home to share his life and throne. This princess of Bakhtin took the name of Raneferu, the glories of the sun, and evidently had much influence with her husband. For later came messengers from her native country, saying that her sister, Bentresh, was ill and begging for the loan of the Ark of the God Khonsu, which was sure to cure her. We can hardly imagine the king willing to part with such a treasure, except to pleasure the queen. To her wishes, therefore, he yielded, and the Ark with a proper escort was sent away, and accomplished a miraculous cure, as had been anticipated. Naturally, those who were benefited clung to the same, and years passed without the return of the borrowed treasure. But finally, the king or prince of Bakhtin dreamed a dream, like the pharaoh of scriptures, in which a golden hawk came out of the ark and flew to Egypt. Possibly the king of Egypt had demanded its return before, or perhaps the queen's influence had been used to induce him to leave it for the benefit of her family as long as possible. The explanation is not given, but at last the conscience of the delinquent was pricked and the ark with royal honors was returned to its native land. Queen Ra Neferu is variously spoken of as Mesopotamian, Bakhtin, or Lydian. From this story, we may infer that she was young and beautiful at the period of her marriage, that she had great influence with the king and possessed near relatives to whom she was warmly attached. But this, so far as we know it, is the whole of her story, and other queens than she of the same general period make no figure among the records. For some time, the priests had been gaining in power and influence, and Ramses XIII seems to have been set aside, and her whore, priest of Amen, the third who had directed affairs of state, seized the reins of government. He is described as of a pleasing countenance, with features that were delicate and good, an expression that was mild and agreeable. The priest kings were the chief rulers, but a few descendants of previous pharaohs held sway in a portion of the kingdom. As Japan was once divided between the Mikado of the old regime and the shogun, the military and political chief. Of these monarchs and such of their consorts, as are mentioned, we now give a brief summary, chiefly following the guidance of the well-known Egyptologist, Professor Wallace Budge. Nesbatedet is called the first king of the 21st dynasty of Tanis. From the time of this king to that of Semedekaius II, third king of the 26th dynasty, the dates are given as from around 1100 to 600 BC. Egypt declined in power and influence, and its tributaries recovered their independence. With the close of the 25th dynasty, the new empire came to an end, and the period of Egyptian renaissance began. The feeble kingdoms of the south and north were again united under Shawshang I and a Libyan reigned. The worship of the cat-headed goddess Bast increased, and that of Amun-Ra declined, while his priests were forced to seek refuge in Napata Nubia. 
Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, sacked Thebes and ruled by governors. Nesbatedet, the Smendes of Manetho, possibly a descendant of Ramses II, reigned at Tanis, while the priest king Herhor reigned at Thebes. The name of the former's queen, Thentamun, is about all we know of her and is thought to suggest her having the true claim to the throne. King Nesbatedet reigned 29 years, making no such mark in history as did his great predecessors. This king is also called Nesubanebtet. Next came Pasabkhanet, the first, second of the Tanite kings, who was called the Mighty Bull and reigned 41 years. The statues of the Nile, north and south, in the Cairo Museum are said to belong to this period. Long and uneventful seem to have been the reigns of these kings for Amun Amat. Amun and Karnak, a descendant of Nesbatedet, reigned 49 years, and our chief knowledge of him seems to be derived from a steel at Cairo making offerings to Isis, his favorite goddess. Possibly this king was succeeded by one or two others with short reigns. Authorities do not seem decided on this point. A king, Sasa Amen, is believed to have reigned 16 years. His greatest work was the restoration of the pylons of the temple of Ramses III at Tanis. Gold and porcelain tablets have also been found engraved with his name and he added it also to the two obelisks taken from Heliopolis to Alexandria, and thence in modern times to London and New York, thereby proving he had authority in Heliopolis. Pasab Khanet II added Hera to his name, thus distinguishing himself from Pasab Khanet I. He was the last king of the Tanite, 21st dynasty, and his daughter is said to have married Solomon. We read in 1 Kings, and Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David. Thus, in the so usual fashion, he strengthened his political connection by marriage. And the Bible further says, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had gone up and taken Gezer and burnt it with fire, and slain the Canaanites that dwelt in the city, and given it for a present unto his daughter Solomon's wife. Pasab Khanet II reigned, it is said, twelve years, and another daughter married Osorkin I, the first king of the 22nd dynasty. We now turn again to the priest kings in Thebes, also called the 21st dynasty. Of the first of them, Herhoru, or Herhor, we have already spoken. A common title of his was Living Beautiful God, Son of Amun, Lord of the Two Lands, Lord of Diadems, and he wore the royal Uraeus on his forehead. Queen Notamut, Notamit, or Nekemet, was either mother or wife of King Herhor. Authorities differ as to which relation she held to him. By some, she was believed to be a princess of Ramesside blood, as her name is found encircled by a royal cartouche, while that of the king was not so decorated until the fifth year of his reign. Another says she was called great royal consort, but not king's daughter or princess. There is a finely executed but dilapidated statue of this queen inlaid with glass, and her head is also on a sphinx. A papyrus belonging to her, illustrated with medallion heads or portrait vignettes of her husband or son, her whore still exists, part being in the Louvre, part in the British Museum, and part in the possession of a lady in Berlin. It was the sale of some of these fragments that led to the discovery of the royal mummies of Deir el-Bahari. The canopic boxes of Queen Nota Mutt represented, according to custom, a little chapel placed on a sledge, a small jackal in black wood, mounted on the cover. Many were found, like the mummies themselves, in coffins not belonging to them, but their inscription tell who were the rightful owners. Miss Edwards discovers a likeness between one of the carved masks of Ramses II and the vignettes of Herhor, and thinks the mummy case may have been made in the time of the 21st dynasty and given the likeness of the reigning king, rather than the person for whom it was intended. Herhor repaired and preserved many of the mummies of the more ancient kings. He was succeeded apparently not by his son Pianchi or Pianchi, who perhaps died before him or whose reign was too short or insignificant to be dwelt upon, but by his grandson Pinotem, Pinozem, or Pinectum I, who is said to have married a princess of the old line, a daughter of Pasab Khanet I, king of Tanis, and who is variously termed Mayat Kara, Ramaka, or Rahama. He was both high priest and king, which has caused some confusion to the chronologists. His Horus name was he who satisfieth the gods, he who performeth glorious things for their doubles. He had a long reign, some say 21 years. 
Queen Mayat Kara is called on one of her coffins, Divine Wife, a priestess of Amen, in the apse, Lady of the Two Lands. In the same coffin was the tiny mummy of her infant daughter, Mudamhat. Mother and child evidently died soon after the birth of the latter. A box with two compartments accompanied them, filled with funeral statuettes for the two queens. For the baby, though she died and was embalmed in infancy, is called Queen Maut Emhat. An accompanying papyrus gives the royal cartouche around the name of Mayat Kara, but to the child also, strangely enough, the title of royal wife, etc. Another wife of the same king was called Hentawi, daughter of Nebsini and Thentamon and mother of the high priest of Amun, men Kepara, her mummy, with double coffin, was found at Deir el-Bahari. Great efforts had been made to preserve the lifelike aspect. Red was put on the lips and cheeks, and the eyes were treated with eye paint. She wore a much becurled wig, and even the furrows made by mummification were filled with paste. Pyonectum I had also been removed to Deir el-Bahari, and the upper part of the body was found rifled of amulets, but the lower part was intact, the Book of the Dead between the legs. He had repaired and found places of safety for royal mummies, Amenhotep II, Thothmes II, Ramses II, and Ramses III. The priest kings made Thebes their residence, while the old line dwelt at Tanis or San. One writer says that the papyri of the princes and princesses of the family of Pinectum or of Pinozem show the best traditions of art to have been yet in force in the time of the 21st dynasty. The Ushabti little figures, which so often were placed in the tombs with the mummies, came into general use in the 18th dynasty. They were made of painted limestone, hard stone, steatite, wood, etc. At the end of the dynasty, they began to be made of porcelain and were glazed with such colors as mauve, yellow, chocolate, and blue. In the 19th dynasty, blue was the universal color and figures were made like living people in everyday clothes rather than as previously to resemble mummies. This continued through the 20th dynasty and is found sporadically under the 22nd, while in the 21st, as a general rule, they had returned to the mummy form and had a brilliant blue glaze with black inscriptions. In the Book of the Dead, in the 18th dynasty, the vignettes were sometimes colored, sometimes plain, later coarser, and more representative of modern things. Masahirth and Menkemper-Ra, sons of Pinectum I, seem to have been priests rather than kings. The latter married Astem Kebet and became the father of Pinectum II, Hentawi, and others. Astem Kebet, or Istem Kebet, is sometimes spoken of as queen, and probably belonged to the royal line. Authorities differ much as to this period, and it is difficult to give a perfectly clear account of the succession. Many of this lady's belongings were found among those of the royal mummies so often referred to. That she died before her husband is proved by his seals remaining unbroken upon the hamper of mummified food accompanying the body. She was evidently much beloved and buried, like others of her family, with special care in three coffins, elaborately decorated and swathed in the finest of linen in long plaits. The usual shabti, or little servants, accompanied her, as well as beautiful vases in blue glass inscribed with funerary legends. Baskets of food, boxes with wigs, and many other articles, the reproductions of those used in daily life, were included in her burial outfit. A pet gazelle was also mummified and buried with her, a pathetic suggestion of her tenderness of heart. Funeral tent, with an inscription wishing her a happy repose, among the first articles found when the modern discoverers entered these long hidden places of sepulture. Pinectum II, son of Astem Kebet, married Nessu Kensu, who seems sometimes to be regarded as a queen, and is the last of the line of whom we have record. Her husband, too, appears rather as a high priest and commander of soldiers than a king, and again the claim to higher descent may have been on the lady's side. There were several children of this marriage, but they are not specially noteworthy. The priests apparently did little for the enlargement or aggrandizement of Egypt. They ruled about 125 years, preserved generally friendly relations with the more ancient royal line. They ruled about 125 years, preserved generally friendly relations with the more ancient royal line, seemed to have been less oppressive and despotic than some of the earlier kings, and contented themselves with repairing the temples and the royal mummies, and have left behind many interesting funeral remains and papyri, said to form a highly important class of literature. End of chapter 18. Read by Paige Sevilla.
Chapter 19 of Predecessors of Cleopatra. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Predecessors of Cleopatra by Lee North. Succeeding Queens Continued. Authorities agree that the 22nd dynasty made Bubastis its principal city and seemed to have been descended from a race of great chiefs. Shawshank or Sheshank I, the Sesonkis of the Greeks, and Shishak of First Kings was the first king of the dynasty, a Libyan, son of the chief of Namrath, who was buried at Abydos, and of whom there are statues in Florence, as well as gold bracelets with his name in the British Museum. Also, the grandson of Shawshank, the great prince of Mashawasha, and the Egyptian princess, Metet and Usek. Shashank I married a Ramside princess and through her, probably or possibly through his Egyptian grandmother, laid claim to the throne. His reign seems to have begun before the death of Pasib Khanet II, last king of the 21st Tanite dynasty. One author says his wife's rank was shown by the prefect Sutumsat, where others claim that this belonged to the Egyptian grandmother. Shashank I married Karama or Karamat, called a morning star of Amun, daughter of the last Tanite king. She had been despoiled of her inheritance and was restored to all her rights by this marriage. The custom of taking more than one wife often enables the student to reconcile apparent discrepancies. Brooks says the ordinance relating to this marriage was engraved on the north side of a pylon near the temple of Amun and Karnak. Thus spake Amun, the king of the gods, with regard to any object of any kind which Karama, the daughter of the king of Upper Egypt, Miaman Pesabkan, has brought with her as the hereditary possession which had descended to her in the southern district of the country, and with regard to each object of any kind, whatever which the people of the land have presented to her, which they have at any time taken from the royal lady, we hereby restore it to her. Any object of any kind, any object of any kind whatsoever which belongs as an inheritance to the children that we hereby restore to her children for all time. Thus speaks Amun-Ra, the king of the gods, the great king of the beginning of all being, Mut, Khonsu, and the great gods, etc., etc. At great length and with much repetition, closing with a number of threats, if this command is not complied with and ending with, we will sink their noses in the earth, and an unfinished we will. Josephus says that Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who revolted against Solomon, took refuge with Shawshank I until Solomon's death and married a daughter of the king of Egypt. Later, Shawshank I made an expedition against Rehoboam, son of Solomon, who governed the two tribes and was proud of the victory by which he recovered the Egyptian hold on Palestine. The dates of the 22nd dynasty are given by Budge as 966 to 750 B.C., Shashank I also repaired the temples and caused his son, the viceroy of a part of Egypt, to remove to a place of greater safety various royal mummies, who perhaps traveled more after death than during life. Shashank reigned 21 years, called himself Prince Double Mighty Subduer of the Nine Bows, greatest of the mighty ones of all lands, thus falling not a whit behind the Ramside predecessors in his estimate of himself. He was succeeded by his son Osorkin, or Usorkin I, who, according to Manitho, reigned 15 years. There is a head of Osorkin in the British Museum of a Mongolian type, once thought to be one of the Hyksos kings. He appears to have had two wives, Tashat Kinsu, whose son Thekaleth, succeeded to the throne, and Mayat Kara, daughter of a Tanite king, whose son Shawshank became high priest and commander of the forces. He is, by some, credited with a third wife, but she was perhaps merely a concubine, and the two others evidently occupy a first place. Teklut, or Thekaleth I, followed with a wife named Sheeps, daughter of Neder Merhuru, probably a priest or one of the Egyptian nobles, and they had two sons. The eldest, Namareth, became a priest, while a second, Osorkin, succeeded. Manitho says Thekaleth I reigned 23 years, but there are a few authentic records remaining either of him or his queens. Usarkan or Osorkan II had three wives, and according to the same authority, reigned 29 years. One queen's name was Kirama or Kariyama, and she had a son called Shawshank, a name which seems frequently handed down in the race. A second queen, Matketch Anks, or as she is elsewhere called, Mut Hat Anks, 
whose son Namareth was again high priest, and a third, Asem Kebet, daughter of the princess Thesbas Peru, who gave to her daughter her mother's name. During the reign of these sovereigns, the goddess Bast, who had formerly been a mere local deity, rose to first importance, and Bubastis superseded Memphis and Thebes as the principal city. The king held magnificent festivals in honor of Amun and as a tribute of respect to the queen, who not only inherited sovereign rights over the principality of Thebes, but was also high priestess of Amun. Pontifical rights were sometimes inherited in the female line, and this gave her husband claims at Thebes, Bubastis being the chief seat of his government. A colossal Hathor-headed capital in the museum in Boston bears this inscription. In the year 22, in the first day of Choriac, October 8th of our reckoning, the appearing of his majesty in the hall of festival. He reposes on the throne and the consecration is begun, the consecration of the harem of the house of Amon. The priestess of Amon were designated as the wives of the god and the consecration of all the women who have dwelt as priestesses therein since the day of his fathers. There is a bas-relief showing a procession, first the king, then the queen, and her daughters, followed by many priests and women, these last slender and graceful, carrying water jars, said to be of electrum, others bearing sheaths of flowers, some of the ankh, or life sign, and still others in single file, clapping their hands in measured time. Queen Karama is followed by her or the king's daughters, and little dwarfs, like the god Bess, are also included in the procession. The princesses are called Taspa Kepper, Karoma, and Mary Amen. The queen assists the king in making offerings in the great festival hall, built especially for the purpose. A sculptured bas relief of King Osorkan II and Queen Karama at full length is in the British Museum. Scarabs of these and the later periods are in the New York Museum and in many other places. An inscription remains telling of a great flood which occurred in this rain, so that in order to enter the temples, the priests had to wade through water several feet deep, and it is said to have been the highest rise of the Nile ever known. Of Shawshank II, who succeeded, or of his wife, almost nothing is recorded. He was probably a peaceful king and did little towards building or repairing temples. Queen Karamama was the wife of the next king, Teklet or Thekleth II, who reigned 15 years and is described as the great chief of Mashanasha. The queen is called great royal wife and beloved of Mutt. Brooks speaks of her as a daughter of Nimrod and gives her a very lengthy name, which we can only hope that the lady was of sufficient size to carry. Another wife is called Mutt Sat Aman. The former was the mother of the high priest Orsorkin. The queen was descended from one of the royal families of Thebes, and perhaps in deference to her wishes, they dwelt for a while in Thebes, with a view also, no doubt, of propitiating the priests. The queen is also called Princess, Great Lady, and Mistress of the South. Shawshank III turned the huge statue of Ramses II into a pylon, having no more respect for his predecessors than did Ramses II himself and his exploits are inscribed and described after those of Ramses II and Seti I. He adopted the prenomen of Ramses II. An Apis bull, a tablet records, was born in the 28th year of his reign, but though it lasted 52 years, there seemed to be no memorials remaining, which was also the case with his successor, Hamai. Nor in the reign of his son Shashank or Shashak IV do we find mention of the queen. The former seems to have reigned only two, the latter 37 years. All this time, Egypt was in more or less of a turmoil with a divided or disputed succession. Such a condition of things, says one writer, was of course fatal to literature and art, which latter did not so much decline as disappear, and after Shawshank I, no monarch of the line left any building or sculpture of the slightest importance. In this period of doubt and disorder, we have the names of a king, Petabast, Athmeri Amun, and Uasorkin or Osorkin III, whose mother and wife are probably mentioned as royal mother, royal wife, Tata Bas, and son of the sun, Nasak N, living forever, in a golden aegis of the goddess Seket in the Louvre. Named as one of the 23rd dynasty, we have Pionki, who descended on Egypt from Ethiopia, whither the priests had retired, who made his capital at Napata, and who probably through his wife was connected with the old world families of Egypt. Pionki called himself King of Kush, 
and the mother, sister, and daughter of the king bore each a title of honor as queen of Cush. In inscriptions, the king is spoken of as being like a panther, and we further read that, Then Nimrod sent forth his wife, the queen, and daughter of a king, Nesthet Nes, or as she elsewhere is called, Nesthet Meh, to supplicate the queens and royal king's daughters and sisters. And they threw themselves prostrate in the women's house before the queens, saying, Pray come to me, ye queens, king's daughters, and king's sisters. Appease Horus, the ruler of the palace. Exalted is his person, great his triumphs. Cause his anger to be appeased before my prayer, else he will give over to death the king, my husband, but he is brought low. When they had finished, her majesty was moved in her heart at the supplication of the queen. This comes from a closely written memorial stone set up by the king. It is spoken of as the inscription of Pianchi Merimen, king of Egypt in the 8th century BC, and the Nimrod mentioned was probably Namareth, one of the petty rulers of Egypt before referred to. The stone was discovered at Mount Barkal, the place where it was originally set up, and the words in brackets are those half obliterated and restored to make out the sense. When the victor entered the conquered city, we are told that then came to him the king's wives and the king's daughters, and they praised his majesty after the manner of women, but his majesty did not turn his countenance upon them. Ungallant majesty who was hastening on to further conquest and had no time for social amenities. To Nemereth, however, who finally came, leading a horse with his right hand and holding a sistrum made of gold and lapis lazuli in his left, Pianchi was more condescending, nobly forgave him, like some other nations we have heard of, who were defending his own territory and accompanied him to the temples and then to Nemereth's stables, where he, with further condescension, actually scolded the grooms for giving the horses two short rations during the siege. Elsewhere, the Queen Pianchi, or the next monarch, is spoken of as sister and wife, the Queen of Kekmi, Egypt, Geroa Ropi. The stone from which this was taken has two pictures, the other showing also the Ethiopian queen. Says Brooksh, while the sister of the king is designated as queen of Nubia, another who was also a wife of Miamun Mut is called queen of Egypt. His majesty seems to have spent a great deal of time sailing up and down the river, yet conquering wherever he went, and it is probable after the weak rulers had all submitted to him, he returned to Ethiopia where he died. According to Manetho, there was but one king of the 24th dynasty of the old line named Barkan Renef, who reigned for six years only at Sais, and there is no mention of his wife. But meanwhile, an Ethiopian, possibly the son of Pianchi, held authority at Thebes and is called King of the South, Casta. He seems to have married a priestess of Amun called Divine Adorer, or Morning Star, a daughter of Osorkin III by the name of Shepenapt and Sabaka, who became king, and Amun Artis, a priestess who held the rank of Netertuat, which her mother had also borne. This Sabaka, or Sabako, became king of the Nubian 25th dynasty and reigned about 12 years. He called himself king of the south and north and son of the sun. He appears to have made repairs on various temples and was a contemporary of Sargon and Sennacherib, kings of Assyria, with which country, as well as with Palestine, the confused history of Egypt through all this period is much associated. Queen Amun Artis, or as she is elsewhere called, Amun Eretus, married Pianchi, a Nubian prince, and styled herself royal daughter, royal sister, royal wife. Her husband called himself uniter of two lands and multiplier of mighty men. The queen was a zealous restorer of the temples and added chambers and small sanctuaries at Karnak, in one of which a fine limestone statue of her was found. We know that she was considered beautiful and Brooksh says sweet peace seems to hover about the features, even the flower in her hand suggests her high mission as reconciler of the long feud. A part of the inscription at her feet on the base of the statue at Giza, from which the names of her father and mother are erased, reads, May he, the god Amen, grant everything that is good and pure by which the divine nature lives, all that the heaven bestows and the earth brings forth, to the princess the most pleasant, the most gracious, 
the kindest and most amiable queen of Upper and Lower Egypt, the sister of the king Sabako, the ever-living, the daughter of the deceased king Kasta, the wife of the divine one Amonistus, may she live. Of herself, she says, I was the wife of the divine one, a benefactress to her city, Thebes, a bounteous giver for her land. I gave food to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, clothes to the naked, so we may judge that she was good, beautiful, and beloved. There is an ivory plaque of Queen Amenoritis in the New York Museum bearing a figure and a cartouche of the divine wife Amenoritis, daughter of Ra Costa, the sister, and it says also the wife of Sabaco of the 25th dynasty. The queen is shown on the plaque, kneeling on the right, holding a lotus in each extended hand, with a necklace and short hair like a man's, and on her head a crescent and disc. There is an alabaster statue of Queen Amenoritis on a base of gray granite in the Giza Museum, which has a rather long but slim and delicate figure, but the head is overweighted with the wig of a god, and she has a gloomy expression, possibly brought on by the discomfort of her wig in particular and her experiences of life in general. Numerous monuments and scarabs bear her name and titles, and Budge says that within the last few years, the British Museum has secured a remarkable object once belonging to her. It is of glazed steatite with a cartouche and a short prayer cut in hieroglyphics upon it. At one end, a perforated projection by which it was probably hung, and on the other a sign, its use is unknown. Shabaraka, son of the sun, is accounted the second king of the 25th dynasty and was probably associated with his father in the government. A steel now in turn represents Shapen Opt with her mother Amenar, her husband Pianki, and Shabataka, showing them to be contemporaries. Brugge says that Pima or Pimai means the male cat. King Shabataka or Shabatak, the son of Sabako, is in the Barabra language Sabaatoki, the male son's cat, just as a Barabran word Kashato, horse's son, lies at the base of the name Kashta, which is an interesting little piece of philology. An ancient tradition, it is said, affirms that at the end of 12 years, Shabataka was taken prisoner and put to death at Taraka, who became the last king of the dynasty and reigned, some say, 18, some 25 years. He married the princess Amentakhet, the chief wife, the royal sister, the royal wife. The name of his mother is thought to be Akaluka, though it is mutilated in the inscriptions, and as she appears to have been related to the priest kings, it was probably through her that Taraka laid claim to the throne. It is said that when he was about 20 years old, he was proclaimed king of Napata and leaving his mother behind, who had doubtless used her influence to produce this result, he hastened to Egypt, overthrew and perhaps slew Shabataka, who was then reigning. A steel which he set up at Tanis gives the further information that he was the younger but favorite son of his father and certainly a youth of ability to accomplish what he did at the early age of 20. He calls himself son of Amun and was crowned with royal honors according to the customs of the ancient Egyptian kings. He sent for his mother and saluted her as the spouse of Amun, while she, says Brugsh, looked upon him with the same pride which Isis felt as she gazed upon her son Horus. And leaving out any moral aspect of the question, a mother might well be proud of such an able and energetic son. Some believe that Taket Amen, whom he married, was the widow of Shabaka, first king of the 25th dynasty, as he was the last king of the same, and upon both mother and wife he bestowed high titles and many honors. 693 or 691 BC is the period given as that on which he ascended the throne. The priests had, so far as in them lay, made Napata a duplicate of Thebes, but not its equal in fineness of architectural work. Taraka added materially to the building and repairing of the temples. He built one at Napata or Gebel Barkel, subsequently destroyed by the fall of overhanging rocks, and added to and restored many in Egypt, in all of which no doubt his mother, if not his wife, took great interest, as did Queen T in the work of her son, and Aten. The early part of his reign was peaceful, then Sarah Crib, king of Assyria, 
seems to have defeated the king of Egypt and others in battle and caused him to flee, returning temporarily to overthrow the governors appointed by the Assyrian king when Esarhaddon, the son, succeeded, only to be again overthrown. Before the king's death, which is spoken of as going to his dark doom, he associated with him Tanith Amun or Tanit Amun. The last appearance mentioned of the women is on a steel at Gebel Barkel, where the king is making an offering to the god Amen, and his sister Quilhatat, a tiny figure, is pouring out a libation and shaking a sistrum. Behind the king stands his wife, Kir Erhenti, while the king has on sandals of a peculiar shape, the two ladies are in bare feet. Still another king is called Tandamani, son of the sister of Tishaka, yet the former seems accounted the final ruler of the 25th dynasty. Of the time from the 22nd to the 25th dynasty, says Budge, with this period the new empire comes to an end and we are on the threshold of the renaissance of the Egyptian kingdom with all its ancient arts and sciences brought into connection with the Greece of the 7th century before Christ. Under Shawshank, a slight revival took place and he ruled the whole land, putting an end to the weak dynasties of Tanis and Thebes. But with the close of the priestly dynasty, the glory of Thebes, which had lasted 2,000 years, had departed, and by the time of the Ptolemies, the city was almost in ruins, and Bubastus in the delta, of whose festivals Herodotus has given us an account, rose to the first place. During this time, to quote again from Budge, much of the spirit of the old art had undoubtedly been lost. The hieroglyphic script had become chiefly an official and sacred code of writing used for funeral prayers, historical inscriptions, etc. And the decay of the written language, begun as early as the 18th dynasty, was followed by the decay of the writing, which became more conventional and abbreviated, and the hieratic, supplemented by the newly developed script, is now known as enchorial or demotic. The peoples are common writing. It is also said that the 18th dynasty was much more elaborate and luxurious in costume than the earlier ages, but that the severe simplicity of the former commended itself to the 26th dynasty, which we now consider. The first queen seems to have been Shep N. Opt II, a descendant of Queen Amenhoritis. Her cartouche was found on a cornice, and she probably was of higher birth than her husband, Sametic I, or Sametichias I, who is thought to have been merely the son of a governor, while she was of the blood royal. The queen was a priestess of the grade Neder Tuat, and through her doubtless, her husband laid claim to the throne. Semedic Caius I made Sais his capital. He was, after he was once established on the throne, less fond of war than many of his predecessors, was a patron of the arts and sciences, and turned his attention to the building of temples. A distinct renaissance of art took place at this period, with high finish and elaboration of detail, a certain elegance suggestive of Greek influences. He added a large gallery with side chambers to the Serapium at Saqqara, and the steel found here by Mariette are of the greatest chronological importance. We learn from them that Semedic Caius I immediately succeeded Taraka by the records of the birth and death of the Apis bull. His name is found in various places, Philae and elsewhere, and an obelisk belonging to his reign were brought by the Emperor Augustus to Rome. He was, some say, of Nubian, some of Lydian origin, and there's a glazed porcelain Ushapti figure in the British Museum, supposed to be a likeness of him, which is very fat and jolly looking. He had a long reign of 54 years, and both Herodotus and Diodorus gave accounts of him. The daughter of this marriage was named Nitocris or Nitocort, and an inscription says Semitic Hyas has made a gift to his father, Amon. He has given him his eldest daughter, Nitocrit Shapan Apit, to be his divine spouse, and that she may shake the sistrum before him. The princess traveled from one part of the kingdom to another and was received with great honor. Sometimes the queens adopted daughters and associated them in the governing power. One still found at Karnak states that the king caused his daughter to be adopted by the lady Shepin Opt, the sister of Tirka, who had inherited property from her father and mother and had previously adopted a daughter of Tirka's, Amenartus II. Says Budge, the steel, which is dated in the ninth year of the reign of Semedicaius I, proves that Tiraka's sister was ruling at Thebes as a priestess of Amun, while Semedicaius I was reigning at Sez, and that when Nitocort had been adopted by her, the daughter of the king of Sez, Nitocort, took her name also. The steel was set up to commemorate her journey to Thebes, where she was welcomed with the greatest joy as the heiress of Tiraka's sister, 
and where she no doubt received not only the property, but also the rank and position of her whose name she took, Chopin Op, the daughter of Pionki, and Almond Artist the first, and granddaughter of Costa and Chopin Op the first, the last named lady being a daughter of Osorkin. The distinction between Chopin Op, the wife of the king and the adopted mother of her daughter, does not seem to be very clear. Natakris bore the same name as the last ruler of the sixth dynasty, and a rose-colored sarcophagus inscribed with this and having a granite cover is in one of the museums. All this period is to some extent still a matter of dispute among authorities as to the exact titles and order of succession of the kings, and as to their importance in the line, compared to their predecessors, and even to their successors, they were but petty rulers, holding control over but a portion of the country and in many cases more like governors than chief authorities. According to Professor Budge, Apries was the next king. His Horus name was Ua Abra, and he is spoken of as Pharaoh Hophra in the Bible, of whom, though he reigned from 19 to 25 years, we know little, and his wife is not mentioned. He was overthrown by his own general, Amasis or Amas II, who became king and apparently lived in peace with his predecessor for some years, but slew him, or permitted him to be slain, when Apres endeavored to regain his lost authority. Amasis II took unto himself several wives and welcomed and favored the settlement of Greek colonies in Egypt. He took the Horus name of Smen Mayat, establisher of law, and was apparently good-natured and affable when not fighting. His wives are given as the Lady Shent Keda, daughter of Pedanit, and the Queen Takanath, daughter of Semeticius I. She had been chosen heiress of Nitocris or Nitocourt, and it was doubtless to legalize his claim to the throne that Amasis II contracted the marriage. The female pieces in this regal game of chess were an immense value. What share the ladies had in the disposal of their hands we do not learn, but in most cases it could hardly have been an important one. Amasis II was a builder and restorer of temples, and his name is found in many places. At the end of his 44th year to power, he died and was buried at Sais. Queens Shepin Opt and Nidocris, who were priestesses of Amun, were buried at El Asofif and laid, as were other ladies of royal blood, in tombs with finely worked antechambers and inscriptions, and with false doors. Samthek, or Semeticius III, who reigned only six months, succeeded to Amasis II and is sometimes omitted from the list of kings. He was the son of the Lady Thent Keda, and some reliefs of him are found in a small temple near the temple of Amasis II and Nidocris where there are pictures of these queens, and with him ends the 26th dynasty, and we come to the consideration of the Persian rule, numbered, though of entirely different blood, as the 27th dynasty. End of chapter 19. Read by Paige Sevilla. Chapter 20 of Predecessors of Cleopatra. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Predecessors of Cleopatra by Lee North. Daily Life. How lived, how loved, how died she? are questions that rise in the mind in thinking of these royal ladies of the past. Of their individual lives, but few records remain, and it is from inscriptions and paintings on the tombs, especially of those of less prominence than the kings, we may gather something of the daily life of the queens. No nation of the earth has shown so much zeal and ingenuity, so much method and regularity in recording the details of private life as the Egyptians, says Bruch. The king's tombs chiefly celebrated their victories, the king riding forth in his chariot or with his captives by the hair in the act of slaying them, or the king, sometimes accompanied by the queen, making offerings to the gods. These are the favorite subjects for the artist's pencil, but for the details of female life we must look elsewhere. From the tomb of T of the 5th dynasty, sometimes called the peeps of that period, and from the sepulchres at Beni Hassan, much has been learned of the domestic life. T 
tea was a favorite subject of the king's, an official of high rank, and his wife a lady of noble birth, of kin to the royal house. So we have pictures of all the household arrangements, the feeding and preparing of animals for food, the tenants, male and female, bringing of the fruits of the earth to their master, and he himself, after the Egyptian manner, painted of larger size than his inferiors, going forth to fish and to hunt. Sometimes, but rarely, the women also accompanied their husbands on these expeditions. A statue of tea bears the same likeness as the figure in the tomb. It is that of a fine young man with regular features, and the statue of his wife, Nofri Hotep's granddaughter of a pharaoh, was also found. As has been said before, the women in Egypt had no such separate and secluded life as those in the eastern countries. They appear to have mingled freely with their male relatives, and the queens acted as regents during the absence of their husbands, or the minority of their sons, or sometimes ruled in their own right from the earliest times. There were the apartments of the women, or the king's harem, but not in such an exclusive sense as in many other eastern countries, nor was the chief official in charge invariably a eunuch. The seat of government changed from time to time under the different dynasties, so that some of the queens lived chiefly in Memphis, some in Thebes, some in Tanis, and among the later rulers in Sais and Napata. The palaces were not many stories in height, and had sometimes pylons and columns in front. The rooms were built round a succession of open courtyards, which were shaded by palm, orange, olive, fig, and other trees. And they also had large and beautiful gardens with fountains, especially in the royal country villas. On the flat roofs the people passed many hours and disported themselves under awnings and slept there on rugs and mats. In the country the houses and grounds were usually surrounded by high walls. Large mansions stood detached and had doors opening on various sides and before the columns or colossi at the entrance hung ribbons or banners especially on festival occasions sometimes a portico had a double row of columns with statues between these were also colored and when not of stone were stained to represent it the walls and ceilings of the palaces were brilliantly painted they were also at times inlaid or adorned with lapis lazuli which was a favorite stone amber and malachite in the royal establishments there were porticos and vestibules constructed with great splendor numerous columns walls glittering with jewels and curtains of gold tissue floors were of stone or composition roofs with rafters of date palm and transverse beams of larger palm stone arches have been found both of the time of ramses three and Semeticus. rare woods were imported and also demanded as tribute from foreign nations conquered by the egyptians as well as gold silver precious stones and slaves after passing through the servants offices one came to the storerooms the great dining hall the sleeping rooms and the kitchens and at the further end of a piece of ground two buildings turned back to back and separated by small gardens 
were the women's apartments, which often had shutters closed with valves to keep out the heat. The lady is spoken of as mistress of the house or lady of the house and seemed to have full rule over it. There is even a story that her husband himself was bound to obey her indoors, but this is hardly likely. They had low stools for tables, flat baskets for dinner plates, and pretty Syrian maidens were favorite slaves. Couches, chairs, stools, and tables were of wood, bronze, and silver. The feet were often of lion's claws, and the top of the tables were upheld by figures of captives and slaves. The furniture was carved with serpents, lotus flowers, and other designs, and the back of a couch or chair was sometimes a hawk with outspread wings, and the ends of the couch terminated in the head of a lion or other beast. Sometimes the couches were used for beds and made ornamental in the daytime. The Egyptians had alabaster or wooden headrests like the Japanese, though the manner of hairdressing did not seem to require it to the same extent. The ladies' dressing tables were covered with boxes for ointment, bottles for cosmetics, perfumes, and oils and they used small metal mirrors, often with the figure of the god Bess as a handle. The costumes adapted to the climate were light, especially in the earlier times, and the chief part was of fine linen. Later there seems to have been more elaboration and heavier and richer materials used. Wigs protected the head of both male and female from the sun, as did the turbans and veils of other countries. The vulture with outspread wings, emblem of the goddess Mut, formed part of the queen's headdress, as did the royal asp, raised in act to strike. Thoth was the god of learning, called the baboon with shining hair and amiable face, the letter writer for the gods. Children and youth were expected to study and exhorted even as far back as the time of King Pepys, give thy heart to learning and love her like a mother. And there is also a touch of kinship with more modern times in the statement that the boy scholar be not allowed to oversleep, and that children left school shouting for joy. Severity was sometimes used, as we read. The youth has a back, he attends when it is beaten. And again, the ears of the young are placed in the back, and he hears when he is flogged. Copy books of 1700 B.C. have been found, and we possess the school exercises of the 19th and 20th dynasties. Such examples in mental arithmetic as there were seven men, each had seven cats, each cat had eaten seven mice, each mouse had eaten seven grains of barley, how much barley had been lost in this way, etc., etc. But neither were the pleasures and amusements of the little ones overlooked, and there have been preserved little wooden soldiers in the dress of ancient times, dolls, balls, and many other things that still delight the child of today, such as tops, boats, etc. An olive branch was hung at the door on the birth of a boy and a strip of woolen cloth at that of a girl. If a newborn babe cried nigh, it would live, but if it cried neba, it would die. Mothers nursed their children for three years, 
and upon daughters more than upon sons was laid the obligation of looking after their parents in old age the royal children had also when they were old enough quarters of their own where they were under the charge of a tutor who was called a nurse those of the higher orders dressed like grown people as in the present day the children of holland are often the amusing reproductions in miniature of their parents the children of the lower orders dispensed in great part or entirely with any sort of covering women were mistresses in their own house came and went freely and so much so that we have an amusing story that among the lower classes the husbands sometimes hid their wives shoes to keep them at home and this before the days of female clubs but in spite of her privileges childbearing and work soon aged this class of women among the moral precepts of the egyptians in a papyrus now in the louvre is one that says ill-treat not thy wife whose strength is less than thine be thou her protector showing that it was no slavish relation that was expected to exist between man and wife and again in another place we have a father who exhorts his son to have regard for his mother it is god himself who gave her to thee and now that thou art grown up and hast a wife and house in thy turn remember always thine helpless infancy and the care thy mother lavished upon thee so that she may never have occasion to reproach thee nor to raise her hands to heaven against thee for god would fulfil her curse at the door of a house where there was a bride flowers were hung and a vessel of water was placed where there was a death fragments of impassioned love songs have come down to us and though we know little of their marriage customs compared to their funerals the freedom of intercourse between the sexes and the greater opportunity for personal acquaintance than was usually afforded in eastern countries leads to the supposition that real love matches were not infrequent like the japanese they compared the beloved object to blossoms and flowers nor were the ladies apparently behind the gentlemen in the free expression of ardent feeling thou beautiful one my wish is to be with thee as thy wife says or sings the enthusiastic maiden and miss edwards and others give instances where each strophe begins with an invocation to a flower thus curiously resembling the stornelli of the tuscan peasantry of which every verse begins and ends with a similar invocation to some familiar blossom or tree o flower of henna my heart stands still in thy presence i have made mine eyes brilliant for thee with coal when i behold thee i fly to thee o my beloved o lord of my heart sweet is this hour an hour passed with thee is worth an hour of eternity o flower of marjoram fair would i be to thee as the garden in which i have planted flowers and sweet-smelling shrubs the garden watered by pleasant rivulets and refreshed by the north breeze here let us walk o oh my beloved hand in hand our hearts filled with joy better than food better than drink is it to behold thee to behold thee and to behold thee again this shows clearly the freedom of intercourse permitted and with what naivete and frankness it is written 
No effort at dissimulation in acknowledging the artificial enhancement of her charms. Rather, perhaps, did she feel herself worthy of commendation for the pains she had taken. It reminds one of the southern girl who remarked casually to a party of friends of both sexes, How chilly it is this morning. Oh, now I know why. I forgot to pencil my eyebrows. In their feasts and amusements, men and women met together and scenes in the tombs of the 18th and 19th dynasties show ladies discussing their earrings and jewelry as they might be doing today. To perform toilettes together, put on necklets and exchange flowers was part of the entertainment and talking, eating, and dressing all went on to the sound of music. Birthdays and many other festivals, religious and social, were celebrated, and there were lucky and unlucky days for music, as well as for many other things. It was especially to be avoided on the 14th Tybee. Pollard mentions a musical at home among the pictures on the walls of the tombs at Beni Hassan, where two harpists, a sistrum player, and others are helping to entertain the visitors. The guests sat on chairs or on the floor and did not recline at table, as was the custom of many other Eastern nations. Their entertainment consisted of meat, chiefly beef and kid, geese, fish, vegetables, of which leeks and onions formed a large part, fruit, bread, cakes, which the bakers made in various shapes, and wine. This was freely used, and the pictures sometimes show overindulgence on the part of the women as well as that of the men. Sometimes there were separate tables for men and women. Sometimes they sat together and frequently dipped into a common dish. They had spoons for fluids with various designs for handles but the use of fingers was general for most purposes, hence the necessity of frequent washing of the hands. Of the use of leeks and onions, story says, speaking of an Italian, nor is he without authority for his devotion to those twin saints, Apollo, or is it Cipolo and Aglio? There is an odor of sanctity about them, turn up our noses as we may. The ancient Egyptians offered them as first fruits upon the altars of their gods and employed them also in the service of their dead, and such was their attachment to them that the followers of Moses hankered after them, despite the manna, and longed for the leeks and the onions and the garlic, which they did eat in Egypt freely. Nay, the fastidious Greeks not only used them as a charm against the evil eye, but ate them with delight. There is a certain specific against them. Eat them yourself. You will smell them no longer. The host and hostess sat together. Flowers were abundant, and a special token of regard was a wreath placed around the neck of the guest. Women were attended by women slaves who offered them ointment and other toilette articles. Oil poured upon the head is an attention which would fail of appreciation in these modern times, but was then considered so agreeable that a ball was sometimes soaked in oil and placed on the head of the master of the feast so that it might trickle down into his hair. At the close of the banquet, a mummy in miniature, richly gilded, was carried round to remind them of their latter end, or may it not have been to suggest that happy as they were, they could be happier still in another world. 
we can imagine the olfactories of the Egyptians to have been abnormally developed, so constantly were they smelling flowers and holding them under each other's noses, even the sacred nose of royalty. Smell of my lotus! How charming! How delicious! We can almost hear the echo. Statues also show husband and wife sitting with hands on knees or across the breast or sometimes on the same chair with arms around each other's waist or neck. Doubtless they offered each other what we may call the tribute of the lotus or the lotus courtesy, murmuring, My dearest, how lovely you are looking, chiefly to the lady, of course, etc., etc. In the earliest times, musical instruments seemed to have been played chiefly by men, and women sang without accompaniment. But later, female as well as male voices combined with all sorts of instruments. There were kettle drums, round and square, harps, lyres, guitars, flutes or pipes, and lastly, especially Egyptian, the sistrum, not melodious in sound we may judge, but used chiefly, though not invariably, in the service of the gods. Wilkinson gives many illustrations of these various instruments, and the picture of a lady with a guitar is in the Berlin Museum. The flute, so easily handled, has always seemed to be reserved for male performers. Perhaps it takes too much breath from the ladies, or perhaps Minerva, having discovered that it was unbecoming, they have all resolved to shun it. Pollard speaks of a harp inlaid with gold, silver, and gems, which had been presented by a royal personage to the temple of Amen-Ra and was kept near the sanctuary, and the hymns sung to the deity to the accompaniment of this precious instrument. We also have the song of a harper found on the wall of the tomb of a certain Neferhotep who lived under King Horus of the 18th dynasty. It is called the word of the harper who tarries in the tomb of Osiris, etc. Celebrate the great day, O prophet. Well is it to thee, fragrant resin, and ointments are laid before thee. Here are wreaths and flowers for the vases and shoulders of thy sister, who is pleasant to thy heart as she rests beside thee. Let us then sing and strike the harp in thy presence. Leave all cares behind and think of the joys until the day of the voyage comes when man casts anchor on the land which delights in silence. To rejoice and to dance were synonymous terms, and the royal ladies had dancing women to perform before them as well as gymnasts. They played draughts and checkers sitting on the ground while dice belonged to the subsequent Roman period. Dwarfs and deformed persons formed occasionally part of the king's or queen's household. As a rule, dancing seems to have been rather for princesses to look upon than share in, unless they danced in the temples before the gods. Female dancers wore short skirts, necklets, anklets, ribbons round their bodies, and wreaths of flowers, with plain wigs that made them look like children, and they sometimes dressed their hair to look like a crown. Ball playing was considered a variety of dancing. The dances of the older period were more quiet and measured than in later times but none appear to have been objectionable, according to modern standards, to the extent of some now practiced in the East.
The maids of honor and princesses carried fans, which they held over the queen, and bore the title of dearest friend. When the queen and royal ladies drove forth, it was in chariots, sometimes of gold, and drawn by a pair of horses after the introduction into Egypt of that valuable animal of which there is no representation on the monuments of the very earliest times adorned with plumes while an umbrella was occasionally fixed to the chariot to protect them from the sun but the queen's highest position was as priestess concubine daughter wife of the god egyptian queens or princesses held the service of ammon or jove and the queen followed in the king playing on the system and making offerings no queen held the highest priestly office but they were called singers of ammon and wives of the god occasionally the mummy of the daughter will be found among the priests the mother among the royalties the queen was Neterhemt, prophetess, Neterhemet, divine wife, or Netertut, divine handmaid. The sistrum was from eight to eighteen inches in length, Hathor headed, cow eared, and sometimes inlaid with silver or gilt, and the noise was supposed to frighten away Typho, the spirit of evil the action of shaking was called art cess a sistrum in either hand standing before the altar of the god the queen had reached the highest pinnacle of human greatness or human ambition end of chapter twenty Chapter 21 of Predecessors of Cleopatra. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Predecessors of Cleopatra by Lee North. Persian Queens. With the conquests of Cambyses, Egypt became subject to a new set of rulers, by whom its manners and customs were, in a degree, changed or modified, Yet such are its inherent characteristics that it has been often said of Egypt as of Greece that she rather impressed herself upon her masters than was impressed by them. Through the Persian period to that of the Ptolemies, women retired into the background and no one name comes into prominence, at least in an official character. It is in connection with Persia rather than with Egypt that we learn of the queens, some, perhaps most of whom, remained in their own land while their husbands were absent, engaged in wars and conquests. The kings, distracted by wars in all directions, often made hurried visits to their conquered territories, leaving satraps and deputies to rule in their absence. The legal queen, we may believe, tarried at home while the warriors left their women behind or were accompanied by their concubines, to whom no formal honors were paid. Hence it is more than possible that although nominally queens of Egypt, but few of them ever resided in the country, those of the kings who reigned the longest, of course, being most likely to do so. The Persian kings usually chose their wives from among their own nobility. The concubines were of varied nationality. In thinking of these royal ladies, we seem to see a veiled figure with beautiful shining eyes wandering among the gardens of the palaces, which gardens were said to be less formally laid out than those of the native Egyptians, but she is silent. Or behind palace walls we hear the echo of distant music, and perchance the sound of soft singing to the accompaniment of a lute or some other instrument. If she looked forth from her windows it was from behind curtains and latticework, and if she appeared in public it was with a veiled countenance, only the eyes showing. The ruins at Persepolis, Ekbatana, the capital of Media, and Susa acquaint us with the construction of Persian palaces, which differ somewhat from the Egyptian. When in Egypt, the Persian kings probably accepted, to a considerable extent, the architecture and general arrangements of that country. Madame Ragazin gives us, from an earlier source, an account of the palace built by Darius at Persepolis. 
a central hall flanked by two sets of apartments of four rooms each with a front entrance composed of a door and four windows opening on a porch supported by four columns and forming at the same time the landing between the two flights of stairs such the ruins disclose the throne and audience hall the reception and banqueting hall was two hundred and twenty seven feet every way with cedar and cypress beams upborne by a hundred columns ten rows of ten tall and slender they rested lightly on their inverted flower base carrying the raptured ceilings proudly and with ease on the strong bent necks of the animals which adorned their capitals of that peculiarly and matchless fanciful type which is the most distinctive feature of a Caimanian architecture. The king's throne was supported by rows of warriors, and he wore the flowing Median garb or the tight-fitting Persian doublet and hose. The master of ceremonies kept his hand before his mouth, and all who approached kept their hands hidden in their sleeves in token of peaceful intentions. The remains of the palace of Xerxes, the Ahasuerus of the Bible, have also been found similar to but not so fine as those of darius the buildings were usually of one story and sat on a terrace or platform sometimes made of columns of the great hall of xerxes mr ferguson says we have no cathedral in england that at all comes near it in dimensions nor indeed in france and germany is there one that covers so much ground cologne comes nearest of the women's appointed place we read between the porphyry pillars that upheld the rich moresque work of the roof of gold aloft the harams curtain galleries rise where through the silken network glancing eyes from time to time like sudden gleams that glow through autumn clouds shine on the pomp below the gardens attached to the palaces we may well believe favorite resorts of the queen and her attendant ladies shaded paths sparkling fountains retired resting places and beds ablaze with flowers all these made a charming retreat in the midst was usually a hall kiosk or arbor raised on several steps a fountain in the center making a musical murmur and spreading coolness around it was enclosed with gilded lattices over which rioted in careless grace vines of jasmine honeysuckle and other creepers a fair green wall overhung and protected by tall trees here too doubtless the king enjoyed some of his hours of leisure wrapped about with the perfume of violets and sipping a sherbet of violets and sugar a favorite drink in persia we learn of a betel carrier and taster of sherbets to the emperor lest poison might secretly be prepared for the royal palate it was always necessary to have a taster the first victim in case of evil intent to this other duties were added such as chief holder of the girdle of beautiful forms and the grand nazir or chamberlain of the harem king canute sat on the brink of the ocean and ordered it to come no further king darius or xerxes laid a similar prohibition on the waxing proportions of his spouse neither perhaps was strictly obeyed by dame nature at least it appears to have been the duty of the holder of the girdle of beautiful forms to do what he could permit me most gracious lady alas one inch beyond the line of beauty subsequently perhaps starvation and tears to ensure return to the stipulated measure costly materials rather than shape were prized by the persians and their ornaments were less ornate and elaborate than those of the egyptians rings and bracelets were of plain gold collars of twisted gold but comparatively unartificial their household utensils too seem to have been few and simple in pattern a covered dish and a goblet with an inverted saucer over it are often pictured in the hands of the royal attendants occasionally but rarely we hear of persian women indulging in manly sports as roxanne daughter of idernes and half-sister of teratukmes was skilled in the use of the bow and the javelin the queen's mother when the widow of the late king took precedence of her daughter-in-law the wife of the reigning monarch had certain privileges peculiar to herself was attended by a band of eunuchs and dined with her son in the women's apartment though not nominally in public life her influence was often very great and at times used or abused most cruelly as in the earlier times certain cities in egypt were assigned to furnish the revenues of the queen and that of antilla was appointed to provide her with shoes 
This must also, it would seem, have applied to the females of her household, as a single pair of feet, even though royal, could have been but a slight tax on the revenues of a town. To return to the thread of history which we are following, King Apries was overthrown and succeeded by Amasis, who, usurper though he was, seemed to have reigned long and well. The date given for the close of the reign of Apries is BC 579, and Amasis ruled for 45 years. His son, Psammetic III, had been on the throne but a few months when Cambyses conquered Egypt. Syria appears to have been held by Egypt during the 18th and 19th dynasties, while later Egypt disputed its possession with Assyria, and lastly the Ptolemies and Caliphs ruled it from Egypt. But the Egypt of which we now make study was no longer a country united under one head and going forth to conquer and demand tribute from surrounding nations. She was alternately divided under the sovereignty of a number of petty kings or ground under the heel of some all-conquering but more or less temporary master. Wars and internal dissensions were constant, with now and then a longer period of comparative peace and tranquility, in which the country had breathing space to recover from the desolation and ruin that had preceded it. The Persians, numbered as the 27th dynasty, came in as masters who desired rather to trample upon than conciliate their subjects. They outraged the sensibilities and prejudices of the people, and it is said that the arts, long in decline, received a severe blow from their invasion, while many of the finest buildings in Egypt were mutilated and destroyed by Cambyses, hence revolts against the new authority were frequent. Cambyses himself appears to have acted at times like a cruel madman, and whether the story of his stabbing the revered Apis bull be true or not, and, like all old stories, its authenticity is sometimes disputed, the incident is but an illustration of the general course which he pursued. He was son of Cyrus the Great, king of Persia, said to be the grandson of the Median king Estiages, and his mother was said by Ctesias to be Amitius, and by Herodotus to be Cassandane or Cassamdane, daughter of Pharnespes, a member of the royal family who died before her husband. Cambyses was in every way inferior to his father. The children of this marriage were two sons and three daughters, the sons Cambyses and Smerdis, the daughters Atossa, Roxana, and Artistone. Cyrus left his kingdom to his elder son, but placed so much power also in the hands of the younger that Cambyses caused his brother to be secretly murdered that his rights might be undisputed. Following the Egyptian custom, or setting up a law for himself, since it does not seem to have been the habit of the Persian monarchs, he married his two sisters, Atossa and Roxana. The Persian judges said it was not lawful for a man to marry his sister, but the king could of course do as he pleased. The unfortunate Roxana excited the fury of this monster by mourning for her brother Smerdis, and is said also to have been killed by Cambyses with a kick. A Greek inscription at Behistan affirms that Smerdis was murdered before Cambyses started for Egypt, that the latter committed suicide in the end, that the rebellion was a religious one, and that the Magian was not Smerdis but Gomates, and the discovery of the imposture is not as generally given. Other authorities claim that Smerdis was murdered by Cambyses' orders during his absence, but the affair seems much involved in mystery. Cambyses adopted as his Horus name Horus, the unifier of two lands, and styled himself born of Ra. For a third wife he took Nitetis, daughter of the previous Egyptian king Apries, but sent to him as the daughter of Amasis, the reigning monarch. Upon this deception, it is asserted, hinged the invasion of Egypt. There seems to be a discrepancy in dates, some holding that Nitetis would have been too old a bride for Cambyses, and therefore it must have been Cyrus that took her to wife, and that Cambyses was her son rather than her husband. But this tale is believed to be of Egyptian origin, made up to remove from their shoulders the stigma of being merely a conquered people and set up a pretense that Cambyses had some legal right to the throne by descent from an Egyptian princess. Another tale is thus given by Herodotus. A Persian woman visited the harem of King Cyrus, was struck with the beauty of the children of Kasadane, and praised them greatly to their mother. Yet would you believe it, said Kasadane, Cyrus neglects me, the mother of such children as these, to pay honor to an Egyptian interloper. On this Cambyses, her eldest son, a boy of ten years of age, exclaimed, Therefore, mother, when I am a man, I will turn Egypt upside down. 
which threat, if ever made by him, was most surely fulfilled. Supposing Nitetis to have been the granddaughter rather than the daughter of Apreus, the dates become more intelligible. It is this period of history that Ebers has selected for his romance of an Egyptian princess, which, like all his historical novels, if lacking perhaps great vitality in the individual characters, has a carefully studied and interesting groundwork of historical fact. The truth or the tradition, whichever it be, runs thus. Amasis, king of Egypt, sent by request to the king of Persia, suffering with some trouble of the eyes, his special oculist. The physician, resentful of long ostracism from home and friends, suggested to his patron that he should demand in marriage the daughter of the Egyptian king. The plan was proposed not in good faith, but with a desire to make trouble. Perhaps the reputation of Cambyses was already evil and well known. At any rate, the proposal produced consternation rather than joy, and satisfaction in the circle of the bride-elect. Possibly Amasis held with special tenderness the daughter in question. Be this as it may, he sent not the princess demanded, but one who is probably considered of inferior dignity. Doubtless she went adorned in regal splendor that the deception might not be suspected. Her fingertips would have been tinged with henna to look like branches of coral. She would perhaps wear the Persian headdress, composed of light golden chain work set with small pearls, with a thin gold plate pendant about the size of a crown piece, on which was impressed an Arabian prayer and which hung upon the cheek below the ear. The coal's jetty dye would give that long, dark language to the eye. A small coronet of jewels would be placed upon her head and over all a rosy veil. The veils the eastern women wore over the head were coquettishly managed to add to their attractions, says the poet in Lala Rook, veiled by such a mask as shades the features of young Arab maids, a mask that leaves but one eye free to do its best in witchery. The Arab women wear black masks, prettily disposed, and Niebuhr mentions their showing but one eye in conversation, and again says more, and bright the glancing looks they hide beneath their litter's roseate veils. So Nitetis, hardly a happy bride, was wedded to the Persian king, and nightingales warbled their enchanting notes and rent the thin veils of the rosebud and the rose, according to a favorite image of the Oriental poets. But not joy, peace, and happiness resulted, rather wars and bloodshed. Perhaps in innocence, perhaps in malice, the new queen revealed the secret of her identity to the king. Since he did not put her to death, we may believe that she herself had some attractions for him, but the deception he would not forgive and seized upon it only too gladly as a pretext for invading Egypt. Across the desert which protected Egypt on the northeast marched Cambyses and his army, while his fleet, supplied by the Phoenician cities and the Greeks of Asia Minor, blockaded the Egyptian king, Psalmetic III, only recently come to the throne, in Memphis. The herald was sent in a Greek vessel to demand surrender. The Egyptians, with mad and cruel folly, courting their own destruction, since such an act would be sure to infuriate the invader, seized the ship and tore the crew to pieces. If not before, from that moment their doom was sealed. Cambyses took Memphis, B.C. 525, on the Pyramid Plain, where later Napoleon bade his soldiers do their best, for the centuries looked down upon them. It is said that Cambyses put cats and other sacred animals before his troops so that the Egyptians were afraid to attack. Be this as it may, the Persians obtained the mastery, and Cambyses took his revenge on Amasis for the affront offered him by causing his dead body to be burned. One cannot help thinking of the homely phrase, give a dog a bad name, in connection with this ancient king. All the ruin that occurred for hundreds of years seems set down to the credit of Cambyses, who, with the most evil intent in the world, could hardly have accomplished all that was claimed for him. He is said to have left nothing unburnt in Thebes that fire would consume. An earthquake in Cambyses, said Curtis, divide the shame of the partial destruction of Memnon. An old inscription at the base of the statue reads, I write, after having heard Memnon, Cambyses has wounded me, a stone cut into the image of the Sun King. I once had the sweet voice of Memnon, but Cambyses has deprived me of the accents which express joy and grief. Tradition also says that Cambyses threw down the magnificent statues set up to adorn the Temple of Victory, built by Seti I at Old Kerna. 
Yet Pliny has preserved the story that the same king was so struck by the beauty of a certain statue that he ordered the flames which he had kindled extinguished at its base. It is probable that all his other crimes paled into insignificance in the eyes of the Egyptians before his murder of their sacred bull. For this his memory would have been execrated forever had it been his only deed of violence. But whereas the Persians spoke of Cyrus as father, they called Cambyses despot or master. Ferocity and cruelty seem to distinguish most of his actions. Both the hawk and the bull appeared as emblems of royalty and divinity among the Egyptians from the earliest times, but the bull was also highly regarded in Assyria, India, and among other ancient nations. The hawk was sacred to the sun, the Apis bull, the living image of Osiris, the incarnation of a source of life and creative energy. Upon this animal, so revered and worshipped, Cambyses dared to lay what was deemed a sacrilegious hand. In the eyes of his new subjects, he could have committed no greater crime. Says one writer, At Memphis, the Apis bull was bred, nurtured, and honored with all the devotion that Asiatic superstition lavished upon the representative of their miscalled deities. It was said of the god Apis that his glory was sought for in all Egypt, and an inscription reads, He was found after some months in the city of Hosherabot. He was solemnly introduced into the temple of Ptah, beside his father, the Memphian god Ptah of the South Wall, by the high priest in the temple of Ptah, the great prince of the Mashuash Petise, the son of the high priest of Memphis and the great prince of the Mashuash, Takelut, and of the princess of royal race, Thesbastper. The priests would search through the land for the new Apis, which must have certain marks upon it. The rules required that the young bull should be black, with a white triangle on his forehead, the likeness of a vulture on his back, a crescent moon on his side, two kinds of hair in his tail, and an excrescence under his tongue like the sacred beetle. Naturally, it took a long time to find just such an animal, and the time between the death of one and the finding of another was kept as a period of fasting and mourning. It is said that when the old Apis outlived twenty-five years, he was quietly drowned by the priests, and the bodies of the dead bulls were embalmed and buried with royal honors in tombs in the desert. When the new bull was found, it was a period of great rejoicing. The mother and calf were brought to the temple and housed with all honor and regard. The bull was consulted as an oracle by offering it food, and the omen was favorable or the reverse, as it accepted or refused it. This doubtless gave opportunity to the priests and caretakers to direct the matter as they saw fit. A hungry bull would be much more apt to give a favorable response, as one may well perceive, than an already satiated one. Memphis, the city of the White Wall, which was to the Greeks as Cairo is to us now, the typical oriental city, was especially celebrated for its worship of Apis or Hapi, and was selected for its residence because one of the limbs of Osiris, killed by Typhon, the evil spirit, were found there. One pauses to wonder at the curious mingling of power and powerlessness which the ancients attributed to their gods. Proof against all dangers and performing miracles of all sorts, they yet, at times, even the very greatest of them, suffered and died like men. Thus the sacred bull, selected by certain particular marks and guarded and cared for with special reverence, was looked upon as the incarnation of the god. It is in the Serapium, or bull's burying place, a word regarded as a contraction of Osiris Apis, that various tablets and inscriptions were found which give the chief dates and information which we possess as regards the reigns of certain kings. The records of the Apis bulls are more complete than the Nevis bulls, and he is spoken of as a fair and beautiful image of the soul of Osiris. It was upon this adored treasure that Cambyses cruelly and unwisely vented his evil temper. After the conquest of Egypt, he again engaged in other aggressive wars and, returning unsuccessful from one of his expeditions against Nubia, and even more morose and ill-natured than usual, he found the people celebrating one of their religious festivals, and, thinking, or pretending to think, that they were deriding him and rejoicing at his ill-success, he poured out the vials of his wrath. "'O oh, stupid mortals!' he exclaimed. "'Are these your gods?' creatures of flesh and blood and sensible to the touch of steel. And he caused the sacred bull to be brought forth 
and stabbed it in the thigh and put several of the priests to death. One of the most interesting events of modern times was the discovery by Mariette of the long-lost Serapium in 1850. The temple had been described by Strabo, but the lapse of years and the drifting sands of the desert had obliterated it from memory and hidden it from sight. Wandering in the neighborhood of the Steppe Pyramid of Saqqara, the oldest in the world, believed to have been erected only 80 years after the time of Menes, this noted archaeologist stumbled against an object which proved to be the head of a sphinx, and immediately the description of Strabo came into his mind. At once, with characteristic patience and determination, he set his men to work and had the immense satisfaction, after innumerable difficulties, of discovering the avenue of sphinxes which led to the Serapium and the buried temple itself. It extended 640 feet into the solid rock with long galleries, 64 vaulted chambers on either side, and a vaulted roof 20 feet high, while the breadth of the gallery was about the same. In one chamber he discovered the Apis, who died in the 60th year of Ramses II, so fresh and undisturbed did this seem that the finger marks could be seen on the walls and footprints in the sand. A human mummy, which Mariette at first took to be an apis, was also discovered, and proved by the inscription to be that of the favorite son of Ramses II, Ka M Uas, high priest of the Temple of Ptah and governor of Memphis. The body was covered with jewels, gold chains, and amulets, precious and gold washed, all of which are now in the Louvre. Huge granite sarcophagi were discovered in twenty four cells, bearing the name of the king on the throne at the time the apis was buried. The most recent mummies discovered were from the time of Psammeticus II of the 26th dynasty, 660 BC, to a Ptolemy dynasty 500 years later. At certain periods, the votaries of Serapis celebrated festivals in the temple and recorded them on votive tablets, which were found in the galleries of the Serapium. From these we gather that the reign of Psammeticus was brief, that there were six kings of the 26th dynasty, 666 BC, that following Psammeticus I came Necho II, in the sixteenth year of whose reign an Apis was born. That another was installed in the Temple of Ptah in the first year of the reign of Psammetic II. That an Apis died in the twelfth year of Apries, and that this king was succeeded by Amasis and Psammetic III. Unable to carry away all of his finds to place them in greater security in various museums, Mariette buried some of them temporarily near the spot, which Miss Edwards says was betrayed and sold by the Arabs to a certain Austrian archduke, who took possession and carried them to Trieste. Among them was said to be the bull stabbed by Cambyses, while in the rooms of the New York Historical Society the same, or very similar, mummy of Annapis is to be seen. Whether the wound of the bull proved fatal and he was secretly buried by the priests, or whether he survived till the fourth year of Darius's reign, as the Serapium tablets seem to indicate, is a mooted point. Ne Katano, a subsequent and native Egyptian king, is believed to have rebuilt or restored the Serapium in 350 BC. One tablet in the collection records the death of an Apis in the sixth year of Cambyses. But the reign of this cruel king at last came to an end. A revolt took place in Persia, the murdered Smerdis was represented by an impostor who for some time deceived the people, and Cambyses, hastening home, either died or, some say, committed suicide by stabbing himself with his dagger, so runs the legend, while mounting a horse in the same place as he had wounded the bull. It was the custom of the Egyptian women to go two days in the week to the tombs of their dead and to throw upon them a sweet-smelling herb, like basil. But for Cambyses we can imagine no such mourning was made, the world was well rid of a monster, and even his wives must have felt that they were freed from the tyrant. Custom permitted the Persian king to have several legal wives, but one only was the legal queen. Atossa probably occupied this position. Her experiences and husbands were varied, and her charms probably great. Magus, by others called Gomates, personated the dead Smerdis or Bardia, and took Cambyses' wives but kept them in separate establishments that his secret might not be discovered. The story goes that for some previous crime the ears of the impostor had been cut off, but that he covered the place with his hair. In his sleep, however, one of his wives, the daughter of Otanes, suspecting his impersonation, 
passed her hand over his head, and thus his fraud was made public. In the end, he was slain by Darius, a member of the royal family, who now laid claim to the throne and proved to be an excellent sovereign. He again took Queen Atossa to wife, and her influence over him is said to have been unbounded, and she became the mother of Xerxes, who succeeded him. She survived Salamis, and was actually, in part, contemporary with Herodotus, from whom we derive the information regarding her so numerous marriages. Cyrus had one legal wife, Cambyses three, and Darius five. His wives are given as first a daughter of Gabrias, whose children were Artabazanes, and two others, Atossa, by whom he had Xerxes, Histaspes, Achaemenes, and Masistes, Aristone, by whom he had Arsames and Gobrias, Parmis, by whom he had Ariomardas, and lastly, Frataguma, by whom he had Abrocome and Hipperanthe. Darius seems to have been the one Persian king beloved by the Egyptians, towards whom he showed himself in great contrast to his predecessor, most considerate and regardful, associating with the priests and studying their theology. During his lifetime, he was called a god by the Egyptians, and he is the only Persian king whose name is accompanied with a titular shield, and whose phonetic shield bears the crest of the Volpauser and the disc, Son of the Sun. The only one whose phonetic name is accompanied by a prenomen, like those of the ancient kings. He obtained while living the title of Divus, and received, after death, the same honors as the native Egyptian sovereigns of the earlier centuries. On an ornament of porcelain in the museum at Florence, he is called Beneficent God. He is even represented in sculpture as worshipping the Egyptian god Athor and the mummy of Osiris, with the lighted lamp, the emblem of fire, the great divinity of Persia, in each hand. But in spite of this, another authority states that no Persian king's name is found on a public monument in Egypt. When the Persians were present in Egypt, comparative peace reigned, but when they left the government in the hands of deputies, revolts were numerous. Darius put his satrap Ariandes to death for presuming to coin money, he being so distasteful to the Egyptians that they were on the point of revolt when Darius returned. But spite of the personal popularity of Darius, the Persian yoke was hateful to the Egyptians, and when the king's back was once turned, his presence withdrawn, and he became involved in other wars, they again rose against the invaders. While preparing to crush Egypt, Darius died, leaving the task to Xerxes, his son by the beloved Atossa. His first wife had been a daughter of Gabrias, and her son, older than Xerxes, would naturally have succeeded, but Artobazanes had been born before his father became king, and this fact, coupled doubtless with the paramount influence of Queen Atossa, decided the question in favor of Xerxes, who had been born after his father ascended the throne. For the few succeeding dynasties, the balance of power swung between the native rulers and their Persian conquerors. Xerxes, or Shayarsha, whose wife was named Amestris, reconquered Egypt in the second year of his reign and increased its burdens. He also seems to have made love to the wife of his brother Masistes, and to her daughter, the wife of his son Darius, and because Xerxes gave this daughter-in-law Artainte, for whom he had an unlawful affection, a beautiful mantle, woven by his wife Amestris, the queen had the mother of her rival most cruelly mutilated. Xerxes was himself subsequently murdered, apparently a not undeserved fate. Under Artaxerxes, his son, who succeeded, B.C. 465, the Egyptians again threw off the hated yoke, but after various vicissitudes were reconquered. The, this prince was said to be largely under the influence of his mother Amestris and his sister Amitir, both women of ill-regulated lives. His only legal wife was Damaspia, but he had many children by his concubines. Several native rulers who reigned briefly and were murdered in succession came next. Then we have Darius II, previously called Ocus and subsequently Notus, said to be one of the seventeen illegitimate sons of Artaxerxes I, who married Paraisatis, daughter of Xerxes I. Darius II reigned nineteen years and was followed by Artaxerxes II, said to be the last Persian king who left any memorial of himself in Egypt. He styled himself Beloved of Amun-Ra and Beautiful God, Lord of the Two Lands. 
During this period, the Egyptians associated themselves with the Athenians and Amirtaius, a descendant of the Sayite kings, ruled for a period of six years. He is sometimes considered identical with a certain Amenrut, and a portion of the coffin of his daughter, Arbast Uchat Nifu, is in the Berlin Museum, but that the two are the same king is questioned by others. Amirtaius was deemed of sufficient importance, however, to be counted as the 28th dynasty, but we find no mention of his queen. Neferites is given as the only king of the 29th dynasty from Mendes and reigned some years, but again we learn nothing of the queen. Akhoris or Haker was first king of the 30th dynasty. He repaired several temples and his name is found in several places. Several unimportant kings followed. One authority says that the revolt of the Medes permitted the authority of the Egyptian king Hakis, Akhorus or Akhorus, of whom we have made mention and of whom some memorials are found here and there, and a sphinx in Paris bears his name. The kings who succeeded are regarded as of little moment. Nectanibus I is frequently considered the next king, and he succeeded in keeping the authority in his hands, some say ten, some eighteen years. He appears to have been capable both as a soldier and a ruler, and somewhat revived the pomp which had been so characteristic of the earlier kings. He built some temples and shrines and repaired many of the important ones, and his name appears in various places. An obelisk cut by this king, whose name occurs at Philae, but which was not inscribed, was afterwards floated down the Nile by Ptolemy Philadelphus, and erected in honor of his sister in the Arsinoite home. The fine stone lions, once at the Fontana di Termine at Rome, but now placed in the Egyptian Museum at the Vatican, are said to be the last piece of Egyptian sculpture executed on their native princes. He seems to have been one of the few kings who defeated the Persians. Nectanibus II, who is both a builder and a warrior, was the only other king of importance of this dynasty. Ocus, Artaxerxes III, of the 31st dynasty, out-herited Herod, and led to the final collapse of the Persian power in Egypt. He emulated and even surpassed Cambyses, causing the sacred bull not only to be killed, but cooked and eaten at a feast. Darius Codomanus was the last Persian king, and when Alexander came as conqueror of these hated rulers, the Egyptians made him welcome. He at once began a conciliatory policy, sacrificed to Apis, built a temple to Isis, and caused himself to be adopted by and proclaimed son of Zeus Ammon. He remained some time, founded the city of Alexandria, placed rulers over Egypt, and departed from Memphis, B.C. 331. Living, he never again saw the land, but his corpse was brought back from Babylon and deposited in a sarcophagus in Alexandria. The favorite stone of the Persian gem engravers was chalcedony, a semi-transparent white quartz, the blue variety of which is the sapphire, and on this one sometimes finds engraved the head of a Persian king. End of chapter 21「Chapter 22 of Predecessors of Cleopatra. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Will Sheward. Predecessors of Cleopatra by Lee North. Chapter 22. Roxanne. The Persian yoke had become so intolerable to the Egyptians that they were prepared to accept any other conqueror with positive enthusiasm, and the Macedonian Alexander and his followers were welcomed rather as friends than as enemies and hated masters. The colossal empire created by the splendid military audacity, combined with the judicious tolerance of Alexander the Great, may be said to have dropped to pieces by its own weight, and a comparatively few years after his short career was ended, for he died at thirty-two, it had been partitioned among his generals. Roxanne, or Roxana, first or chief wife of Alexander, for he married others later, could only in a theoretic sense be called Queen of Egypt, as of other countries of which her husband was master. The mad rush of battle and conquest left little time for the ostentatious display of royalty. Alexander was rather a great general than a reigning king intent upon the government and internal improvement of the various countries under his sway. 
he seemed to have hardly time to place one crown upon his head before he was fighting for another, and the outward trappings of his office must have been military rather than royal. There could have been little opportunity for his wife to realise the grandeur of her position. Hence it was, in all probability, not till after his death that Roxanne the Queen entered Egypt, and then it was rather as a captive than as a reigning princess. By a previous connection, not a legal marriage with Barsine, widow of Darius's best Greek general Memnon, Alexander had a son named Heracles, who afterwards laid some claim to the kingdom, but it was Roxanne, a Bactrian princess famed for her beauty, that he first made his lawful wife. She was the daughter of Oxartes, who commanded the Sagdian rock for Darius, and on the reduction of this fortress married the conqueror. We can picture ourselves a beautiful mountain region, the mad onrush of troops, the clang of arms, the brief delirium of a battle, and then a cessation of hostilities, and the natural man seeking once more excitement in amusement. It is said that it was at a feast or a drinking bout where dancing was also going on, that Alexander first saw and at once fell in love with the handsome Roxanne, spoken of by one writer as of surpassing beauty and a grace rarely seen among barbarians. Alexander himself was a handsome man in the perfection of manhood. Born 356 BC, he was 29 years of age at the time of his marriage, which is said to have united two strains of Indo-European blood. The bride was probably much younger, of him, many likenesses, usually busts or profiles on coins, exist. There is a bust of him in the British Museum, a terracotta in Munich, and he appears as the sun god in the Capitoline Museum in Rome, as the vernal sun in a marble relief in the Louvre in Paris, beside other places and his head on the coins. He was fair and ruddy, with finely cut features, an alert, agreeable expression, a look of power and intellect, and a full eye which could blaze with anger, or melt into tenderness. As opposites attract, and judging by the race from which she sprang, Bactria was approximately the present Bukhara, and has no small claim to be called the cradle of our present civilization, we may believe Roxanne to have been dark as Alexander was fair. A soft yet brilliant black or brown eye, raven tresses, ideal in feature and in form, and endowed with every grace. Alexander had proved himself invulnerable to many of the sex. The wife and daughter of Darius, women famed for their good looks, were treated by him with a respect and indifference to their charms unusual in such times and in such cases. He worshipped the god of war rather than the god of love, but the fair Roxanne proved irresistible. He left her for a brief time and then returned and married her. To be the bride of the conqueror, especially when he was young and handsome, what more could any maiden desire? None but the brave deserve the fair. Physical courage was the most admired of all the virtues, holding its place even in these later days. And of that Alexander had a large share, as well as of other lovable qualities, impulsive, generous, and large-minded as he often showed himself. He wore a great plume of white feathers on either side of his helmet, which made him ever a conspicuous object on the field of battle, yet he bore a charmed life and escaped injury. Cruel at times, he was still warm-hearted. Between his mother and himself existed a strong affection, and in a quarrel between her and his father Philip, he took her side and fled with her. She was the imperious, passionate and fanatical Olympias, daughter of Neoptolemus, king of Epirus to which country she returned with the son who inherited some of her traits, and to whom she was passionately attached. Plutarch gives many pleasant anecdotes of Alexander, and refers to the numerous letters he wrote to his mother and other relatives and friends. He deprecated his mother's interference with matters of war and state, but bore her reproaches with patience, and when Antipater wrote to him complaining of her, he nobly replied, One tear of a mother effaces a thousand such letters as these. With Alexander, the name Cleopatra is introduced into Egypt, where it was borne by a bewildering number of the subsequent royal family. His father put away his mother and married a second wife of that name, and to his sister Cleopatra, who married her uncle Alexander, her mother's brother, King of Epirus, he was, as well as to Olympias, warmly attached. 
The marriage of the conqueror with the native princess placated the Bactrians and peace was restored. But the restless spirit of Alexander knew no pause. He could not stay to dally in the arms of his love, no matter how beautiful. Ambition was even a more powerful mistress, and he rushed onward to new conquests. He had adopted a conciliatory policy towards the Jews. He showed the same in Egypt. He sacrificed to the gods of the land, to Apis in particular, in marked and acceptable contrast to the conduct of Cambyses and Ochus, showed great favour to the priests, and placed native Egyptians in posts of honour and command. He made a journey into the desert, a most difficult, hazardous and dangerous expedition, to visit the oracle of Amon, and caused himself to be proclaimed son of the god, with a curious mingling of faith in the oracle and deliberate adoption of a policy which conduced it to his own interest, as well as to those of the people whom he had conquered. He founded the city of Alexandria, which alone might have made famous any single or ordinary man, in addition to all else that he accomplished in his comparatively short life. The old Nocrates yielded its trade to the new city, and the port of Canopus was closed, while Alexandria grew in splendour, importance, and intellectual prestige, and became one of the renowned cities of the world. Separation and the life of constant excitement, which he led, may have lessened the hold of Roxanne upon Alexander's affection, and a sudden passion for other women have overtaken him, but it is more probable that motives of policy dictated his subsequent course. At Susa occurred what was called the Great Marriage of Europe and Asia, planned by Alexander to celebrate his victories and perhaps to hasten the return of peace and goodwill. He took to wife Statira, daughter of Darius, and some authorities say also Parasatis, daughter of Ochus, brother of Darius, and one of the last Persian kings of Egypt. He coerced or persuaded his officers to follow his example, and not one but many marriages were then performed. So intent was Alexander on his purpose, that he put a premium on such connections, and promised to pay the debts of those who would take Persian wives. At this time Ptolemy, later king of Egypt, was united to a certain princess Atacama, daughter of Artabanes, of whom we find no further mention, suggesting that these enforced unions were not lasting, and were perhaps regarded by their principals as a mere spectacular performance, or even a comedy. These nuptials were celebrated with great magnificence. The banqueting hall was laid with tables for numberless guests, and was gorgeously decorated. Pillars of gold and silver set with jewels upheld the awning above, and nothing that eastern luxury could suggest was spared to embellish the feast. According to the Persian custom, a row of armchairs was placed for the bridegrooms, and one beside each for the brides, who came in procession, fair to look upon, in beautiful and shining garments, enhanced by all the appliances of the toilet, and took each her place beside her lord. It was a marriage of fatal import to all concerned. We can imagine the jealous passion aroused in the breast of Roxanne at the sight or report of all this, doubtless in striking contrast with her own simple nuptials, jeopardising as it did the right of succession which might be claimed by her own children yet unborn. Perchance the new queen added fuel to the flame by a haughty demeanour, a half-concealed or openly expressed contempt for the barbarian chief's daughter who had preceded her. Be this as it may, Roxanne rested not till, with the aid of Perdiccas, one of Alexander's generals, she had her put to death. The story goes that after Alexander was dead, she sent a forged letter to Statira, either as coming from him, or with purport that he was still alive, and got Queen Statira into her power, and caused both her and her sister, perhaps the before-mentioned Parasatis, to be murdered, and their bodies thrown into a well and covered with earth. Having thus disposed of a hated rival, she rested in fancied security, but her own destruction eventually avenged this cruel deed. The life of Alexander lived too fast, and with little regard, perhaps either to the laws of health or mortality, came to a speedy close. He died 323 BC. Either ignorant of, or indifferent to, the approaching birth of a child of his own, he is said to have left his kingdom to the worthiest, or some say, the strongest, the first a person far to seek in the midst of such a grasping, bloodthirsty throng. Some months after Alexander's death, Roxanne bore a son, who was named Alexander Egus, and the infant, in conjunction with Alexander's natural brother, 
Philip Aridaeus, apparently a man of weak intellect, were nominally kings under the regency of Perdiccas, one of Alexander's most prominent generals. No such giant succeeded the heroic figure, almost that of a demigod whose life had just closed, and the conglomerate kingdom which he had created fell into numerous fragments or divisions. Roxanne evidently could play the part of a Margaret or Anjou, and her subsequent history is but a pitiful tale. She and her son fell into the power of the generals, who, like vultures, settled upon their prey. No noble emotion of protecting the helpless stirred in their breasts. It was a period of the world's history in which weakness courted its own destruction. Might was right. A theory not altogether unknown in modern times was the general rule of existence, and some years after Alexander's death, Roxanne and the young Alexander were put out of the way to make room for the grasp of stronger hands than those of a woman and child. At first, the spoilers called themselves satraps, but eventually claimed or accepted the title of king. Ptolemy took Egypt, Seleucus Babylon and Syria, Antigonus Asia Minor, and Antipater Macedon, later conquered by the descendants of Antigonus. Lysimachus took Thrace, Leonatus, Phrygia, and Eumenes, Cappadocia. Alexander Egus, like Caesarion, son of Cleopatra VI of Egypt, was never allowed to succeed his father, but his life was cut short in youth. Mother and child were simply used as pawns on the great chessboard of kings, and when their existence interfered with the designs of those in power, they were disposed of. The then known world was in tumult. War was the order of the times peace almost unknown. The uprising and overthrow of one power and of one individual after another was continuous. The pages of history were stained with blood, alike of the guilty and the innocent. The years succeeding the death of Alexander must have been ones of anxiety, if not of absolute terror, to Roxanne, and the possibility of a violent death for herself and her child could not but have suggested itself to her. Nominally wife and mother of a king, she enjoyed little of the pleasures of state, but was hurried here and there, and from camp to camp, with scant ceremony. A possession too valuable to those who held her to let her go, and in the end too valuable to keep. The disposal of Alexander's body was a matter of dispute. A council of officers decreed that it should be buried in the oasis of Ammon, where Alexander had been adopted by the god. Perdiccas wished that it should be laid with the ancient Macedonian kings, while Ptolemy was determined that it should rest in Alexandria, the new city. Ptolemy triumphed, and the sarcophagus of gold remained there for some time. We do not know how long. Diodorus says, A coffin of beaten gold was provided, so wrought by the hammer as to answer the proportion of the body. It was half filled with aromatic spices, which served as well to delight the senses as to preserve the body from putrefaction. Over the coffin was a cover of gold, so exactly fitted as to answer the higher part every way. Over this was thrown a curious purple coat, near to which were placed the arms of the deceased, that the whole might represent the acts of his life. This was placed on a magnificent chariot adorned with figures, symbolic designs, arches, floral designs in gold and funerary urns, an absorbing spectacle to the people. It seems almost strange that so much honour was paid to the body of Alexander, so little to his very flesh and blood. This settlement of the place of burial brought on a conflict with the regent who came to Egypt, bringing King Philip and his wife Eurycide, and Alexander IV and his mother Roxanne, perhaps her first visit to a land where she had been nominally queen. Perdiccas acted in his treatment of soldiers and enemies with great cruelty, Ptolemy with marked clemency, and the cavalry of the former rose up and murdered him. Ptolemy was then offered the regency and the charge of the royal princes. But he was a cautious and far-seeing man, and, content with what he had already secured, the mastership of Egypt, firmly declined so dangerous a responsibility. The regency was then conferred upon or seized by Antipater, and new distributions and divisions of ownership ensued. A mother and sister of Alexander, Olympias and Cleopatra, had raised a faction against Antipater and divided the government between them. A firm believer in women's rights were these ancient and warlike dames, rights in which there should be no distraction of sex, yet as ever the weaker went to the wall. Cleopatra, it is said, lived a royal widow at Sardis, wooed by all the world, 
a woman doubtless of beauty, as she showed herself of vigour and capacity. She would have married Perdiccas or Leonatus, who had died, but spurned the rest. Like England's Queen Elizabeth, she had many suitors. At last, to escape Antigonus, she agreed to marry Ptolemy, and thereby secured her own destruction, for Antigonus could not contemplate a union which might prove so injurious to himself, and had her secretly murdered. Someone seems always to have stood ready for the commission of such deadly crimes. But to throw dust in the eyes of the people, Antigonus gave her a magnificent funeral, and proceeded against the woman who had been instrumental in her murder. Time passed on, and Antipater was succeeded by his son Cassander, more ruthless, cruel, and self-seeking, if possible, than his predecessor, and he determined to rid himself of a charge become useless to him, and assume full regal power. Olympias had meanwhile secured the death of Philip Aridius and his wife, and carried off the young king and his mother to Pitna. Cassander besieged and took them, and Olympias was cited to appear before a public assembly of the Macedonians, and answer for the murder she had committed. Trusting in her own power and influence, she haughtily complied, but was condemned to death, and secretly executed by the relatives of those she had injured. The young king and his mother were shut up in the castle of Amphipolis, where they were treated rather as captives than as royal personages, and finally put to death. It seems almost strange that Roxanne, still young and probably beautiful, was not forcibly married by one of the contestants, and the question settled in this way, rather than by such tragic means. But it was not to be, and the son of Alexander must needs die, or others could not grasp the power which should have descended to him. Ptolemy, if not directly accessory, at least connived at this murder, and thus secured himself in his new kingdom. It is said that the restoration of the outward shrine of the great temple at Luxor, built by Tothmes III and ruined by the Persians, took place during the nominal sovereignty of Philip Aridius and Alexander IV, and therefore quite early in Ptolemy's satrapy. This restoration of the inner cellar was in the name of the boy king Alexander. A statue of the young king is in Giza Museum. It is of granite and about nine feet in height. The gentle and melancholy expression seems well suited to the youth's tragic fate but he is represented as much older than when he died, and it is probably a conventional likeness, with a mingling of the Egyptian and Greek in type and attributes. A certain inscription in Egypt mentions Ptolemy in the seventh year of the absent Alexander. His destroyer kept up the fiction of his authority, thus Ptolemy granted lands in the name of Alexander and Philip after their decease. We can almost imagine the unfortunate Queen Roxanne ready to lay down her harassed and weary life. But such is the natural clinging to the known and visible that doubtless she had occasional periods of pleasure, and even of reviving hope for her child and herself. She had committed or been accessory to the blackest crime to secure his succession. Surely it could not be in vain. Alexander the Great was born in 355 BC and died in 323. His son Alexander IV was born in 323 BC and died 310, but his name appears as king until 305. Thus all the family of Alexander the Great perished by violent deaths. First his mother, then his wife and child, and lastly in 309 BC his sister and his natural son Heracles or Hercules. End of chapter 22《ハプトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥトゥ We seem to come so much nearer to the modern era that we might look for certain knowledge. The more, as we now have the histories of earlier writers such as Polybius, Diodorus Siculus, Strabo, etc., to consult, as well as the coinage with dates and portraits of kings and queens to assist us. But the historical account is frequently at second hand, and not as to matters which the writer has himself seen and known, and even some of the coins are found to be ambiguous and referable to different reigns. The relationships, too, are so mixed, and the same names so often repeated, that at many points we are baffled in our search, and various parts of this complex history remain in darkness, which further investigation may enlighten, 
but which at present give room for the conflicting theories and opinions of different writers. The chronology of Egypt, as before said, has always been a subject of difficulty to students, and their researches lead many to different conclusions. Even in the time of the Ptolemies, which seems modern compared to the periods we have been considering, the same problem confronts us, and the fact that the Olympian and Julian year do not coincide makes exact chronology impossible. Constant discoveries are adding new light, and often in this and other respects proving earlier conclusions incorrect. Thus, even in the Ptolemy period, we do but approximate some of the dates, etc. The testimony of the coins is of extreme value, and we feel that, like hard facts, they never lie. Yet it is difficult to draw the line between the conventional and the real likeness, and between a flattering and an unflattering presentment. The portraits of the queens, celebrated in their own times and in succeeding ages as miracles of beauty and charm, sometimes strike us with amazement so utterly devoid do they seem of either. We have to recall the possible potency of colouring and animation, the fascination of manner and of voice to rehabilitate them, reflecting how sometimes even in the modern photograph, for which it is said the sun cannot lie, the plain woman sometimes appears beautiful and the beauty almost plain. As a rule, the women of the Ptolemy family seem to have been handsome, ambitious, capable, daring and cruel, and, save in the cases of the first three kings, were in many instances superior to their husbands. They shared with husbands and brothers the desire to keep the reins of power in their own hands, and the willingness to do away with those who stood in their path. Murder and assassination were but the means to an end, and daunted but few of them. Yet here and there we come across an incident or an anecdote which throws a softer light upon their history, a touch of amiability or kindness, which reveals the eternal feminine still latent in their hearts. The long line of Arsinoes, Berenikes, and Cleopatras is like a tangled skein of many colours, and most difficult to disentangle and render distinct. Mother, daughter, and sister perhaps bear the same appellation, and one is reminded of the English fashion of using the same or very similar names for a whole region, as Highbury, Highbury Hill, Highbury Crescent, etc., till the stranger is fairly bewildered. In the division of the vast landed possessions of Alexander the Great, Ptolemy, son of Lagos and Arsinoe, chose Egypt for his share and founded a new line of kings. He was one of Alexander's generals and allied to him by blood, some say the natural son of his father Philip. It is probably the eagle on the Ptolemy coins that suggested the fable or tradition that the first Ptolemy was cared for by an eagle, as Romulus and Remus by a wolf. Mahaffey, one of the later and more reliable authorities on the Egypt of this period, says that Ptolemy was, it is probable, born in 367 BC, and hence was some years older than Alexander, but still young enough to be associated with him, and accompanied him into exile, returning to court on his ascension. Whether he went with Alexander to Egypt is not positively known, but it seems likely that some personal acquaintance with and admiration for that country dictated his choice. It may be said to have been a love match between Ptolemy and the land of his adoption, which could hardly have been the case had he never seen it. Virtually he threw himself into the arms of his new mistress, who received him with no less enthusiasm, stiff-necked rebel as she had been against Persian rule. He and his successors, especially the earlier ones, embraced the Egyptian theology, built temples to the gods, accepted the manners and customs of the people, and affiliated themselves with them in every way. They married their nearest relatives in Egyptian fashion, and even surpassed their predecessors in the dubious nature of these unions. Alternatively, they seem to have adored the women whom they selected as partners, to whom they paid special honours, having their portraits stamped upon the coins, up to this time gold rings had been used as a medium of exchange, and naming various cities after them, or to have quarrelled with and even murdered them. To the massive dignity of design in the Egyptian architecture, the Ptolemies added something of the Greek ideal, and the temples erected in their time are among the most beautiful in the land. The seat of power and government changed from time to time. First Memphis, the City of Good, the White Walled, founded by Menes with its great temple of Ptah, which dominated it like a fortress. Next, hundred-gated Thebes, the city of Ammon. Then Sais, situated on a hill, with a royal citadel and storied and painted houses. 
Tanis, recreated from an earlier settlement and stamped with his signet, his giant statue, eighty or a hundred feet in height by Ramesses the Great. All these in turn were sovereign in the land and the dwelling places of the queens. Now under Ptolemies, Alexandria, one of the masterpieces of the great Macedonian, rose into prominence, vying with Athens as a seat of learning and the scene of unrivalled splendour, magnificence and debauchery. Dinocrates, the gifted architect of Alexander, created a city of noble proportions and inaugurated a new style of architecture, happily combining the values of the Oriental and the Greek. The so-called Pompey's Pillar is the only one remaining of the forest of columns which form part of the Greek temple of Serapsis. The platform on the top reached by a hundred steps, and the walls encrusted with metals and jewels. It stood high above the city, which was regularly laid out, with streets cutting each other at right angles, and bordered with colonnades. Among the other noted buildings, of which nothing now remains, were the Mausoleum of Alexander, the harbour works united in the city, and the island of Pharos, the Temple of Pan, and that built by Ptolemy II on the outside of one of the city gates to celebrate the Eleusinian Mysteries, the aqueduct and others, of which no trace remains, but of whose existence we learn from early writers. The present Rue de Rosette is said to follow the course of the ancient main street, which crossed the city from the east to the west gates. The paintings still seen on the walls of Pompeii give us an idea of the decorations of Alexandrian architecture. The Great Museum was a combination of university, club and social gathering place. The early Ptolemies especially were patrons of learning, and people of all nations met at their brilliant court, and thus it is said arose in Egypt the Neo-Greek culture which we are accustomed to call Hellenism. Literature, science and sculpture flourished, and painting took on new forms and woke to new life. The beautiful head of Alexander in the British Museum and many other fine examples of sculpture have come down to us from this period. The goldsmith's work was also a fashionable art, and as Louis XVI of France amused himself by being a locksmith, and how differently might life have ended for him had nature made him of that class, Ptolemy II amused himself by being a goldsmith. For several years, Ptolemy Soto I of the House of Diadachi reigned as nominal satrap or governor. He then assumed the title of king, which he bore for 23 years, dying at the advanced age of 84. His administration was beneficial to the country, and he attached the people to him by kindness and clemency, in marked contrast to his Persian predecessors. He had not hesitated to secure his throne by permitting the murder of the young king, but showed himself, in general, less cruel and bloodthirsty than many of his contemporaries. He established wise regulations encouraged literature and art, and brought captive Jews to people Alexandria. His title of Sotor, or Saviour, was derived from the assistance he lent the people of Rhodes against their enemies. Though brought up to a military life, and often engaged in war, he evidently did not love it for its own sake, and was not the dashing soldier. But where diplomacy and cautious measures would serve his purpose, preferred to employ them. The only portrait of Ptolemy Sotor is on the coins, coinage being introduced into Egypt under the Ptolemies. Here he appears, like other members of the family, with a full, rounded face, a forehead not high, but fleshy over the eyes, arched brows, a nose rather too short and with wide nostrils, a firm mouth, and a prominent chin. Not so handsome as Alexander, the Ptolemies, especially the earlier ones, must yet have had considerable claim to good looks. The cartouches of Ptolemy I are uncertain, and not familiarly known, while those of Ptolemy the Fourteenth and Fifteenth have not up to very recent date been found. What is called the throne names of the Ptolemies were as follows. Ptolemy Sota, Arsinoe the Third, and Philip Aridius had the same pre nomen, chosen of Ra, beloved of Ra. Arsinoe the Fourth, joy of the heart of Ammon, chosen of Ra, living image of Ammon. Ptolemy III and his wife were spoken of as fraternal gods, chosen of Ra, living image of Ammon. Ptolemy IV was spoken of as heir of the beneficent gods, chosen of Ptah, strength of the Ka of Ra, living image of Ammon. Ptolemy VII as heir of the two manifest gods, form of Ptah, chosen of Ammon, 
questioning the rule of Ra. Ptolemy IX, heir of the two manifest gods, chosen of Ptah, doing the rule of Amun, living image of Ra. Ptolemy X, heir of the beneficent god and of the beneficent goddess, chosen of Ptah, doing the rule of Ra, living image of Amun. Ptolemy XI, one cartouche, heir of the two beneficent gods, chosen of Ptah, doing the rule of Amun, living image of Ra. The second cartouche reads, Ptolemy called Alexander, living forever, beloved of Ptah. Ptolemy the thirteenth, heir of the god that saves, chosen of Ptah, doing the rule of Amun, living image of Ra. Various amours are credited to Ptolemy the first, which at this late date would be difficult to either prove or disprove. Among many with a bad record, he was not notably vicious. Three wives might legally have claimed the title, but his love was evidently given to the last and probably the youngest. Doubtless at Alexander's behest, he first took a Persian wife, the princess Artakama, daughter of Artabasis. Only two of these Persian wives are known to appear in later history, a mistress, daughter of Oxartes, and probably a sister or half-sister of Roxanne, married to Craterus, and subsequently to Lysimachus, and Epame, who married Seleucus and became the ancestress of the Seleucid dynasty. Ptolemy first married the princess Artakama 330 BC, which would make him, if born in 367 BC, 37 years of age at his first marriage. He again wedded Eurycide, daughter of Antipater, nine years later, and Berenike, evidently his favourite wife, when he was 50. All the ladies were doubtless much his juniors. The princess Artakama could not properly be called queen, since she passes out of Ptolemy's life and history before he assumed the title of king. The marriage with Eurycide, the daughter of Antipater, who had subsequently made himself king of Macedon, may have been merely a matter of policy and not dictated by any motives of affection. Ptolemy's subsequent action and marked preference for Berenike seems to suggest this, but that he lived with her as his legal wife and acknowledged the children of both is a matter of history. Eurycide came with a retinue to Egypt in the style of a great princess. It seems to have been after the death of her father and during the reign of her brother Cassander, with whom Ptolemy had formed an alliance and wished to keep on peaceful terms. Perhaps this very marriage was a pledge of their friendship. We judge Eurycide to have been of less fiery temper and disposition than Roxanne, since she seems to have accepted a successor and rival with comparative equanimity, and apparently made no effort to get rid of or destroy her. In her train came a grand niece of Antipater, doubtless young and beautiful, a widow with all the fascinations pertaining to that class, which probably she did not hesitate to use upon the middle-aged king. The situation bears some resemblance to that of Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn, though less fatal in its immediate results. One writer has made Berenike daughter of Lagos, and therefore stepsister of Ptolemy. But Mahaffey says, It is likely he was misled by the formula wife and sister, applied to Egyptian queens as a mere title of honour, and which was probably used in many documents regarding the present princess. And since Soto was one of the few Ptolemies who did not marry his immediate relatives, it is well he should have credit, therefore. Both ladies appear to have been amiably disposed, and Berenike was evidently a strong character as well, who maintained a lifelong influence over her husband, and secured for herself and her children the first place. She was more strictly speaking the queen, since it was after this last marriage that Ptolemy assumed the title. And it was Berenike's son who succeeded to the throne, as did the son of Atosa. Eurydice had children, a son Ptolemy Coronus and others, and several daughters, whose claims were all set aside for those of the more favoured Berenike. So in 317 BC, Ptolemy married his chosen princess and gave her and her children the first place. By her previous marriage, Berenike already had three children, a son, Magus, and two daughters, Theosina and Antigone. These three Ptolemy seems to have accepted almost as his own, using the princesses as the cards or dice of the great games he was playing, as auxiliaries in cementing his political alliances. In arranging all these marriages, we may infer that Berenike's opinions and wishes had weight, and who knows, but she may have used her influence to induce Ptolemy himself to assure the title of King of Egypt. 
she would be neither the first nor the last wife who has endeavoured to fire her husband with ambition. To anticipate somewhat, her son Magus became king of Cyrene, and Theozena was married to Agathocles of Syracuse, who was an upstart and adventurer, but clever and able, and making so much of himself in his opportunities that he had to be reckoned with by the contesting powers. Antigone was married to Pyrrhus, Lysandra to Sassander's son Alexander, Lysandra, probably a second of the name, to Agathocles, son of Lysimachus of Thrace, Arsinoe to Lycomachus himself, Irene to Eunostos, king of Soli and Cyprus, and ultimately in 287 BC, even Ptolemais to Demetrius. Thus Ptolemy Sultor utilised his large family, consisting, it is said, of twelve children, to serve his political purposes. Ptolemy Coronus, the eldest son and rightful heir of his father, beheld, with bitterness, himself set aside in favour of his younger brother, and continued during his stormy life to be a thorn in the side of the Ptolemy's succession. Our line of research is to follow the domestic histories rather than the public acts of the king, already made familiar by the pens of many able writers. The first child of Soto by his marriage with Berenike was a daughter, later the well-known Arsinoe II, Queen of Egypt. The son Ptolemy Philadelphus, who succeeded his father, was born in 308 BC on the island of Cos, a favourite retreat from Alexandria, during one of the campaigns of Ptolemy in the Aegean, whither Berenike had accompanied her husband, either from the affection between them which forbade separation, or the desire on the Queen's part to keep near the king that she might continue to use her great influence, seeking to bend the course of events as they arose to her own purposes. She might well have earned the title both of Berenike the Ambitious and Berenike the Successful, but scarcely those of Berenike the Just or the Generous. The virtues of self-sacrifice and generosity were sometimes shown under the ancient moral code, but consideration and justice were fruits of the Christian dispensation. Ptolemy Soter did not marry young, but lived to see his children grow up and to associate with him on the throne his son Ptolemy, called Philadelphus, son of Berenike, and for the last years of his life seemed to have resigned the regal power into his hands. So large a family, composed of such diverse elements, would, even in modern times, have been apt to have difficulties as regards matters of inheritance. And it is little to be wondered at, perhaps, that such was supremely the case in this instance. But, during his lifetime, the arrangements of Ptolemy Soto seem to have been accepted in a great degree, and it was not till after his death that a fierce conflict broke out among the rival claimants. Ptolemy Soter is said to have eaten with the poor and borrowed plate from the rich. The use of gold, silver and copper coins had been common in Phoenicia and other countries before it was introduced into Egypt by the first Ptolemy. But Poole says, The monograms and symbols indicating mints are more constant and regular in the coinage of the Ptolemies than in any other series of Greek regal money. The pictures of the kings and queens on the coins, albeit frequently conventionalised, assist us much in our search for knowledge concerning them. The regular silver coinage presents the heads of kings and queens on one side, often those of gods, eagles, etc. on the other. The place of the mint name was usually on the reverse side, and, if dated, on opposite sides of the field. A rare place for the mint name was between the legs of the eagle. The gold coinage was often not struck in the time of those whose heads it bears. Thus Philadelphus honoured both his parents after their decease. Queen Berenike I appears on the coins both alone and with her husband. The face is dignified and beautiful, a straight Greek nose and regular features. Of her death we find no record, but she appears to have been loved and honoured by both husband and son, and whichever survived her, no doubt she was buried with all possible respect. Though many wars occurred during the reign of Ptolemy Soto, yet it was so long that he had also much time to spare for the internal administration and improvement of his kingdom. And some writers believe that many of the things of benefit thereto, attributed to Ptolemy Philadelphus, should really be credited, at least in their inception, to Ptolemy Soto. He built and added to some of the finest temples, extended and adorned Alexandria, and is said to have written a history of Alexander's campaigns, which, unfortunately, has been lost, and showed his appreciation of mental attainments by surrounding himself with men of learning and culture. 
Queen Eurycides seems to have endured with what grace she might the secondary place accorded to her and her children, till the younger Ptolemy was made king when they all left Egypt, no doubt in bitterness of soul, and resolved, if possible, to wrest from him whom they regarded as a usurper of his elder brother's rights, his regal powers. The Ptolemies called the Lagodai were a popular race. Ptolemy Soto seems to have possessed much suavity and personal charm of manner, and the Egyptians and other conquered peoples were treated by him and the earlier Ptolemies with much more consideration and humanity than by other more ruthless conquerors. Ptolemy Soter is said to have had at least twelve children by different wives, as well as by the courtesan Thais. Statues of him are mentioned by various writers but have not been found, and his portrait on the coins is the only one that remains to us. The three earliest members of the family seem to have a stronger claim to good looks than their successors, who, both in regularity of outline and general expression, are distinctly below the ancestral level. Eurycides, though probably the elder, may have survived their rival, but their part was now played on the stage of history, and they passed from the scene, leaving it to a multitude of other actresses, some of whom excelled them in beauty and celebrity, while others remained to us but as a shadow and a name. End of chapter 23Chapter 24 of Predecessors of Cleopatra. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Predecessors of Cleopatra by Lee North. Arsinoe II. The most prominent figure in the long and involved list of Ptolemy queens, next to that of the famed Cleopatra, is Arsinoe II, daughter of Sotor and Berenica, and sister and wife of Ptolemy Philadelphus. She is spoken of on the Mendi Stele, now at Giza, as the charming princess, the most attractive, lovely, and beautiful the crowned one, who has received the double diadem, whose splendor fills the palace, the friend of the sacred ram, and his priestess, Uda Utaba, the king's sister and wife who loves him, the queen Arsinoe. And of no other queen do we find so many monuments in various parts of the Greek world. To the day of Arsinoe's death, she seems to have had the strongest hold upon her husband's affections, and no token of honor and respect was too great to lavish upon her while living, or to eulogize her merits after her decease. The early part of her life was a tragic story, but she survived the cruel sorrows which might have killed a woman of less toughness of fiber than that which distinguished all the female members of the Ptolemy race, and lived through a prosperous and successful middle life, turning her back on the bitterness of the past and making the most of the honors and dignity which came to her in the course of years. In placing his younger son on the throne instead of the elder, who would usually have been considered the rightful heir, Ptolemy Sotor may have been influenced by the personal character of the two, as well as by other motives. The elder bore the name of Ptolemy Koranos, a soubriquet or nickname meaning gloomy or violent, and was of fiery temper and unsteady life. Mahaffey suggests that the thunderbolt added to the Ptolemy coins at the time of his birth possibly gave rise to the nickname. History does not chronicle details, but there may have been actual quarrels between father and son, a state of affairs not unknown in modern times. Be this as it may, the younger was preferred before the elder. Neither succession, perhaps, could have prevented subsequent bitterness of feeling and strife yet peace was outwardly observed during the life of the old king. Corano submitted and left Egypt with his mother, brothers, and sister, 
while berenike's son was made king co-ruler with his father who virtually abdicated in 285 through 4 with feasts and rejoicing ptolemy the younger was fair-haired and delicate in youth resembling his father but with more regular features and the thick neck characteristic of many members of the family his manners were gentle as well as popular and probably he had already shown an appreciation of his father's policy and a taste for intellectual and scientific pursuits few fathers would not take more pleasure in the succession of a son likely to carry out their views than in one who seemed disposed to change and alter all their arrangements gorgeous pageants celebrated the advent of the new king his father it may be said had in a certain measure slipped into power not so with the son his successor it was a matter of direct inheritance and in egypt at least his claim was not disputed whatever assistance ptolemy carano secured was from foreign aid and not from partisans at home the banqueting hall was decorated with sculpture and painted and carpeted with flowers the gold and silver vessels crown treasures were carried in the grand procession there were fruits of all sorts displayed and droves of camels elephants and other wild animals elephants were then much in favor as battle chargers with the kings of this period and though the ptolemies made less use of them in this respect they too had large numbers of them their popularity however soon declined and in later wars they were no longer deemed available ptolemy sotor presented the victors in the games at his son's coronation with twenty crowns queen berenica with twenty-three historical and allegorical tableaus were interspersed and eighty thousand troops of cavalry and infantry took part it must have been a combination of the circus processions of modern times with less tinsel and more of solid value with a fine military parade it delighted the people from morning till evening and showed to all strangers the wealth and power of the ptolemy house spite of gentle seeming as soon as his father's death left him in possession of the regal power the new king made it quite clear he would tolerate no rival and meant to keep possession of all he had gained like his father perhaps he had no special taste for the shedding of blood indeed he is said to have deplored what he considered the necessity of pursuing this policy none the less did he hesitate to do so to secure his throne and several people were put to death whom he thought might give him trouble probably his elder brother would have been among these could he have laid his hand on him it was mortal strife between them and ptolemy coranos was now in another country doing his best to unseat the young king some years before her brother's accession the young arsinoe a girl of sixteen first child of ptolemy sotor and berenica had married or rather been married to the elderly lysimachus king of thrace disparity of years was of course of no account in a political marriage and had exchanged her sunny egyptian home for the cooler and more rigorous climate of the mountainous regions of northern greece beautiful clever and ambitious as were most of the ptolemy women she was prominent among them and destined to have strong influence wherever she went especially over two at least of the men with whom she was most closely associated this marriage took place about three hundred b c 
so anxious was Ptolemy Sotor to cement the alliance between Lysimachus and himself that marriage after marriage was arranged for, and it might have been supposed that the two families were so closely united that peace among them had been secured. His stepdaughter Lysandra was given to the Thracian crown prince Agathocles, thus making her at the same time sister and daughter-in-law of Arsinoe, who was probably the younger of the two, and not content with this, a marriage was arranged between the young king of Egypt and Arsinoe, daughter of Lysimachus, and half-sister of Agathocles, who thus became Queen Arsinoe I of Egypt. She, too, was a person of spirit, decision, and character. Bloodshed marked her footsteps. She caused an illicit lover of her mother's to be slain, and is said herself, young though she was, to have hastened on her marriage with the Egyptian king, one of policy rather than affection, probably, on both sides. It requires a clear head to follow out these complicated relationships. Arsinoe I had attained her ambition, but it was a position in those unsettled times involving quite as much peril as honor. She became the mother of several children, but whether her life was a happy one, we may justly have our doubts. It held, however, less tragedy than that of her successor. Perhaps she was neither beautiful nor winning. Certain it is that the courtesies which were subsequently paid to various queens of putting their likeness on the coins and naming cities after them were omitted in her case. Ptolemy Philadelphus founded, it is said, four Berenikas in honor of his mother, eighteen Arsinoes in honor of his second wife, and three Philoteras in honor of his sister, in Egypt and elsewhere. These last were out of regard to a favorite sister, Philotera, who dwelt in single blessedness, shall we call it a rare privilege in those days, and lived in great harmony with her brother and his queens. As to the queen, Arsinoe II, so to the maiden sister also, poems were addressed by the versifiers of the times. The Thracian Arsinoe I, notwithstanding her early self-assertion, seems to have made little mark either upon her husband or upon Egypt. The comparative neglect with which she was treated may have embittered her and made true the accusation brought against her of having conspired against the life of her husband. If it was true, she was leniently dealt with. She was divorced about 277 B.C., in the eighth or ninth year of Ptolemy's reign, and banished to Coptos, where she lived in some state, and appears from certain records to have been accompanied or visited by her younger son. She kept up her intercourse, too, perhaps with some of her Thracian relatives, and built shrines to the gods. The very fact that her life did not pay the forfeit of her alleged crime seems to throw doubt upon it, or possibly, though this seems less likely, Arsinoe II, her supplanter, who in general her purpose accomplished, showed no desire for the shedding of blood, may have induced the king to spare her. We can only surmise. Ptolemy Philadelphus was a prosperous and popular king, living in comparative peace in sunny Egypt with his Thracian wife, remote from most of the wars which were carried on in his name, and caring little what battles raged at a distance, so that he preserved himself and his kingdom in relative quiet. There were wars and rebellions afar, there were times even when Egypt itself was threatened, but through it all, at home, Ptolemy was able to pursue a relatively peaceful way. 
he spent his time adorning his splendid city and enlarging and so to call it emphasizing the scope of his great museum a combination of university club and social gathering place the early ptolemies especially were patrons of learning and people of all nations met at their brilliant court he gathered around him men of intellectual and scientific pursuits and enjoyed mental pleasures as well as those of a lower order his courtiers lavished upon him unstinted adulation and he might well have walked the earth as proudly as the great rameses the second his predecessor it is to him we owe the translation of the bible called the septuagint from the seventy translators who were gathered together to accomplish the task manetho of sabinitus a priest of heliopolis was also employed by the king to collect the fragments of egyptian history from the time of menes forty four fifty five b c to three twenty two b c which had lain hidden or neglected in the various temples and prepare from them a consecutive narrative but unfortunately only fragments of this also now remain to us and it is from these given by josephus and other jewish and christian writers that we have obtained our earliest knowledge in a literary form of egyptian history this work enjoyed a high reputation the king himself must have had some literary ability or at least a pretty turn for the use of the pen for he wrote a history of alexander's conquests that it was much celebrated and lauded goes without saying even in modern times the literary productions of king or president are much in demand and widely read but of its intrinsic merits we are unable to judge since it too is lost to us an unfortunate fact as it could not fail to have been of interest whatever its method of treatment or literary value ptolemy made wise laws and so far as he could combined with his own personal advantage wrought in every way for the internal improvement of his kingdom notwithstanding the modern assertions of liberty equality and fraternity it may be doubted whether in all ages and at all times man is not more or less a slave to circumstance and environment but certainly the slaves of the early ptolemies might have contrasted favorably both with those who came before and those who came after less trampled upon and oppressed than in the reigns of the pyramid builders the great rameses or the persian line they appear also to have been better off and more peaceful than under the later ptolemy rulers ptolemy ably seconded by his favorite wife was devoted to the service of the temples and favorable to the priests a policy which helped to strengthen his place and power he built and restored temples both to the gods of greece and egypt these last were approached in solemn procession and were not merely like the greeks to hold images of the gods or like the later christian places of worship to accommodate a congregation they had a holy of holies into which only the high priest entered through the avenue of sphinxes which frequently gave entrance to the temples the long line would wind from their gaily decorated boats on the nile while the sacred lakes and the sacred grove were generally within the enclosure the pylons or entrances were most imposing and an open court and a great hall beyond with colonnades and columns adorned with sculpture and paintings gave entrance to this highest sanctuary containing the symbol of the god or sacred animal 
no traces remain of the temple building of Ptolemy Philadelphus beyond the beautiful island of Philae, but at many other points ruins and fragments are to be found. Those of the temple of Isis in Hebd are near the present Mosera. These are of red and gray granite with columns and architraves. There are figures of the king making offerings to Isis, and among others an inscription which reads, Isis, mistress of Hebit, who lays everything before her royal brother. Of the portrait statues of the Egyptian kings and queens, Dr. Lepsius says, they wear the same character of monumental repose as the gods themselves, and yet without the possibility of their human individuality being confounded with the universally typical features of the divine images. But intellectual or so-called religious pursuits not alone shared Ptolemy's heart and attention. His was a pleasure-loving nature. Beautiful women thronged his court, sought his favor, and beamed upon him with smiles and blandishments. No claim of legal wife, not even the true and devoted affection which he showed so plainly that he felt for his latest spouse, prevented his indulging in baser connections. He was the king. If no other man, the king at least might do as he pleased. There was none to criticize, none to prevent. Then, too, he amused himself with his goldsmith's work. Bench and tools doubtless occupied some favorite nook in the palace. And since this fancy is a matter of record, we may judge that he turned out some creditable specimens of work, was no mean craftsman, and perhaps adorned with his own skill the favorite of the hour or the plum and beautiful form of his beloved Arsinoe II. To the personal history of this same princess, the subject of the present sketch, we turn once more. Like Roxanne, wife of Alexander, she in a measure deserved and prepared the way for her own subsequent misfortunes. She was queen of Thrace, a distinguished and honorable position, but obtained at the cost of the honor, feelings, and probably affections of the previous queen. Lysimachus had lived at Sardis, apparently in harmony with a noble Persian wife, a mistress, but probably for political reasons alone, he sent her away and married the young daughter of Ptolemy Sotor. The new queen of Thrace resembled her mother, Berenica, in her ambition and tact. She, too, acquired great influence over an old husband, as far as in her lay, ousted her stepchildren from their natural rights, and secured all she could for her own. She obtained from the king the cession of several valuable towns, but was not contented. Again, like her mother before her, she wished to supplant the elder members of the family. At this crisis, Ptolemy Caranos, the embroiler, arrived at the Thracian court, and instead of, as might have been expected, siding with his own sister Lysandra, who had married the crown prince Agathocles, calumniated him to the king, showing how completely the old man was under Arsinoe's powerful influence and succeeded in having the prince put to death, none of which shows Arsinoe in a very amiable light, but she doubtless thought one must fight for oneself by whatever means or be driven to the wall. There were other allies, Magus, king of Cyrene, and half-brother of Ptolemy Coranos, seems to have leaned to his side in the contest which the latter was waging for his rights, and been ready to throw off the yoke of Egypt. These were stirring times, men and women too, 
whether they would or not, must lead the strenuous life. Seleucus, king of Syria, lent aid to Ptolemy Coranos, and attacked Lysimachus, who lost his life in battle, but instead of proceeding further to place Coranos on the throne of Egypt, as the latter expected, he suddenly determined to go back to his old home in Macedonia. Disappointed and enraged, Corano secured the murder of Seleucos and proclaimed himself king in his place. That he could have succeeded in this gigantic scheme, Mahaffey considers, shows him to have had many fellow conspirators. His Egyptian projects had now to be abandoned, as Antiochus, son of Seleucos, was already hastening to avenge the death of his father. So Coranos, nothing loath probably, seized upon the throne of Thrace, the king and his eldest son both being dead. Grabbing a kingdom seems to have been comparatively easy, the pastime of adventurers in those days, but it was frequently light come and light go. There was seldom any real stability in these self-made royalties. Again, Arsinoe, the Egyptian-born, appears in an unfavorable light, though how far independence of action or any other course was possible to her we cannot judge, for she married this murderer of kings, the son of her father's first wife. Doubtless she must have foreseen the possibility of ill consequences, for she was a woman of acute mind, but probably in the midst of such troublous times and so many perplexities, it seemed the safest thing to her to marry the strongest, the man who had proved himself a success, and she believed that it would secure her and her children the throne of Thrace. She had already lent herself to cruel deeds to secure this object. She must needs go on in the same path. Few more unlovely characters than Caranos appear in this dark period of history. It is evident that he simply married Arsinoe to get her in his power, for no sooner had he done so than he murdered her young children and banished her, childless and heartbroken, to the island of Samothrace, to repent in bitterness of soul her sad mistake. Two years later the monster was overthrown in battle, dragged from his elephant, and hacked to pieces by the barbarous Gauls, leaving, we may imagine, but few to mourn his well-deserved fate. Meanwhile, the childless widow, stripped of throne, honors, and kindred, abode in the holy isle. To her, perhaps, life seemed ended, little foreseeing the splendid future before her. Turning to religious consolations in time of sorrow, she worshipped the strange divinities of the place, building shrines to them, of which traces have been discovered in modern times and even adding them to the long list of Egyptian divinities and building temples to them when she returned to her native land. Deeply attached to her as he proved himself to be later, we cannot suppose Ptolemy Philadelphus to have been unmoved by the great misfortunes of his sister. But news traveled slowly in those days, and whatever the cause, he seems to have done nothing at once to avenge her losses. Whether at his instance or hers we know not, but after a certain length of time Arsinoe returned to Egypt. She took new hold of life, and perhaps even began to scheme for the attainment of the honors which she shortly won. Recognized or not, her presence was a menace to the reigning queen. Equally, it remains possible that she was innocent in this matter, further than acquiescence in the wishes of the king. But her previous course in Thrace lends color to the former idea. 
so Arsinoe the first was banished, and Ptolemy married the widow, who now became Arsinoe the second, called Philadelphus during her lifetime, and only subsequently was the title bestowed upon her husband to distinguish him among the long list of Ptolemy kings. This strange marriage was quite in accordance with Egyptian customs, where the queen was frequently called the king's sister as a term of honor, whether she was so or not, and shows how the Ptolemies had accepted Egyptian ideas, which no doubt largely account for their popularity. But to the Greeks such unions were an offense, and deemed, as we would in a Christian age, incestuous. But the king was absolute. One of the courtiers, if not more, who dared to criticize and disapprove, paid with life for his temerity. The first marriage occurred probably when Arsinoe the second was about sixteen, her third and last when she was thirty-nine or forty. There can be little doubt that she had beauty and charm, a vigorous mind, and great tact. She needed scope for her powers, and in becoming queen of Egypt, found a field well suited to her desires and abilities. We seem to see some resemblance between her and Queen Mertitifs of ancient times. Both were in succession wife to different kings, both were women of great attractiveness and capacity, and both took a personal share in public affairs. Step by step, the new queen rose to greater prominence. Her sorrows were of the past. Now life was all sunshine. She attained the highest point to which mortal could reach. She was finally worshipped as a goddess, and on a certain stele found at Python, she is even represented as a deity bestowing favors on her husband. In the fifteenth year of Ptolemy's reign, Arsinoe II was made goddess of Mendi, in the nineteenth at Thebes, and in the twentieth or twenty-first as Isis Arsinoe. She was worshipped at Sais, and the king claimed these honors for her in all the temples of Egypt. There had been a city the center of the Egyptian worship of the crocodile, this Ptolemy renamed after the queen. It was enlarged, embellished, and Hellenized to a great extent by the introduction of the Greek language and the erection of temples to the Greek gods and institutions on a Greek pattern. Its population at one time was said to amount to a hundred thousand. Among other attractions for the king, perhaps, was also the fact that Arsinoe was a great heiress. She had proprietary claims on Cassandria, Pontiac, Heraclea, and its dependent cities, bestowed on her by her first husband. In the region called the Fayum, the former Lake Maurice was drained and turned into a fertile plain and this work was attributed to Arsinoe, and it was now called the Arsinoe Nome, and from it the queen derived part of her revenues. Old records show that it was settled by veteran soldiers who brought wives from Greek lands, and that it was an orderly and well-managed society, with few crimes laid to its account. Arsinoe II was an ideal stepmother, in the better sense of the word. The children of Ptolemy were treated by her as her own. Only one son appears to have accompanied his mother into exile, if even he remained permanently with her. All the others dwelt in apparent harmony and affection with her supplanter. Thus Ptolemy Philadelphus had an intellectual companion whose advice he sought, and upon whose judgment he relied, whose personal charms were great, who made life smooth and agreeable, and who dwelt at peace both with his favorite sister and his children. While last, and perhaps not least, in her catalogue of virtues in his eyes, 
she was lenient to his defections from the moral code and saved him from the desire and peril of other alliances such as she was the king seems to have idolized her and paid her every possible honor in life and in death that she was some years his senior in no way interfered with a marriage apparently most congenial to both deprived first of parents then of husband children and throne arsinoe had a strange and rare experience virtually a second life lay before her surpassing in all respects her earlier career she dwelt in light and airy palaces built of brick and wood richly decorated with color adorned with balconies and surrounded by gardens and ponds the music of tambourine drum and flute violin with one string zither lute or mandolin and song and chorus she had but to speak her pleasure and silence became melodious rhythm but not time and monotonous singing through the nose not pleasing to the european ear is said to describe egyptian music of today and probably that of the past also but it was doubtless to their taste the queen too had the privilege of being priestess in the temples and playing the sacred sistrum before the gods she dwelt in an increasingly beautiful city with wide streets splendid palaces and many fine buildings her associations were with men of culture and learning she was surrounded by courtiers and poets who paid her homage and wrote in her praise doubtless too through her many tried to obtain favors from and influence with the king she was for those times a deeply religious woman building temples to the gods and lavishing gifts upon them thereby of course she endeared herself to the priests always a more or less influential class and it was probably owing to this in addition to her husband's partiality that she was even during her lifetime deified both she and the king we may judge had affable and agreeable manners and both seem to have been very popular with the people in all the concerns of the kingdom she took an active share and it is said that no queen till we reach the last cleopatra ever wielded greater political influence wars and rumors of wars there were but egypt itself in this reign rested in comparative peace the queen's life must have been busy and full of interest thus enabling her to recover from her earlier sorrows egypt was a country flowing not with milk and honey but with oil and wine the juices of the olive and the grape from which large revenues were derived as the great museum is said to have formed part of the palace and contained cloisters or porticos a public theatre or lecture room and an immense dining hall where the learned feasted together it is possible that the queen may have been no unfamiliar figure within its walls the person of the ptolemy queens was doubtless as well known to the people as the wife of many a modern ruler the persian custom of strict seclusion for women not obtaining among the greeks and their descendants there is a story told of queen arsinoe the second considered reliable to the effect that she took exception to the ordering of a feast to one of the gods remarking this is a shabby consorting together for the company must be a mixed crowd of all sorts the food stale and not decently served and thereafter provided for better arrangements at her own expense hitherto each guest somewhat in the manner of a modern country picnic having brought a miscellaneous and disorderly collection 
and whatever the queen did in the matter was doubtless accepted by the king together with his sister the royal pair travelled through the country and cities were founded bearing the name of both ladies together the king and queen seemed to have governed and planned for the internal improvement of the kingdom studying its needs and necessities by personal inspection they made two visits to python and their foreign officials brought back elephants and various curiosities to pleasure their majesties or by special command part of the text of an ancient inscription found in the mounds of the ruins of this very city reads he brought all the things which are agreeable to the king and to his sister his royal wife who loves him further and he built a great city to the king with the illustrious name of the king the lord of egypt ptolemaeus and he took possession of it with the soldiers of his majesty and all the workmen of egypt and the land of punt also they caught elephants and in another place it proceeds and in this place Kamurse, the king had founded a large city to his sister with the illustrious name of king ptolemy philatera the same beloved sister to whom as well as to the queen herself court poets like callimachus addressed poems sanctuaries were also built there to the princess adelphus the delicate and pleasure-loving king never commanded his armies in person but was quick to take advantage of anything in his own favor he sent ambassadors to treat with the great and growing power of rome and made alliances wherever possible with any power strong enough to do his harm with pyrrhus king of epirus he was connected by the marriage of a stepsister antigone his mother berenica's daughter by her first husband always beside the king arsinoe the second was a woman of affairs busy and capable but not too much occupied to enjoy the amenities of life and make it agreeable to her consort in his foreign wars and alliances in the internal improvement of the kingdom in his literary work the story of alexander's campaigns in manetho's history of egypt in the translation of the septuagint in the additions to the great library in which at the time of his death ptolemy philadelphus is said to have left seven hundred thousand volumes in the marriages of his children we cannot doubt the queen's active interest and sympathetic share above all others she was the privy councillor at karnak and various points along the nile as far as phylae are fragments of temples both to egyptian and greek gods built or restored by ptolemy philadelphus and both he and his wife were interested in the kabiri mysteries probably in their later years as someone has well said to still the longings of the soul with spiritual food and with dim revelations of the unseen here too perhaps we may see the queen's influence since they were celebrated with special solemnity at samothrace the home of her widowhood the king and queen lived in an atmosphere of adulation like that which surrounded louis the fourteenth writers of the time drew flattering pictures of them and coarse caricatures of the masses as today newspapers whatever the private convictions of their editors will bow and truckle to what they believe to be the popular view of any subject so in ancient times it was the king and queen alone and those in high places who thus swayed the pen some writers believe that ptolemy and arsinoe had one son who died in youth but the weight of testimony is against this in regard to the marriages of her stepchildren whom she had brought up as her own 
we may well believe the queen's influence was great the eldest daughter berenica the child of arsinoe the first was married to antiochus the second the sickly king of syria chiefly in the hope of establishing an egyptian claim to the throne of that monarchy sacrificed like so many young princesses both before and after to political purposes yet ptolemy philadelphus seems to have regarded this daughter with a special tenderness for he accompanied her to her husband's kingdom was present at the marriage and continued to send her the water of the fertile beloved and worshipped nile for use in her distant home to accomplish this marriage antiochus the second had put away his first wife laodice but this last was not a woman to submit meekly to such indignity and stopped at nothing to recover her lost position who did in those days even the best of them hesitate at any crime to secure her object the injured queen burning to avenge her wrongs caused the king to be poisoned he perhaps weakly having put himself in her power by going to see her at ephesus even after the birth of a son by the new queen nor was this enough for the death of her rival was also determined upon laodice having many adherents and ere her father could come to her rescue poor berenica and her babe were also murdered innocent victims of political intrigue ptolemy philadelphus perhaps lived long enough to hear of this tragic death but not long enough to avenge it a task he left to the son who succeeded him of the personality and general characteristics of no queen in the long ptolemy line can we gather a clearer idea from the records that remain to us there is a statue of ptolemy philadelphus and arsinoe the second in the vatican with mahaffy thinks the dear sister phylactera beside them not only on coins but among the effigies at the entrance of the odium at athens where the statues of the egyptian kings were set up she had her place pausanias also saw at helicon a statue of her riding upon an ostrich in bronze a position elevated but lacking in dignity perhaps like a gray-haired lady on the modern bicycle it is very likely continues mahaffy that this statue or a replica was present to the mind of callicacus when he spake in the coma berenices of the winged horse brother of the ethiopian memnon who is the messenger of queen arsinoe she is also in that poem called venus and zephyrian from the coins we learn of arsinoe the second that there were octodrams in all metals with her image and those with portraits of ptolemy the first and berenica the first and those of ptolemy the second and herself and in silver of ptolemy the first and also of her alone struck in the reign of ptolemy philadelphus also gold coins with arsinoe the second alone the coins of arsinoe the second were mainly octodrams in gold and decadrams in silver on these and also on those of her stepdaughter berenica the second both queens are diademed and veiled with regular features indisputably handsome but conventionalized arsinoe the second appears with the horn of zeus amun diadem stephanie or crown veil and sceptre she is beautiful in youth and still handsome though more portly as depicted in later years most of the ptolemy queens grew comfortably plump with time the murder of a rival or even the death of their nearest relatives appears to have interfered little with their digestion 
but death came at last to put an end to these ceaseless activities whether by slow decay or sudden illness we know not ptolemy philadelphus died 247 b c arsinoe the second some say 270 b c but we have no precise date the king was in no sense a faithful lover since he had a succession of feminine favorites alternating in the company of philosophers and mistresses yet he seems to have mourned arsinoe with a passionate grief and indulged in what may be called wild schemes to do her honor one of these was the building of a temple with a lodestone in the roof which should hold suspended in mid-air an iron statue of the queen in everything he had leaned upon her and she had made life agreeable to him his sorrow for her loss was sincere and deep her popularity with the people was also widespread more inscriptions in her honor have been found all over egypt than those of any of the succeeding queens ptolemy philadelphus reigned more than thirty-six years and left his kingdom peacefully to his son euergetes whose name had long been associated with his in public acts End of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of predecessors of cleopatra this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org predecessors of cleopatra by lee north ptolemy queens continued ptolemy euergetes the benefactor son of ptolemy philadelphus and arsinoe the second was the third of his race to become king of egypt he ascended the throne when past his early youth and appears to have remained unmarried until this time we know little of his early life and one writer suggests that the all-pervading power and influence of his stepmother arsinoe the second may have caused him to absent himself from his native land but this is merely hypothesis he chose for himself or his father chose for him berenike daughter and heiress of magus king of cyrene who at the time of their marriage was reigning queen in her father's stead the egyptian prince having been declared lord of cyrene and on his marriage king consort while she now became berenike the second of egypt magus was the son of berenike the first the grandmother of euergetes by a marriage previous to that with Ptolemy Sotor. Hence there was a sort of cousinship between Euergetes and his bride. Personal acquaintance there may have been also, and real affection, of which it is pleasant to read, appears between them. It is said too that no breath of scandal touched Ptolemy Euergetes' name, which is indeed a unique record in his family. Like many other princes, and others of a later day, Euergetes may have been sent abroad, to complete his education and see something of the world. If these travels led him to Cyrene, as appears likely, since he was proclaimed lord of the same on the death of Magus, he may have become familiar with the lady of his choice, and seen or heard tales of her prowess. A brave and valiant figure, this same Berenike the second, warm-hearted, affectionate and courageous to a degree. Stories are told of her valour in rescuing her father, and in the midst of enemies, by riding in among and putting them to flight. Like the late Empress of Austria, she was a splendid horsewoman, was accustomed to break horses for the Olympian Games, and performed other equestrian feats. An individual figure was she, like her predecessor on the throne of Egypt, Arsinoe II, but a very different one, save in the fact that the husband of both seemed devoted to them. With these experiences behind her, Berenike could not have been very young when she became Queen of Egypt. Such as she was, doubtless handsome, intrepid and fascinating, she won the heart of a prince to whom she seems to have given her own unreservedly. Even so, the course of true love did not run quite smooth. Her mother Berenike also opposed the match for reasons not given, 
but did not succeed in breaking it off. One line by a poet of the time gives an attractive touch to the picture of the new queen. He who is seated facing thee sees and hears thy laughter sweet. Of her too we have portraits on the coins, beautiful, regular featured and conventional. These were gold, octodrams and others. In some she appears with the king, in some alone, with diadem, veil and necklace. Others are remarkable for the absence of the veil. There is a cornucopia and it is accompanied by a single star. Berenike II was the first Egyptian queen who bore her title on the coins. Shortly before the accession of Ptolemy III and his marriage, which occurred 247 BC, had come the tragic news of the murder of his sister Berenike, the young queen of Syria, of which it is uncertain whether his father was aware. Uergetes, apparently the most personally valiant and warlike of the three first Ptolemies, set out to avenge her death. Queen Berenike II implored the gods to restore her beloved husband, and vowed to Venus the tresses of her hair, bright, beautiful and abundant, in case of his safe return. Fragments of papyri, found by Professor Petri, confirm the fact that the king was successful in his war and came again in triumph. With what rejoicing he was received by his wife, we can well imagine, who faithfully carried out her vow and this woman's crown was placed in the sanctuary. The king, while highly appreciating this token of affection, must have felt some regret at the sacrifice. It recalls a story of later date where the Duchess of Marlborough, of the time of William III, cut off her beautiful hair, not to dedicate it to the gods, but to throw it indignantly at her husband's feet as revenge for some act of his, of which she did not approve. She had not even the satisfaction of rousing him, for he took no notice. But after his death she found, locked up in a drawer, her heavy curls, which he had always admired. Berenike's hair, however, was stolen from the temple, to the grief and indignation of the king. To account for it, courtiers and poets devised legends, and the mathematician Conan said it had been raised to the heavens to become a constellation, the comma Berenice, a small group of stars still to be seen. Of this miracle, Catulus wrote, Behold, we stream along the liquid air, a radiant lock of Berenice's hair, which the fond queen with hands uplifted vowed, a welcome offering to each favouring god. And speaking of the king, it continues, Speed his return, with triumph crown his stay, and subject Asian realms to Egypt's sway. This once attained, among the gods I shine, absolving all thy oaths, a new-made sign, that the yellow tresses of my fair, sacred to love, might gild the illumined air. And the hare, impersonated by the poet, laments its separation from its mistress's head. These flights of fancy were no doubt very pleasing to the king. Like her mother-in-law, if to a less degree, Berenike II seems to have taken an active interest in the affairs of the kingdom. At Canopus, an old trading post, a temple was erected to the king and queen, who were there deified as benefactor gods, referring probably to the active measures which they took to avert a threatened famine. From the Canopus decree, which bears some resemblance to the celebrated Rosetta Stone, and from a gold plaque found in the ruins of tombs, we obtain this information. In the sanctuary at Philae is still a pedestal placed there by Oergetes and his wife, on which stood the sacred boat, with the image of Isis, and on a wall in the same temple is his father Ptolemy Philadelphus, offering incense and pouring water on the altar. To the princess Berenike, probably the first child of this marriage, who had died, a statue was set up beside the gods. The headdress of young Berenike differs in that it has two ears of corn, in the midst of which is the asp-shaped diadem, behind is a papyrus-shaped scepter, about which the tail of the diadem serpent is wound. The year after the Canopus decree, the death of his reign, Ptolemy Oergetes went with great pomp to the refounding of the temple of Edfu in Upper Egypt, one of the most splendid with which the Ptolemy name is connected, and where a great feast was held for six days. We know but little definitely about the private life of the king and queen, 
but one or two incidents connected with her are preserved. Other wives or mistresses, claimants on her husband's affection made no figure if they existed. So we may believe Berenike's marriage relations to have been more than usually peaceful and happy. One pleasant anecdote is told of her, which Mahaffey gives in a footnote. While the king was one day playing at dice, an officer came to him to read out a list of criminals to be condemned, but the queen gently took it away and would not allow him to decide so important a matter so hastily and at such a time, and it further states that the king yielded to her wishes. That the queen thus dared to interfere, and the king so readily accept her action, seems to give proof of the peculiarly amiable relations existing between them. The queen is also spoken of as a patroness of various aromatic oils, toilette articles, etc., which leads us to suppose she was particular about and careful of her personal appearance. Ptolemy Euergetes was, like his predecessor, fat and handsome with a full voluptuous face. The early Ptolemies all had full voluptuous faces, but handsome, while in the cases of their successors the features were less regular, the nose sharper and the chin more prominent. The royal pair had several children, of whom the oldest succeeded his father, the king dying in the 25th year of his reign. The three first Ptolemies were men of mark, their descendants were decadents, profligate, perfidious and cruel, and faithful in every way to moral obligations and their task of governing. Ptolemy Philopater was a young man when he ascended the throne in 222 BC. His name is said to signify the son designated for the throne by his father, with whom, as was so frequently the case, he had probably already been associated in the government. Some authors even suggest he was not even innocent of the death of this parent, as that of the other was certainly laid at his door, and that he selected the name Philopater to disarm suspicion. But possibly, at Cambyses, as he proved himself a man of evil, nothing was too bad to believe of him. Immediately on his accession, he murdered his younger brother Magas. Of this there seems no doubt. Berenike II was much attached to this younger son and perhaps wished him to succeed his father, as Philadelphus had done, in preference to Keraunus, which may have been the cause of the new king's unnatural hatred against her. She was given in charge of Sosibius, an official and favourite of the king's, and is said either to have been murdered or committed suicide by poison, so unendurable to the high-spirited princess was her imprisonment. She who had been reigning queen and so beloved, it was a melancholy close to her life story. A number of other murders are laid to the king's charge through the influence of the same Sosibius. Polybius, who is deemed a reliable authority on this period, says the king would attend to no business and would hardly grant an interview to the officials about the court, but was absorbed in unworthy intrigues and senseless and continual drunkenness, and treated the several branches of the government with equal indifference. All was managed by the officials, or any who might seize the power. His generals fought his battles and gained his victories with little thanks, due to the wisdom or judgment of the king. Agathocles and Sosibius were his leading ministers, but occasionally, at least, he seems to have roused himself and appeared in person on the field as we read of his setting out from Alexandria with 70,000 infantry, 5,000 cavalry and 73 elephants. At Raphia was fought a great battle between Antiochus of Syria and Ptolemy, which was opened by a charge of elephants in which the Egyptians came off victorious. And here we catch a glimpse of the next Queen of Egypt, subsequently deified with her husband as God's Philippa Torres, Asinoe III, daughter of Uergetes I and Berenike II. She accompanied her brother and rode with him, a fearless horsewoman like her mother, perhaps in front of the troops before the battle, exhorting the soldiers to courage and conquest. Like her mother also, she is said to have dedicated a lock of her hair in the temple. But the story is not so well authenticated. 
Besides this little glimpse of her personality at the battle, which shows vigour and bravery, we learn little of her. Probably she was fair, perhaps virtuous. She was a late child of her parents' marriage. It may be the youngest, and it seems to be implied that she was early left an orphan and had a sad youth. It was some years after this battle, about 213 BC, that she was married to Ptolemy Philopato and became Arsinoe III of Egypt. Her husband, given to debauchery, amusing himself with literary work, a taste he shared with other Ptolemies, and not, we may imagine, of a very high character, and under the influence of his minister, Sosibius, as well as Agathocles and Agathoclea, sister of the latter, could not have been a very love-inspiring companion. The queen bore a son in 210 or 209 BC, who succeeded his father at five years of age under the title of Ptolemy V, Epiphanes. The cruelties to the Jews practised or allowed by Ptolemy IV were in contrast to the policy of his predecessors, and though some inscriptions remain, the Temple of Edfu has mention of this, which do him honour, the weight of testimony seems to be that he was an oppressive and cruel king and hated by his subjects. Yet these few inscriptions, as is frequently the case, for in any important matter the testimony is often conflicting, give a different and better view of his character. The chief cause of, or accessory to, many murders he undoubtedly was. A temple in Nubia gives pictures of Ptolemy, Philopater and his wife, Arsinoe III, receiving offerings, as well as those of his father and mother, grandfather and grandmother. It is thought that the prince of Nubia may have assisted in putting down a revolt of his subjects. The murder of Arsinoe II was due to the influence of the king's shameless mistress, Agathoclea, and her brother, Agathocles. But what had made the unfortunate queen especially obnoxious to them, we do not know. Perhaps she was merely an obstacle in the path of their ambition, and they thought that if they could get the child absolutely in their power, they could regulate things better to their own liking. Perhaps some stories, true or false, were raised against the queen to justify their proceedings. She seems to have had a sad life, and to have been friendless in the midst of enemies. There is something very pathetic in the story of the early life of Ptolemy V, Epiphanes, who became king at five years of age. His father dead, his mother murdered, so soon that he could scarcely have remembered her, and he left in the hands of her murderers. Polybius gives a picture of these events in the following words. The next step of Agathocles was to summon a meeting of the Macedonian guards. He entered the assembly accompanied by the young king and his own sister, Agathoclea. At first he feigned not to be able to say what he wished for tears, but after again and again wiping his eyes with his clamorous, he at length mastered his emotion, and taking the young king in his arms, he spoke as follows. Take this boy, whom his father on his deathbed placed in this lady's care, pointing to his sister, and confided to your loyalty, men of Macedonia. Her affection has but little influence in securing the child's safety. It is on you that safety now depends. His fortunes are in your hands. He then proceeded to inveigh against Tlepolemus, governor of Pelusium, and a general in the army who was evidently popular with the soldiers and in so doing overshot his mark. The murder of the queen and even of the man into whose hands the letter ordering the same had fallen seems gradually to have been traced, though at first kept secret, to its true authors, and this added to other acts of cruelty and unlawful seizure of power, raised a storm of feeling among the soldiers and the populace generally against Agathocles and his associates, and his words were received with hootings and loud murmurs, so that he began to fear the worst for himself and made haste to escape. The fury of a mob of any nationality and at any period of the world's history once raised, is not easy to allay, and seldom have such uprisings been known and attended by bloodshed. In this, as in other cases, there were some leaders ready to fan rather than to extinguish the flame of popular wrath, and they determined to overthrow the obnoxious ministers. The whole city was in a ferment, and the next morning the Macedonian guard broke open the palace, seized the person of the little king, placed him on horseback and led him among the people, 
who shouted and clapped their hands. They then put him on the royal seat and extracted from the doubtless frightened child permission to surrender to the populace, those who had injured him or his mother. Pitiful it must have been to see a mere baby placed in such circumstances, whether he really understood anything of what was going on or had any affection for those in question we cannot tell. It of course resulted in the murder of Agathocles and all his kinsfolk, a fate well deserved perhaps by most of them, but horrible to contemplate. But the dreadful thirst for blood was awakened in the angry crowd, and there were bound to be victims, more or less numerous. End of chapter 25, read by Bertha Mason, Nottingham, England, 2022. Chapter 26 of Predecessors of Cleopatra. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Predecessors of Cleopatra by Lee North. Chapter 26 Ptolemy Queens Continued. Thus tragically was ushered in the reign of the boy king, Ptolemy V, Epiphanes the illustrious, whose dates are 205 to 182 B.C., and whose prenomen or throne name, found on his cartouche, means heir of the two father-loving gods, chosen of Ta, strength of the Ka of Ra, living image of Amen. Too young to take matters into his own hands, the power seems to have been divided between Tlepolemus as military and Aristomenes, called the king's tutor, as civil administrator of affairs. The reign of a minor is apt to be distracted by conflicts of one sort and another, and this proved no exception. In the case of the youthful son of Alexander the Great, it was the generals of his father's army who wrested from him his inheritance. In that of the young Ptolemy, it was the foreign powers, the kings of Macedonia and Syria, who sought to do so. But the Romans proved the instruments of the boy's salvation, though not for his sake, and conquered in battle and made tributary the men who were his enemies, while the two ministers who had taken his affairs in charge guarded him well at home. There were also some who maintained that the guardianship of the boy's rights was offered to the Romans, though the weight of evidence seems against this idea. Certain it is, however, that Ptolemy Epiphanes, or those who acted for him, sent very submissive embassies to this great and growing power, destined eventually to swallow up his country, or rather to become possessed of its sovereignty. We cannot trace the course of foreign wars or native rebellions, but must return to the more domestic aspect of the history. The little king lived in Alexandria, and very early in his life there seems to have been some suggestion of his marriage with the daughter of the king of Syria, and in the seventh year of his reign, when he must have been about twelve, it is said that the betrothal took place. It was, of course, a political alliance, to cement a good understanding between the two nations. How much greater the privileges and the independence, at least on the question of marriage, of the private individual over the sometimes envied king or queen. At thirteen or fourteen years of age, Ptolemy V was crowned at Memphis, and the decree of the Rosetta Stone was issued. It begins, In the reign of the young, and then goes on to enumerate the king's ancestors, to name priests and priestesses, and to give a detailed list of the benefits his majesty had bestowed upon the kingdom. Quote, in requital of which the gods have given him health, victory, power, and all other good things, his sovereignty remaining to him and his children for all time. With propitious fortune, it seemed good to the priests of all the temples in the land to increase greatly the existing honors of the king, Ptolemy, his parents, grandparents, etc. End quote. As Ptolemy was but in early childhood, when he is said to have bestowed so many benefits upon the kingdom, it was to his ministers rather than to himself that any such praise was due. 
possibly it was a mutual agreement between them and the priests to strengthen his power since there seemed more chance of dispute in the case of a child than when a full-grown man had ascended the throne the rosetta stone had been virtually the key which has in part at least revealed the mysteries of the hieroglyphics to europeans the inscription was written in hieroglyphic the original form of egyptian writing in the demotic the subsequent and common language of later dynasties and in greek which was of course largely introduced by the ptolemies and as the three inscriptions were approximately alike greek scholars were able to interpret the two former by the last the original rosetta stone is in the british museum but copies of it may be seen in many of the collections abroad and in the united states such as the university of pennsylvania etc meanwhile the boy king was growing to manhood and there is record of his being trained to equestrianism and athletic sports at a certain banquet an ambassador in speaking of the king quote, said a great deal in his praise quoting anecdotes of his skill and boldness in hunting as well as his excellence in riding and in the use of arms end quote, and ended by averring in proof of this that quote, the king on horseback once transfixed a bull with a javelin end quote. when ptolemy epiphanes was but sixteen or seventeen his marriage took place the new queen being presumably near his age with her we enter on the puzzling list of cleopatras and she seems to have been a woman of character and ability and worthy of respect her father antiochus of syria a country with which the intermarriages of the kings of this dynasty were very frequent brought her to the bridegroom with a splendid retinue and the nuptials were handsomely celebrated at the border town of raphia it was here that the mother of the king had ridden before the troops many years previously to encourage them on the eve of the battle between ptolemy iv and antiochus the dowry of the bride was the taxes of coeli syria and palestine but not it is said the possession of the land the young queen loyally accepted the duties and obligations attaching to her new position thy people shall be my people was the spirit that distinguished her actions and she stood to this even when her husband's interests were opposed to those of her native country it is said of her that she was a quote, vigorous and prudent woman and she certainly introduced new blood into a stock likely to degenerate from the constant unions of close blood relations end quote nor do there seem to be any special stories recorded of cruelty on her part such as we have in other instances of ptolemy queens we may presume also that she had more or less claim to beauty and had attractions both of person and mind like his predecessors ptolemy v worked upon the temples notably that of Philae. the temple of asclepius was especially credited to this king and we cannot but suppose that the queen too had a great interest an inscription the duplicate of the rosetta stone was placed on one of the walls at Philae by epiphanes but afterwards carved out by another ruler cleopatra the first like some others of the ptolemy women was the superior of the man to whom she was united yet as far as we can judge at this distance of time the marriage was on the whole a harmonious and satisfactory one at least no special quarrels are recorded and the husband did not make way with his wife in the all too common fashion she seems to have been joined with her husband in public acts as were ptolemy philadelphus and arsinoe the second even when these were directed against her father and her native land mahaffy says that it was noteworthy that livy speaks of the king and queen as of equal importance but perhaps this may have referred to cleopatra the first and her son when she was regent rather than to her husband livy says quote, ambassadors were sent from ptolemy and cleopatra sovereigns of egypt with congratulations that manius asilus the consul had driven king antiochus from greece and advising the romans to send their army over to asia 
that all syria as well as asia was in a panic that the sovereigns of egypt were prepared to do whatever the senate desired end quote. a proof that egypt was now continually bending before the power of rome ptolemy wished to secure some of the syrian provinces and of the queen it is said quote, she was always striving to spread her influence towards the north end quote. disputes had arisen between the priests and the crown as to the dowries of the late deified queens which had become part of the temple revenues and were again absorbed by the throne this with other causes resulted in a revolution led by the last native prince whose claim preceded that of the ptolemies which was put down with much cruelty and broken faith by the king it is these insurrections occurring frequently in the reigns of the latter ptolemies that are believed to be one cause of egypt's submissive attitude towards rome ptolemy epiphanes seems less odious than his predecessor but as he grew to manhood he too was accused of cruel murders among them that of his tutor aristomenes to whose care it seems as if he must have owed much the cartouche of ptolemy v is said to be the most rarely found in ptolemic buildings he also worked at edfu and Philae, the quote, so-called chapel of aesculapius end quote, at the latter place having an inscription declaring it to be founded by quote, ptolemy epiphanes and cleopatra and their son to Imhotep, the son of Ta. End quote. In modern times, a temple said to be built by them at Antipolis was undermined and destroyed by the Nile. The king died, murdered by poison by some of his courtiers, while still a young man, in his twenty ninth year and twenty fifth of his reign, and was succeeded by his son under the guardianship of his mother whether the queen deeply mourned her husband or whether his increasing vices had alienated her from him we cannot say she was doubtless an ambitious woman and not averse to holding the reins of power there are coins of hers issued during her regency she is there called queen which is not the case with all the wives of the different kings and appears as isis though with a less conventional face than some wearing a corn wreath above which are a globe and horns a copper coin gives her as isis with long curls and a band with corn she seems to have been an able ruler and survived her husband some eight years dying in 174 b c before she had fairly entered on middle life there were several children of this marriage and as if for the bewilderment of students the sons were called ptolemy and the daughter cleopatra during the queen's regency egypt seems to have remained peaceful and we have no revolting tales of murder or general bloodshed the matter of succession now became somewhat involved so often was it disputed and so frequently divided between rival claimants mahafi says quote, from henceforth we have almost constantly rival brothers asserting themselves in turn queen mothers controlling their king's sons intestine feuds and bloodshed in the royal house till the stormy end of the dynasty with the daring cleopatra the sixth some call philometer the sixth and some the seventh if the latter there was probably an elder brother ptolemy eupator thus called the sixth who survived his father but for a brief period being nominally king and then died certain it is that the syrian cleopatra the first was regent and that one of her sons philometer succeeded to the actual power 173 b c he reverted to the earlier customs and married his sister cleopatra who then became the second queen of the name this union is believed to have taken place a year after the death of his mother in 173 bc perhaps had she lived she might have arranged for a different connection the peaceful period of the regency of cleopatra the first now came to an end and egypt prepared to seize the lands which had furnished the dowry of the late queen the three powers egypt syria and rome being involved the two first in active warfare 
This resulted in the capture and imprisonment of the Egyptian king by the Syrian monarch, Antiochus IV, at a battle which occurred on the borders of Egypt. The people of Alexandria, who, it is said, spoke more completely the voice of Egypt than Paris does of France, made a counter-move by raising to the throne the younger brother, a lad of fifteen or sixteen, who took the name of Euergetes II, latter called Physcon, the pot-bellied, or the fat, Ptolemy VI, and who, in his proportions, accentuated the usual liberal outline of the Ptolemy race. The youth proved strong and ambitious enough to hold on to the power thus secured, and never willingly relaxed his grasp. Antiochus then attacked Alexandria with the nominal purpose of restoring Philometer. Through their mother, the young kings were of course related to the invader, but the relationship seems to have had little effect in preventing a contest. Different authorities give different names and numbers to the various Ptolemy kings, and we have taken Mahaffi, who has devoted much time to the study of this period, as our special guide. Antiochus IV finally left Philometer at Memphis and returned home. The latter, apparently seeing the folly of a divided sovereignty and realizing that he would no longer be recognized as sole king, made overtures to his brother, and owing, it is said, to the mediation of their sister, Cleopatra, they came to terms in 170 B.C. This compact roused Antiochus IV to a renewed attack. The beseeching embassies of the Ptolemies to Rome, however, finally produced an effect, and Antiochus was ordered to withdraw, and the powerful Romans virtually held a sort of protectorate over Egypt, till they finally and absolutely absorbed it. The embassies of Philometer and Cleopatra II professed that they were more indebted to the Senate and the people of Rome than to their own parents, more than to the immortal gods, since by their help they had been relieved from Antiochus, and Rome seemed disposed to keep up the agreeable sentiment, as their embassy is recorded as having brought a purple gown and vest and an ivory chair to King Philometer, and an embroidered gown and a purple robe for Queen Cleopatra II. The king and queen are spoken of in all solemn datings as God's Philopatores. On the walls of the temple at Dur el Medina, there are pictures of Ptolemy the seventh and ninth and Cleopatra the second, and a Syrian coin of Philometer gives a strong head and face. There are inscriptions relating to Ptolemy Philometer, wife and children, in Nubia. It was after the Romans restored Philometer to Egypt that he and his queen made their solemn progress to Memphis. Some of the so-called friends of the king tried to make trouble between the brothers and to induce the younger to slay the elder, implying that Philometer had designs upon him. But in this instance, Euergetes, usually regarded with abhorrence, showed himself at his best and dismissed suspicions, and to prove their harmony went with his brother in royal apparel to show themselves to the people. A quarrel, however, eventually broke out between them, Philometer was expelled and threw himself on the protection of the Romans, who were thus continually able to interfere in the affairs of Egypt. The Romans decreed that the kingdom should be divided between the two, which of course gave satisfaction to neither, and Euergetes II went to Rome to protest against the division. An interesting and almost an amusing episode is connected with this visit when, it is said, Euergetes asked Cornelia, the mother of the Gracchi, to marry him. The lady, however, declined. Probably, says one writer, quote, she held him in such esteem as an English noblewoman now would hold an Indian Raja proposing marriage. End quote. The quarrels and fighting between the two brothers continued, but finally Euergetes attacked Cyprus, which had been adjudged by the Romans to Philometer, and was forced to surrender. Philometer now showed himself the generous one, for he forgave Euergetes, restored him to Cyrene, and for the last eight or nine years of his reign remained at peace with him. End of chapter 26
Chapter 27 of Predecessors of Cleopatra. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by William Jones, Benita Springs, Florida. Chapter 27 Ptolemy Queens Continued. Cleopatra the Second appears with her husband Philometor Ptolemy the Seventh in statues excavated at Cyprus, which were set up at a temple to the Paphian Aphrodite. Yet we know little of her. There is also an appeal spoken of by Josephus in which a certain Jew begs the king and queen's permission to build a temple to the god of Israel and reports their majesty's favorable reply but the story is not altogether credited. We hear also of the king and queen receiving other petitions, usually a popular action. Polybius, whose testimony seems so generally full and reliable, was in Egypt during the reign of Ptolemy Philometor. Of course there was a daughter of Philometor, and Cleopatra the second, also called Cleopatra, whom Philometor gave in marriage to an aspirant to the throne of Syria, though apparently not the rightful heir, called Alexander Bala, and accompanied the princess to Ptolemaeus in Palestine, where the ceremony took place probably about 150 B.C. After this, Ptolemy the Seventh discovered a real or pretended conspiracy against his life, in which his new son-in-law was implicated. He went over to the side of the other claimant to the Syrian throne, Demetrius Nicator, and regardless of the marriage contract previously concluded, transferred his daughter to him. She seems to have been still in the power of her father rather than that of her husband, and neither she nor her mother appear to have had any voice in the matter. It is possible that she may not really have lived with Bala at all. Ptolemy Philometor himself was crowned king at Antioch, and it is on this account, probably, we have the Syrian coin with his head. But he evidently did not care to retain the position, for he finally persuaded the people to accept Demetrius in his stead. Philometor, Ptolemy the Seventh, died as had few of his race, in or rather as the result of a battle. He was thrown from an elephant or some say a horse, like Chiranos, and wounded by his enemies with fatal results following, first having learned of the death of Bala, with whom he had been fighting. In contrast with his brother Eurgetes II, he is spoken well of by many writers, and his gentleness and humanity are dwelt upon, which recalls the familiar axiom that all things go by comparison. So some speak highly, and some judge him harshly. In youth he is said to have been handsome, with a countenance full of sweet expression. His death occurred 146 B.C. There were now again rival claimants to the throne. Eurgetes II, Physcon, the brother of the late king, with whom the kingdom had been divided, and Ptolemy Philometor's son, Ptolemy Neos, Philopater the second, Ptolemy the eighth, whose cause his mother Cleopatra the second espoused. But Physcon proved to be the more powerful, and either directly or indirectly murdered his young nephew, feeling that while the boy lived, his own claim to the throne would not be secure. It is said that the unfortunate heir had been recognized as the crown prince over the whole empire, not only at Cyprus but at Philae, for Professor Casey found on the island of Husse a granite slab which had supported the figures of the king and queen with his youth standing between them. The list of queens, a puzzling one, as all of us must admit, is as follows. Ptolemy I, Sotor, married Eurydice, and Berenike I, Ptolemy II, Philadelphus, married Arsino I and Arsino II, Ptolemy III, Euergetes I, married Berenike II, Ptolemy IV, Philopator, married Arsino III, 
Ptolemy the Fifth, Epiphanes married Cleopatra the First. Ptolemy the Sixth, Eupator died in childhood. Ptolemy the Seventh, Philometor married Cleopatra the Second. Ptolemy the Eighth, Philopater the Second, Neos was murdered in youth. Ptolemy the Ninth, Euergetes the Second, Physcon married Cleopatra the First widow of his brother, and Cleopatra III, his niece. Ptolemy the Tenth, Lathyrus, married Cleopatra the Fourth, and subsequently Selene, his sisters. Ptolemy the Eleventh, Alexander, married Berenike the Third, whose parentage seems in doubt. Ptolemy the Twelfth, Alexander the Second, married this same Berenike, his stepmother. Ptolemy the Thirteenth, Aulates married Cleopatra the Fifth, surnamed Trifina, Ptolemy the Fourteenth and Ptolemy the Fifteenth reigned in conjunction with their sister Cleopatra the Sixth, to whom they were successively married and died young, as did Ptolemy the Sixteenth, her son Caesarion, who died unmarried. Within the year and some say the murder of her son occurred during the nuptial ceremony, Fuscon married the widow of his brother Cleopatra the Second. Evidently no love was lost between them. How could it be under the circumstances? If this marriage, perhaps insisted on by the Alexandrian party of Cleopatra the Second, she was having a claim to the crown jointly with her brothers, there seems to have been one son Mimphites, who soon died, or was murdered, it is even reported by his own unnatural father, who feared a rival. Cleopatra the Second had two daughters of the same name. The elder was married to Alexander Bala, and then Demetrius Nicator of Syria. She seems to have been an embodiment of Ptolemaic cruelty and vice. When her second husband was taken prisoner, she accepted his brother Antiochus Sidetes in his stead and placed him upon the throne. But nine years afterwards, on the return of Demetrius, murdered Sidetes and her son Seleucus, who had attempted to assume the crown. She had also, it is said, prepared poison for her second son Antiochus Grippus, but he discovered her intent and forced her to swallow the fatal draught herself. Her younger sister, Cleopatra, only a year or two after Physcon's marriage with her mother, Cleopatra II, he also took to wife, thus establishing one of the most revolting connections entered into by any member of this atrocious family, yet, strange to say, both were recognized in public acts as queens of Egypt, the younger bearing the title of Cleopatra III. Incomprehensible and repellent as this seems, it appears well authenticated. There is a relief of Philometer clad in a white mantle and accompanied by one of the Cleopatras. At Com Ambos there is on the wall of the temple a picture of Ptolemy the Seventh and also of Ptolemy the Ninth between the goddesses, and again of Horus bestowing gifts on Ptolemy the Ninth and the two Cleopatras. We read of an inscription from Kos, too, where the children of both were perhaps educated, in which the king and his two queens honor with a golden crown and gilded image the tutor of their children. In 146 B.C., Physcon apparently married Cleopatra the Second, and two or three years later her daughter, in 130 or 129 B.C., he was exiled and obliged to flee the country, Cleopatra II reigning alone for about two years, at the expiration of which time the absent king returned and again took the power into his own hands. In his private life, Ptolemy Physcon appears as a monster. In his public career, he has been esteemed by some writers as a good, or at least a great king. That is, his sway was widely extended, and he built or added to innumerable temples to the gods. At Edfu, begun by Ptolemy III, Eurgetes, 
In 237 B.C., he completed the great Hopestyle Hall. In 122 B.C., at Der el Medina, he finished the graceful temple begun by Ptolemy IV, and dedicated to Hathor. At el Kab he built a rock temple, while at Karnak and many other places he added his portion to the great wall. At Thebes we find no reign so marked. He seems to have showed special favor to the native Egyptian population, but is credited with many cruelties to others. With Rome he kept up friendly, if subservient, relations. At what precise time the elder Cleopatra passed away from the scene, we do not know, but she died before Physcon, leaving her successor to a certain extent to reenact her story. Physcon gave his daughter Trifina to Grippus, the Syrian prince who had poisoned his mother and her aunt Cleopatra. Ptolemy the Ninth, Physcon, died in 117 B.C., having reigned twenty-nine years since the death of his brother Philometor. His widow, Cleopatra the Third, Coche, succeeded to the power, and is sometimes called queen, sometimes regent. She appears to have held position for a while alone. And then her son, Ptolemy the Tenth, Philometor, or Sotor the Second, Lathyrus, was associated with her. She was, it is said, a strong and remarkable woman, considerably younger than her husband, and having great influence with him. She succeeded in having the elder son and natural successor sent away as governor to Cyprus, and thus deprived him of the power of claiming his inheritance. She preferred her younger son, Alexander, with whom she had made independent king of Cyprus, but the people would not accept him and Ptolemy X, Lathyrus, as has been said, succeeded. He apparently was already married to his sister, another Cleopatra, called the fourth, but his mother obliged him, from motives not clear to us, though it has been suggested that it was because only such children as were born to the purple could reign, to put her away and marry a younger sister, Selena. This queen's name does not appear in some of the inscriptions which read, In the name of Queen Cleopatra and King Ptolemy, God's Philometores, Sotores, and his children. This Cleopatra the Fourth was, no more than the rest of the Ptolemy women, meek or submissive. She naturally resented the treatment she had received, and offered herself and the riches of which she seemed to possess to one of her claimants of the Syrian throne, but only to meet the too common fate for the wife of the said Antiochus Griffiths, her own sister Tryphina, caused her to be murdered. Some of the Egyptian princesses, as has been narrated, went to Syria, and of them it is said that they showed the usual features ascribed to Ptolemaic princesses, great power and wealth, which makes an alliance with them imply the command of large resources in men and money, mutual hatred, disregard of all ties of family and affection, the dearest object fratricide, such pictures of depravity as make any reasonable man pause and ask whether human nature had deserted these women and the Hyrcanian tiger of the past taken its place. The history of the Jews is largely involved with that of Egypt, during many of the Ptolemy reigns, but it is not within the scope of this small monograph to include these relationships in the more purely personal story. The new king, to a greater or less extent, now held the power, as testified to by the coinage bearing simply the year of Lathyrus, instead of his mother Cleopatra the Third. He appears in a copper coin, clad in an elephant skin, and therefore also joint coins of Cleopatra the Third and Alexander. The queen, indisposed to yield her authority, succeeded in raising the population against Lathyrus, so that he fled to Cyprus, his brother Alexander returning, and sharing the throne with his mother. Lathyrus, meanwhile, was attempting to set up a kingdom in Palestine, 
but the powerful queen wrested it from him and added it to her own dominions. Ptolemy Apion, an illegitimate son of Ptolemy Physcon, had been ruling in Cyrene, the home and possession of the former queen, Berenike II, which he left on his death to the Roman people, who thus, whenever their other warlike entanglements permitted, tightened their grasp on everything Egyptian. But the Egyptian monarchs, busy with more personal and family difficulties, did not interfere. Ptolemy X, Alexander I, reigned with his mother till 101 B.C., when, weary perhaps of her powerful hand, which kept him from full possession of the throne, he murdered her. Possibly she would have done the like to him, but it seems a shocking and ungrateful return for the preference for him which she at first so evidently showed. Other authorities throw some doubt on this matricide, but the weight of opinion seems to certify it. The next queen spoken of as Cleopatra, Berenike the fourth, or Berenike the third, and her name is somewhat associated both with Alexander, whom she married, and the queen mother. She is believed to have been a daughter of Sotor the second, Lathyrus, and hence Alexander's niece. This marriage may not have been agreeable to the elder queen, who so evidently hated her elder son, the father of the bride. This king is somewhat spoken of as Ptolemy, also called Alexander, the god Philometer. In the midst of these domestic quarrels and public difficulties, the king yet kept up the usual habit of temple building, and his name appears in connection with several, especially Dendera. Says Mahaffey, it is difficult not to suspect in the continued building of the same temples by Philometer and Eurigetes the second of, of Sotar the second and of Alexander, the influence of the great ladies who lived through the change of kings without stay or intermittence of their royalty. Though, strange to say, the priests of Edu do not speak of them. Alexander appears in communication with the gods and triumphing over his enemies. It is also certain that the crypts of the temple of Dindera, finished by Cleopatra the sixth, were commenced according to an ancient plan by the tenth and eleventh Ptolemies. After the murder of Cleopatra the third, the people rose against Alexander and recalled Lathyrus, who, upon regaining the crown, pursued his brother, who was slain in a naval battle, thus leaving his widow Berenike the third to share with her father the Egyptian throne. She seems to have lived at peace with him after his return, and is regarded by some as co-regent or ruler, by others as not assuming power until after his death. The Theris is considered as among the gentler and better members of the Ptolemy family. Even so, he put down a rebellion of the native population with great severity and raised Thebes to the ground. Dying at about the age of sixty, he left the kingdom in the hands of his daughter Cleopatra the Fourth, Berenike the Third, who reigned for some six months. When Alexander, son of Alexander the First, by another marriage, returned from Rome and was accepted as king under the title of Alexander the Second, Ptolemy the Twelfth, sharing the throne with Berenike the Queen, though his stepmother there was probably no great disparity in their years, and it was by the suggestion of the Roman dictator Scylla that he contracted this strange alliance. But the abhorrent connection was of brief duration, for Alexander the Second murdered his wife and was himself murdered in turn by her household troops within a month. As queen or regent, she had been associated with the royal power for a number of years, and this prompt avengement of her death seems to prove that she had her share of popularity. At this period, and indeed for a long time, what the Alexandrians willed seemed to have been law to the whole country. The Ptolemy queens were women, as a rule, presumably handsome, certainly able and sagacious, ambitious and brave, daring and cruel. To differentiate them accurately, 
particularly the latter members of the family who were on the throne briefly and in quick succession, requires a more extended knowledge of the subject than has yet been secured, either by the researches of students or the finds of archaeologists. The death, last mentioned extinguished, it is said, the claim of legitimate Ptolemy heirs to the Egyptian throne. But other writers assert that this is probably a Roman invention to justify their ultimate seizure of the country, and that princes were living who would be recognized elsewhere as legal successors. Be this as it may, Ptolemy, familiarly known as Auletes, the flute player, son of Lathyrus, with the bar sinister, now came from Syria and assumed the crown under the title of Ptolemy the Thirteenth, Neos Dionysius Philopater the Third, Philadelphus the Second, in eighty one BC. This was evidently with the consent of the Egyptians themselves, and the tacit permission of Rome, to whom some even claimed that Alexander had willed his kingdom. The Senate, however, did not give him official recognition, though he made great efforts and offered many bribes to secure it. A stele speaks of a high priest who placed the Urias crown on the head of the new king of Egypt on the day that he took possession of upper and lower egypt he landed at memphis he came into the temples of qui with his nobles his wives and his children the sons of egyptian princess Selene also came from syria to rome to assert a better right to the egyptian succession but were unsuccessful the romans engaged in other wars and interests for the time being concerned themselves little with the Egyptian question. Trephina, Cleopatra V, possibly a sister of the king, was his legal consort, and his elder daughter, Berenike IV, was probably born in 77 B.C. The last Cleopatra, about 68 B.C., and later another daughter, Arsino, and two sons. Berenike was so much older than the other children that some suppose second marriage, of which, however, no official record has been found. The imputation of illegitimacy has been thrown both on the king and his celebrated daughter, but the Romans, as previously stated, may for their own purposes have accepted or disseminated the idea. The first Ptolemy had, in a sense, wrested the country from its native rulers, and his successors, were only receiving in their turn what they had meted out. Like his predecessors, Ptolemy the Thirteenth built on the temples, and there are pictures of him between two goddesses in the favorite mode and in other situations. In spite of this, he is spoken of as the most idle and worthless of the Ptolemies. His life, idle, worthless, devoted to the orgies of Dionysius, hence his title, and disgracing himself by public competitions on the flute, whence his nickname, he has not a good word recorded of him. And Cicero says he was plaintive and persuasive when in need, but worthless and tyrannous when in power. The direct testimony of Cicero and Diodorus Siculus, which we possess, in regard to this period, is of great value. It was the debasing of the coinage that especially caused the revolt that obliged Auletes to flee the country, in addition to the fact that he had lent no help to his brother at Cyprus, overpowered by the Romans. Auletes had assumed the crown in 81 BC, and kept possession for a number of years, but a revolt of the Alexandrians, for reasons given above, forced him to fly in 58 BC. When he was thus driven from the country, Cleopatra V, Trifina, who some call his wife and some his eldest daughter, with the spirit of the dominant race of women, at once assumed the crown, of which, however, death deprived her within a year. She was followed by Berenike IV, possibly her daughter, certainly that of Aletes, who ruled for two years, marrying him first Selecos, of the royal house of Syria, whom she put away, finding him weak 
and unsatisfactory, and substituted Archelaus, the high priest of Comana. Seleucus is supposed to have been the person who stole the golden coffin of Alexander the Great and replaced it by a glass one. From subsequent events it is quite evident that Berenike the Fourth possessed the usual characteristics of the Ptolemy women, both in capacity and ambition, having no intention of handing back the authority she had assumed to his previous successor, her father though he might be. But Auletes, either by persuasion or bribery, secured the powerful aid of the Romans, whom Egypt was no longer strong enough to resist. The Roman general Gabinius invaded Egypt, and conquering in the battle, put the husband of Berenike the Fourth to death, restored Auletes, and left him to mete out further retribution as it would. No pleadings for mercy, no claims of relationship ever stayed the bloody hand of a Ptolemy from executing his will, and doubtless regarding her as a traitor, Auletes put his daughter to death of which details are not given. There then remained two daughters, Cleopatra and Arsinoe, and two sons merely called Ptolemy. Restored in 55 B.C., Ptolemy the Thirteenth only lived till 51 B.C., and died, bequeathing his kingdom jointly to his eldest daughter and son, and disregarding the fact that he had virtually mortgaged it to the Romans, he adjured them to carry out his intentions, calling all the gods to witness. A double copy of his will was made, the one being sent to Rome, the other kept in Alexandria. End of section 27。Chapter 28 of Predecessors of Cleopatra。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Veronica Mead. Predecessors of Cleopatra by Lee North. Cleopatra the Six. We have shown how the Persian rule in Egypt was followed by that of the Ptolemies, and at first the union between prince and people was close and satisfactory. From Ptolemy the First to Cleopatra the Six, the rulers identified themselves with the interests, and especially with the religion of the nation, with whom they were not allied by blood, built cities and temples, and, the earlier members of the dynasty at least, wrought for the general good. In the case of most of the later kings, however, they were more cruel and oppressive, and revolts were more common than at first. The architecture, especially the portrait sculpture of the Ptolemy period, was inferior to some of earlier date, but in the encouragement of literature, the building of libraries and other public edifices, and the extending of commerce, the race distinguished itself. As regents or independent rulers, their queens held sway. The family intermarried to an extent shocking to Christian ideas, and Ptolemy after Ptolemy took his sister or other near relatives, usually called Arsinoe, Berenice, or Cleopatra, to wife. These close relationships, however, did not seem to strengthen the family affections. It is a blood-stained history, and the murders were almost as numerous as the unions. Various towns were built and called after the queens, Arsinoe and Berenice, but though Cleopatra seemed to have been a favorite name, and there were six or seven of them in succession, this name was not so often used as the cognomen of a town. There are a few names in the world's history that stand alone. Many may share in the same, but to speak them is to call upon one dominating image. In this sense, there was but one Caesar, but one Washington, but one Eve, but one Semiramis, and to this class belongs Cleopatra. There are others, such as Helen of Troy and Mary Stuart, who have shared with these high reputation, but in these cases further identification is needed than the single name. Cleopatra stands among the few daughters of Eve, preeminent for wit, charm, power, and perhaps beauty, and to this must be added ambition and vice. The laughing queen who held the world's great hands, having won the heart of the world's greatest rulers, yet lays her magic touch upon the centuries. Artists and writers have never tired of limbing her personal charms and special characteristics. 
no colors have been too bright, none too dark to be used. Shakespeare has pictured her with his immortal genius, and hundreds of others, with more or less skill, have attempted the same task. Protean in shape, no two perhaps resemble each other. In the conception of some, she is slender, graceful, exquisitely beautiful, and at the other extreme, as in the old tapestry in the New York Museum, she is like a fat Dutch woman, a decadence from Rubens' overblown beauties, so each land has pictured her according to its own ideal. Some have denied her preeminent beauty, and the conventional portrait of her which still exists upon the wall at Dendera, as well as her face upon the few battered coins of her time, which have come down to us, scarcely suggest it. But the woman who made men her slaves at a single interview surely lacked no charm that nature could bestow. Unbridled both in passions and ambitions, she knew no limit to either and grasped at universal empire. The greatest men of her time bowed at her feet, and she changed the fate of battle with the turning of her vessel's prow. She was over twenty when she captivated Caesar, over thirty when Antony became her slave. Of her numerous lovers, Antony was the chosen of that wayward, passionate heart. She refused to survive his defeat and death, and perished by her own hand. Though not, strictly speaking, Egyptian queens, the Ptolemy race were yet queens of Egypt, and thus ended the long line of female royalties extending from the dim ages of mythology to the Roman period. Cleopatra the Sixth has been described by a late novelist, his picture drawn perhaps from some historical source, as having a broad head, wavy hair, deep-set eyes, full, eloquent mouth, and a long, slender throat. Charm and talent of the highest order are generally credited to her. She had a musical voice and was a linguist of ability, skilled in Greek and Latin, and could converse with Ethiopians, Jews, Arabians, Syrians, Medes, and Persians, and was proficient in music. Tennyson says of her, her warbling voice a lyre or wildest range, struck by all passions. Another writer, disputing the fact that she is sometimes depicted as swarthy, says she was a pure Macedonian of a race akin to and perhaps fairer than the Greeks. Ptolemy the Thirteenth, the so-called Alites, came to the throne in a sense under the protection of the Romans and again took possession of the kingdom. It was at this time that Antony first saw Cleopatra, a girl of fifteen, and was struck with her beauty, he being master of horse to the conquering general Gabrinus. But the acquaintance, if such it was, and not merely a glimpse of Antony's part, went no further then, and neither probably anticipated their subsequent relations. Alites' will, demanding that his eldest son and daughter should succeed him, was accepted by the mixed populace of Alexandria, and in a degree by the whole country, and for the moment Rome did not interfere. It was a youthful pair to have laid upon them or undertake such a grave responsibility, a mere girl and a child. Cleopatra was but sixteen, Ptolemy only ten, but though young in years, Cleopatra soon showed that she had both a capacity and ambition of an older woman. The direct heritage, perhaps, from one or other parent included beauty and charm, but a worthless father had but little in the way of character or mental abilities with which to endow his children, and perhaps it was rather from her mother that she derived her superior characteristics. With such paternity and the traditions of the entire race, we can hardly wonder at the instances of vice and cruelty which we find recorded of this last royal member of her family. That her story is so interwoven with Roman affairs gives us a clearer knowledge of it than of much of the previous history, which was included only in that of Egypt and Syria. So Cleopatra, a mere girl of sixteen or seventeen, and her brother of ten, succeeded to the throne and were accepted by the Alexandrians. But the boy was persuaded by his counselors to oust his sister, who was forced to yield and fled to Syria. That she had both adherents and means, however, is proved by the fact that she did not tamely submit to this violation of the agreement, but promptly raised an army, and this alone seemed to indicate that, young as she was, she already showed remarkable abilities, and returned to recover her lawful heritage. To live at peace with each other seemed beyond the power of most of the Ptolemy race. At this point Pompey, seeking for allies, turned toward Egypt. And the father of the young king, having been under obligations to him, he made overtures to the boy sovereign. But the party in power, who for the time being were the power behind the throne, 
decided to receive him with apparent friendliness, and then treacherously murdered him, hoping thereby to secure the more powerful friendship of his adversary, Caesar. Meanwhile, the armies of the young king and his sister lay opposite to each other. Caesar at once came to Egypt and was revolted at the treacherous deed, but was not in a sufficiently strong position to punish the murderers. He was received somewhat coldly and had to proceed with caution, but summoning his legions, he remanded that the youthful contestants for the crown should appear before him and discuss their claims peacefully, rather than by force of arms. This was Cleopatra's opportunity. Her strongest weapons were her personal charms rather than her military powers. At twenty years of age, she must have been in the perfect bloom of her beauty, with exquisite eyes and coloring. The sweetest of voices, a fascinating manner, ample powers of wit, and rare conversational abilities. To these she trusted, and not in vain. Her position, her very life, was at stake. Her adversaries, who could probably hope for no consideration at her hands should she again come into power, would no doubt have been glad to assassinate her had opportunity afforded. Fearing this, it is said, and time seems to give credit to the story, she hid herself in a bale of carpet and caused it to be carried to Caesar's palace by night. No device which her fertile brain and keen wit could invent, we may be sure, was lacking in the accessories of the toilette to produce the effect she desired, to move his pity and secure his assistance. She played a great stake, perhaps with confidence, perhaps with trembling of heart, but she won. For from that time forward till his death, Caesar, elderly man though he was, between fifty and sixty years of age, became her fervent admirer. Rarely, if ever, had woman accomplished so much in a single interview. She must have been elated with triumph and renewed confidence in her powers. Yet Caesar did not attempt to make her sole monarch. He lost his heart, so to speak, but not his head, as Antony subsequently did. He decreed that the will of the Aulites should be carried out, restored Cyprus to Egypt, and proposed that the younger brother and sister, Ptolemy and Arsinoe, should be made its governors. He even insisted that the money Cleopatra's father had pledged to Rome should be paid. For this purpose, it is said that the young king's plate was ostentatiously pawned. The king's chief counselor, Pothinos, not realizing the strength that Caesar could command, nor the personal ability of the man with whom he had to deal, recalled the army and virtually declared war. Cleopatra's troops had either been hired mercenaries, who deserted or whose time had expired, and who went over to what they considered the winning side, or they had been defeated. For this emergency, she seems to have been able to afford little support to Caesar. In defending himself, he set fire to the ships in the harbor, and it is even reported that the great library was burnt. But as various authors make no mention of it, this last disaster is questioned. Caesar put to death the counselor, Pothinos, and kept with him in the fortress his new love, the beautiful Cleopatra, and the two boys, the young king and his brother. The princess Arsinoe, probably also beautiful and attractive, and, young as she was, realizing perhaps the character and ambition of her elder sister, fled to the Egyptian camp, thus refusing to put herself under the protection of the conquering Roman, though it was to him she owed her position as ruler of Cyprus. But distrust was natural and perhaps not unfounded. The Egyptians then demanded the young king, and Caesar, though virtually master, was not yet in a sufficiently strong position to refuse. So, knowing that this mere boy could do him no harm, he released him. It was, however, but the poor youth's death warrant for in the subsequent attack upon the Egyptians they were driven into the river, and the royal boy came to his end by drowning, saved by this possibly from even a worse fate. The Egyptians, disheartened, now gave up the contest. Caesar treated them with comparative leniency, set Cleopatra with the youngest Ptolemy as her nominal husband over them, and carried the poor Princess Asinoe to Rome, where, led in chains, she was among the captives to grace the triumph. She did not prove to have the power of her sister's fascinations to melt his hard heart. Caesar may have considered that she was in debt to him and had proved ungrateful and treacherous, but this was an act unworthy of his character and is attributed to the evil influence of Cleopatra. There is no direct proof of this, though his subsequent treatment of her sister gives color to the idea. After Caesar's departure, a child was born to Cleopatra, whom she stated to be his son, gave him the name of Caesarion, or some say the name was given by the Alexandrians, and always upheld his royal prerogative, 
even as against later children of the more beloved Antony. These irregularities and evil doings seem to have been calmly accepted by the people, and in inscriptions the boy is entitled Ptolemy, also Caesar, the god of Philippator, Philometer. He is to be numbered among the young princes who came to an untimely end, a brief life and a sad one. Yet it is possible, even probable, that it had its periods of the pleasure and joy natural to his age, if no prolonged happiness. Sometime between 48 and 44 BC, Cleopatra left Egypt with her brother and joined Caesar in Rome. Probably he summoned her to come to him, more probably it was of her own motion, fearing that out of sight was out of mind, or might prove so, and that her presence was necessary to retain over him the influence she had gained. It was a shameful connection, as Caesar already had a wife, Copernia, and caused much scandal, even in scandalous Rome. She is mentioned by Cicero and others, but it is not her beauty and her grace that he dwells upon, but her haughtiness. Knowing full well, probably, how she was regarded, she returned the latent contempt which she divined in her visit, even if he did not make it apparent, with a proud and supercilious demeanor. She had nothing to gain from him, and she did not seek to charm and conciliate as she had done with Caesar. She is, however, said to have promised him books from the Alexandrian library, which seems to suggest that there was some part of it yet remaining, even if it had suffered damage by fire, but failed to perform her promise. Many of Caesar's actions are credited to her influence, and it is even believed that she desired him to establish an empire with Alexandria rather than Rome for its capital. The ostensible cause of her visit to Rome was to negotiate a treaty between the former and the country over which she nominally ruled. She dwelt in Caesar's palace across the Tiber and held court, at which not only Caesar's adherents, but his opponents appeared, and it is said that statues of her, beautiful probably as the Venus of Pauline Bonaparte, were erected in the temple of the goddess of love and beauty. Yet this was no position of true dignity for the nominal queen of a foreign land, and when in 44 BC Caesar's murder took from her his support and protection, she sailed for Egypt. No broken-hearted mourner, but a woman still ambitious and grasping all the possibilities of life. The next year she disposed of her last encumbrance, and is held responsible for the murder of her youngest and only surviving brother, the nominal king. Four years each is the period assigned to her joint rule with her two brothers. She had no love to spare for her own kin, and too evidently was glad to be rid of them. Even if the suspicion of her having poisoned the last of her family, who appears to have died in the same year as Caesar, may chance to be unfounded. Now for a time, Cleopatra abided at home, waiting and watching for further opportunities of conquest in love or dominion. Life with her was devoted to self-seeking and pleasure, yet it must have been some serious moments, some space for display of maternal feeling, some days and hours devoted to actual study, Though it is hard and unfamiliar to think of her in this aspect, else could she not have been mistress of so many languages as are attributed to her. She, nominally at least, governed the kingdom, cautiously kept out of Roman entanglements, and pleaded her inability to assist the contestants with subsidies, which, it is said, Cassius demanded from her on the score of poverty, and indeed Egypt was in no condition to be either a principal or an ally in warfare at this time. The people suffered. The queen probably still lived in luxury and abundance. End of chapter 28。Chapter 29 of the predecessors of Cleopatra。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Veronica Mead. Predecessors of Cleopatra by Lee North. Cleopatra the Sixth continued. Now again came Cleopatra's opportunity. Antony, victorious in the Battle of Philippi, turned his attention to the east and summoned Cleopatra before him. She being accused, as it has been seen, perhaps untruly, of sending aid to his rival, Cassius. Antony was of the party of Caesar, had delivered his funeral oration, and was in a sense his successor. Like Caesar, also he had a fair and devoted wife, the noble Fulvia, but no legal bonds could resist the sorceress of the Nile. Delius, Antony's messenger, 
at once foresaw the probable result of a meeting between his master and the fascinating Egyptian, advised her to go in her best style, and vaunted his chief as the gentlest and kindliest of soldiers. But Cleopatra was no subservient slave to hasten at the first bidding, and, disregarding many summons, took her own time and way to comply. Her interview with Antony was in singular contrast with her first meeting with Caesar. As a fugitive and suppliant, she conquered the one, with regal pomp and magnificence the other. Perhaps each method appealed most directly to the man she had dealt with, and her keen perception indicated the different modes. Caesar might have shown himself less malleable to the dominant queen, Antony to the pleading and powerless maiden. Josephus speaks of her corrupting Antony with her love trick, and says he was bewitched and utterly conquered by her charms. Her tricks were of large and magnificent description. She made great preparations and gathered together splendid ornaments and costly gifts. At last, with full and well-deserved confidence in her own powers of fascination, she started. Plutarch's words will best describe the gorgeous pageant she devised. She came sailing up the river Sidnus, Antony was in Cilicia, in a barge with gilded stem and outspread sails of purple, while oars of silver beat time to the music of flutes and pipes and harps. She herself lay all along under a canopy of cloth of gold, dressed as Venus in a picture, and beautiful young boys, like painted cupids, stood on each side to fan her. Her maids were dressed like sea nymphs and graces. Some steered at the rudder, some working at the ropes. The perfumes diffused themselves from the vessel to the shore, which was covered with multitudes. The people vacated the whole place and hastened to gaze upon the wondrous and beautiful sight, while Antony remained alone, awaiting the humble petitioner, whom perhaps he expected to appear before him. But finally, as Cleopatra intended, he went to her. He found the preparations to receive him magnificent beyond expression, but nothing so admirable as the number of lights, for on a sudden there was let down together so great a number of branches with lights in them, so ingeniously disposed, some in squares, some in circles, that the whole thing was a spectacle that has seldom been equaled for beauty. This beginning was the keynote for their future intercourse, amusements, banquets, entertainments of all sorts. Cleopatra sent Antony the whole gold service which he admired and, according to the familiar story, dissolved her pearl earring in a cup of vinegar or sour wine, which she made him drink. Pleasure was the goddess whom they worshipped. Unworthy though it might be of her fine powers and abilities, this was perhaps the happiest time of Cleopatra's life. Antony tried to vie with her in the splendor of his entertainments, but laughingly confessed she far outdid him. Something like true love for him seems to have inspired the fickle queen. Caesar was but three years dead, but he was unmourned and forgotten. Antony was a handsome man of fine and attractive appearance, and is thus described. His beard was well grown, his forehead large, and his nose aquiline, giving him altogether a bold, masculine look that reminded people of the face of Hercules in painting and sculpture. He was of the type that is most apt to win general regard generous and lavish, if not always just or honest free and easy in manner to his inferiors, full of jokes and raillery, and ready to drink and gamble with almost any one. Physically the two, the man and the woman, were splendid specimens of the human race. Morally, what can be said of them? Meanwhile, Antony's wife was fighting his battles at Rome and beseeching him to return, which he finally promised to do, but the serfs who held him in thrall willed rather that he should go with her to Alexandria, and prevailed for he basely yielded to her arguments and spent the winter there, giving himself with her wholly up to the pursuit of pleasure in every form in the wildest revelry. The inferior officers must have fulfilled their duties more faithfully than their superiors, or the whole land would have been plunged into anarchy and destruction. The laws were administered, industry and commerce flourished, and Alexandria continued to be a large, populous, and busy city, full of life and animation, and adorned with many magnificent buildings. The pharaoh steadily cast its beneficial light across the waters to be a guide to mariners. The temple of Serapis, on its high platform, called attention to the worship of the gods. The library was as yet the casket of valuable treasures. The museum was thronged with students and scholars. Palaces and public buildings adorned the beautiful streets, forts and castles, Breakwaters and harbor were laid out and perfected, and Alexandria was alone rivaled by Rome. The gods, too, no matter what might be the moral aspect of the private life of royalty, were worshipped and revered. 
and with the temples of Dendera and Philae, the name of Cleopatra the Sixth is especially associated. The less gigantic than some of the others, the temple at Hathor, the goddess of love at Dendera, with that at Philae, were none the less beautiful. Here at Dendera, or Dendera, the Tentyra of the Greeks, a yearly festival was conducted with great splendor. The original edifice dated back to the earliest period of Egyptian history. It was added to and altered by the monarchs of the twelfth dynasty, by Thothmes the third and by Ramses the second and third. It is said to have contained no less than twelve crypts. On the site of this old building, the later Ptolemies had re-erected a newer structure, and it is here, on the southern rear wall, was found the conventional portrait of Cleopatra the sixth as Isis and her son Caesarion. The exquisite beauty of the ruins at Philae still charmed the beholder. Graceful columns and featherly palms, like cameos against the radiant blue of the sky, the river softly lapping at their feet. We can imagine the splendor and magnificence of it all, when in the completeness of its perfection, and the queenly Venus with her attendant train of followers, adding its artistic and picturesque human element to the scene. Thus in gaiety and revel, the Roman soldier, forgetful of his duties, and his fair enchantress, passed the time. Says Plutarch further of Cleopatra, Plato admits four sorts of flattery, but she had a thousand. Were Antony serious or disposed to mirth, she had at any moment some new delight or charm to meet his wishes. At every turn she was upon him, drank with him, hunted with him, and when he exercised in arms, she was there to see. At night she would go rambling with him to disturb and torment people at their doors and windows, dressed like a servant woman, for Antony also went in servant's disguise. But it is further added that the Alexandrians in general all liked it well enough and joined good-humouredly and kindly in his frolic and play, saying they are much obliged to Antony for acting the tragic parts at Rome and keeping his comedy for them. The story of the fishing party is among the more innocent of these frolics. Antony, not having good luck, secretly caused divers to put fishes upon his hook, which Cleopatra, discovering, got beforehand with him and had a salted dried fish put on, which of course caused much amusement and merriment when drawn to the surface, and the laughing queen is reported to have said, Leave the fishing, general, to us poor sovereigns of Pharos and Canopus. Your game is cities, kingdoms, and provinces. But the blackest stain upon this period is the murder of the poor princess Arsinoe, who had taken refuge at Miletus in the temple of Artemis Leucophron, and who was put to death there by Antony's orders at the instigation of Cleopatra. Perhaps beautiful and attractive also, if to a less extent, how different were the experiences of the two sisters. It seems strange that Arsinoe was not already the wife of and under the protection of some powerful noble or king, but fate decreed differently. Their mad existence could not continue forever, and matters at Rome grew so serious for Antony that he finally tore himself away from his enchantress and returned. His wife came to meet him, but died on the journey, so that legally he was now a free man. One almost wonders that he did not marry Cleopatra and try to make himself king of Egypt, as the first Ptolemy had done. But probably his reason forbade the attempt, and old relations once more began to hold sway. He made peace with the new Caesar, Octavian, Julius's nephew, and accepted his offer of his half-sister Octavia, the recent widow of Caius Marcellus, for his wife, the Senate dispensing with a law which obliged a widow to pay the respect of ten months of single life to her late husband. Octavia was a fine and beautiful woman, and is spoken of as serious and gentle worthy of a better fate than to be the mate of Antony. For a time, however, she won his regard and an influence for good over him, recalling him to his better self and a return to public duties, till Antony undertook the campaign against Parthion and came once more within reach of his former enslaver. For four years he seemed to have been separated from Cleopatra, who had borne him twins and with strange patience bided her time. She is said to have maintained the claims of her eldest son, Caesarion, and during all this time to have made no demands on Antony. He had left her, spite of all she had done, or could do, to detain him, and wounded, mortified and indignant, perhaps she held her peace. Pride is sometimes as strong a motive as love itself. So far solace she turned, as so many before her had done, to the building and repairing of temples. Ebers has assumed in the preface to his Cleopatra, that the colossal pair, hand in hand, 
found at Alexandria in 1892, of which the female figure is fairly preserved, represent Antony and Cleopatra. Once within reach of her, Antony's old passion revived, and he sent for her to Syria. Very differently she acted from the first time he had summoned her. She needed no second bidding, but came at his call, and all was as before between them. He made her numerous and valuable gifts, acknowledged the twins as his own, giving them the names of Alexander and Cleopatra, and as surnames the title of Sun and Moon, and utterly broke loose from all of his obligations. Once more, Cleopatra triumphed. She then returned to Egypt, while Antony went further afield, she in the interval going in state to Jerusalem to visit Herod the Great. Says another writer in the Greek world under Roman sway, the scene at Herod's palace must have been inimitable. The display of counter-fascinations between the two tigers, their voluptuous natures mutually attracted, their hatred giving to each the deep interest in the other which so often turns to mutual passion while it incites to conquest, the grace and finish of their manners, concealing a ruthless ferocity, the splendor of their appointments. What more dramatic picture can we imagine in history? But in this instance, Cleopatra did not make the usual conquest, though she doubtless exerted all her powers, although, under unjust accusation, he was eventually persuaded to put her to death. Herod was at the time passionately attached to his wife, Mariamne, and withstood Cleopatra's fascinations. The reunion of Antony and Cleopatra was most alarming to him, and he even consulted his counsel as to whether she, being in his power, he might dare to make away with her, but the dread of Antony's vengeance prevented, and with much polite attention and many gifts, she was escorted back to Egypt. Antony's campaign against Parthia was a failure, but as before, two women stood ready to assist him. Cleopatra, on the one hand, accused of having violated tombs and robbed temples, perhaps for this very purpose, hastened to Syria to meet him, with provisions and clothing for his distressed army, while on the other, Octavia came to Athens with even larger supplies. But as against Fulvia, so now, Cleopatra was victor, and Antony accompanied her to Alexandria. Again he gave himself up to his mad infatuation, and sensing the Romans, who regarded Cleopatra with horror and aversion, at every step. Plutarch gives us a graphic picture, assembling the people in the exercise grounds, and causing two golden thrones to be placed on a platform of silver, the one for him, and the other for Cleopatra. And at their feet, lower down, for their children, he proclaimed Cleopatra queen of Egypt, Cyprus, Libya, and Scilly, Syria, and with her co-jointly, Caesarion, the reported son of the former Caesar. His own sons by Cleopatra, she bore him two sons and a daughter, were to have the style of king of kings. To Alexander he gave Armenia and Media, with Parthia so soon as it should be overcome, to Ptolemy, Phoenicia, Syria, and Cilicia. Alexander was brought before the people in Median costume, the tiara and upright peak, and Ptolemy in boots and mantle, in Macedonian cap, done about with a diadem, for this was the habit of the successors of Alexander, as the other was of the Medes and the Armenians. As soon as they saluted their parents, the one was received by a guard of Macedonians, the other by one of the Armenians. Cleopatra was then, as at other times when she appeared in public, dressed in the habit of the goddess Isis. These theatrical performances were doubtless entertaining to the people, who, in all countries, love public shows, as well to the principals who never seem to tire of their masquerading and lulled to rest complaints and dissatisfaction with the existing order of things. For now, Antony and Cleopatra proceeded to Athens to enact similar scenes. The people there were said to be attached to and to have paid great regard to Octavia, and Cleopatra claimed the like honors. But the folly of Antony's course was raising against him a powerful faction, and Caesar Octavian did everything to augment this feeling and prepared for war. Cleopatra now put all the resources of her kingdom at Antony's command and insisted on accompanying him to battle, herself in charge of the Egyptian fleet. They went to Samos and to Actium, where Antony gathered together his army, and it is said would have fought on land, but Cleopatra insisted that the strength of the rivals should be tested at sea. One dominant thought possessed her, as strong or stronger than her love for Antony. It was an invincible dread of being taken captive by, and made to grace the triumph of the brother of the outraged Octavia. At sea she might hope to escape as she could not on land. It was this doubtless more than cowardice, for however wicked she certainly was a brave woman, and not lacking in physical courage. 
that made her at the first evidence that the battle was going against Antony turn her vessel's prow and seek safety in flight. Losing heart and head at once, Antony blindly followed. For years, Cleopatra had been his inspiration, his passion, his lodestar. Where else to fly he knew not. His old world was, all too deservedly, against him. Yet it was not now for joyance that he saw it. Though he followed her, he steeled his heart against her sorceries and shut himself up in morbid communings with his own spirit. He would not see her, and for some time it was in vain that her maidens pleaded with and tried to comfort him. It seemed for the moment as if Cleopatra's power, she who governed men by change, had failed. Her heart cried out, Where is Mark Antony, the man, my lover, with whom my road sublime? On fortune's neck we sat as God by God. The Nihilus would have risen before his time and flooded at our nod. But a reconciliation finally ensued. Not to be at peace with Cleopatra was to give up his last hope, and apparently his only chance for renewal of life and power. His army, deserted by its officers, made submission to Caesar, who thus remained complete victor. Arrived in Africa, Cleopatra proceeded to Alexandria, while Antony remained alone, wandering about in comparative solitude, with only one of two friends. Reaching home, the queen pretended to have conquered rather than been defeated, and proceeded to put to death people, official and otherwise, of whom she wished to be rid. Not for one moment does she seem to have sat down and given up to despair, as did Antony. One project after another was entered upon and put in execution, and when Antony, weary of wandering, at last joined her again, he found her busy endeavoring to have her fleet dragged across the Ithamus of Suez from the Mediterranean to the Red Sea, that she might escape to the other side and find a place of refuge and safety. But the Arabians burnt her ships, and she was forced to abandon her gigantic scheme. She also sent embassies to Caesar, praying that she might be allowed to retain Egypt for herself and her children, and that Antony might dwell there or in Athens as a private individual. Caesar professed to be willing to grant her anything that was reasonable, but was inexorable as regards to Antony. If she would murder Antony, get him out of the way by whatever means, then her own prospects would be better. But wicked, ambitious, and cruel as Cleopatra undoubtedly was, the most sincere sentiment of her wayward life seems her attachment to Antony. To this she clung, preferring to share his fate, even death itself, than abandon or kill him. Nevertheless, Antony was jealous and suspicious of her, and once more shut himself up in moody solitude. That her star had set, the knell of her doom sounded, Cleopatra must have clearly foreseen, but to the very end she held her head proudly and showed unbroken spirit. Not for her in modern parlance was the white feather. Once more, and for the last time, she tempted Antony to her side. It must have been impossible for him to withhold his meed of admiration from his undaunted soul. Once more, it was for them both. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And they plunged into the same revelry, almost on the brink, as it were, of the grave. For them, life had held little that was better. But the fine flavor of earlier times must have departed, and there could not but be bitterness in their souls as they partook of their dead sea fruit. Cleopatra now completed her tomb, which, like so many Egyptian monarchs, she had begun before, in which she gathered together all her treasures and made strange experiments with various potions on her unfortunate slaves, seeking to know how death might be most easily attained. While inexorable fate in the person of the world conqueror, Octavius Caesar moved steadily and surely toward the besotted pair. Cleopatra would not put herself in the power of the conqueror. She would not grace his triumph. Rather than that, welcome death. Caesar, on his part, was most anxious to possess himself of her valuables and to prevent her from killing herself, as he feared she might do, and continued to send her plausible messages, but she did not trust him. He had taken Pelasium and now advanced to invest Alexandria. The toils were tightening around the Tiger Queen, like the iron tower which enshrouded the prisoner, and daily grew smaller, so misfortune closed in upon her. She deserved her fate. She had even done much to provoke it. But one cannot withhold some pity and admiration from the dauntless, if wicked, woman. Antony plucked up his spirit and made one successful sally against the surrounding host. But it was but the dying flicker of the candle. Defeat followed, and his fleet and troops deserted to the conqueror. He accused Cleopatra of treachery, rushing through the streets and decreeing her aloud in his mad fury. She fled and shut herself up with her maidens and attendants in her well-guarded tomb, while Antony retired to his palace. She then caused word to be sent to him that she had committed suicide, and a wave of tenderness overwhelmed him, while he lauded her bravery and begged his attendant to kill him. But the faithful servant only thrust his sword into his own body and fell dead at his master's feet. In despair, Antony wounded himself, but not at once fatally, and word being brought him that Cleopatra still lived, he demanded and entreated to be carried to her. 
Fearful of Caesar's emissaries, she refused to unbar the great stone door, but she and her maidens drew her dying lover up to the balcony, exerting all their strength, and laid his on a bed where he expired in her arms. Like a requiem mournfully seemed to float in fragmentary cadence, I am dying, Egypt, dying, ebbs the crimson life tide fast. His who drunk with thy caresses madly threw a world away, and for thee, star-eyed Egyptian, glorious sorceress of the Nile, light the path to Stygian horrors with the splendors of thy smile. Isis and Osiris guard thee, Cleopatra, Rome, farewell. Then she gave herself up to a passionate grief, of which we cannot doubt the sincerity. Children, country, all was forgotten her wild outburst of sorrow, and still the pitiful story drew to its close. Cleopatra attempted suicide, but Caesar's messengers, having now reached the upper story, with scaling ladders, arrived in time to prevent, and drew her dagger away, even threatening her with the destruction of all her children if she did not desist. Now for a space she changed her policy, but probably never her mind, which was evidently bent on self-destruction. She arrayed herself in fine garments and received Caesar, delivering over to him, nominally, all her treasures, but flying into a furious passion with a servant who betrayed that she was withholding a part. Alternate gust of fury and grief swayed a now enfeebled and broken body in the tormented soul. At one instant, she drew herself up in queenly dignity. At another, threw herself at Caesar's feet, bathed in tears. He raised and tried to reassure her, pretending that he intended her no harm, but never relinquishing the fixed purpose of having her grace his triumph. While she, on her part, allowing herself to seem comforted, was equally unchanged in her determination. Tis said that during this interview Octavius kept his eyes upon the ground, that neither the sight of her beauty nor her grief might move him. And now comes the last act of the theatrical and tragic story. A basket of figs was sent up to the queen, and hidden in that, or in the apartment, was the asp, the messenger of death. Crowned and arrayed as for a festival, she laid herself upon the bed where Antony had expired, and received a bite from the irritated snake, which she had tormented to his fatal task. She breathed her last. The passionate devotion she had inspired was proven by the self-destruction of her two maidens, Iris and Charmian, both of whom followed her example. Many old stories have been, by modern criticism and research, proved to be mythical tales, but this seems to hold its own. She had written a pitiful entreaty to Caesar that she might be buried in the same tomb with Antony, the last proof that her love for him was indeed a true affection. No sooner had Octavius received this than he suspected her design, and again sent his messengers, if possible, to prevent it. But they were too late, and we close with Plutarch's words. Iris, one of her women, lay dying at her feet, and Charmian, just ready to fall, scarce able to hold up her head, was adjusting her mistress's diadem. The picture is very touching, and, continues the narrative, when one that came in said, Was this well done of your lady, Charmian? Perfectly well, she answered and as became the daughter of so many kings. And as she said this, she fell dead by the bedside. Thus the curtain was rung down on the last act of the tragedy. Though faded in bloom and torn with emotions, the still beautiful queen, in all the statuesque majesty of death, lay upon her couch, while as in life her faithful maidens bore her company. So expired the last and most noted queen of Egypt and Rome. Long virtually master, took full possession. Balked in his scheme of carrying Cleopatra captive, Caesar showed what his fixed determination had been by having a golden statue of her maid, with the asp upon her arm, and carried in his triumphal procession. Of the fate of Cleopatra's children, history makes brief mention. The young Caesarion, whose rights his mother had always so carefully guarded, had been sent away with his tutor to the town of Far Berenice. But the faithless man betrayed him to Octavian, who had both him and Antony's son, Antilius, who had been declared a hereditary prince, cruelly murdered. The younger children, though they soon pass from the records and are lost to sight, had perchance a happier fate. The young princess Cleopatra, Antony's daughter, who doubtless possessed at least a portion of her mother's beauty, was married to Juba, the so-called literary king of Mauritania, and Octavian, having removed those members of the family that he considered in any way dangerous to his own autocratic authority, permitted the sister to carry with her the two younger brothers, Alexander and Ptolemy, and thus the once mighty kingdom of Egypt lay prostrate under the foot of the temporary master of the world and became a Roman province, and the history of the Ptolemy race virtually ends with that of the world-renowned queen, as Tennyson says, a name forever. End of chapter 29 End of Predecessors of Cleopatra by Lee North